Good morning. I uh, welcome you to the uh, third session of the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense. Uh, we are focusing today on the issues relevant to uh, surveillance and detection. And uh, we wanted to uh, commence proceedings on time. We'll be joined by Senator Lieberman uh, shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, we're grateful to have the uh, presence of uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, Senator, as many of you know, was elected in 2006. He is uh, one of the, I guess I look back on my own experience in the House and wonder how many people have paid as much attention to uh, uh, preparedness and, and prevention and, and preparedness over the years. And the senator, uh, since his election, has made uh, terrorism prevention and preparedness a very much a priority of his uh, Senate career, in addition to several other interests that he has. He presently is a uh, member of the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and we're grateful for his uh, insight uh, to commence the third panel on uh, surveillance and detection. Senator, uh, we know uh, probably got to be back up there by 10 or thereafter. We're grateful for your presence and uh, look forward to uh, getting the benefit of your perspective. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Senator. Secretary, I appreciate it. It's a uh, pleasure to be here with the Blue Ribbon Study Panel. And Glad to be here with you and with Secretary Shalala, and uh, particularly pleased to be here with uh, Ken uh, Weinstein, who was a very bright, honorable, and uh, forward-looking person in the Department of Justice when we were working on issues together uh, during the Bush administration. So thank you, and, and Jim, good to be with you. Um, I, you. You all know how much U.S. Senators contribute to this uh, discussion, as evidenced by the uh, presence of my two colleagues here to hear my important views. <laughs> um, but I do bring a, pr a perspective on this. I began looking into the cyber security issue when I first came here, and I drilled very deeply into that issue, led the Democratic side on the negotiations toward a cyber bill, wrote the Intelligence Committee's report on cyber, and um, there are a lot of similarities, I think, in terms of the structural difficulties that Congress has in dealing with uh, an emerging threat like this before it's become so manifest that everybody is screaming for action. Um, I think that the bioterror threat works right behind the cybersecurity threat as I need both, or just, oh, here we go. This one, I guess, is not working. The uh, bioterror threat lurks not too far behind the cybersecurity threat as a question of a grave but not yet immediate impact to uh, our country. Um, some of the things that I hope the Blue Ribbon Study Panel will look into um, and that concern me, one is that there is a considerable bank of information on biological warfare dating back to the biological warfare planning of the United States and the Soviet Union 50 years ago. Um, unlike a nuclear warhead, that information can travel very readily. And uh, in the hands of terrorists or others who wish us harm, it can be very dangerous. So how do we control the proliferation of that bank of information that our countries built um, back in those days? Second, technology is leaping ahead. And now with the type of laboratory equipment that you can buy over the internet and have shipped to your home, you can recreate the type of work that those 50 years ago, it took a national laboratory to accomplish. So the opportunity for construction of a bioterror threat has now been dramatically expanded. We have also seen a proliferation of non-state threats. And the signal characteristic of non-state threats is that they are not amenable to traditional deterrence. It was the mutually assured destruction that kept the peace 
when the Soviet Union and the United States were nuclear armed. I don't think that a similar fear of consequences animates the uh, terrorists and the jihadis who lurk within other societies. Um, and so I hope that that would be an issue that would be considered by the panel as well. I understand that there may, for some of the biological agents, um, be a very different reaction to the agent if it is experienced in weaponized super dosages. So the behavior of an organism may be different when it's naturally propagated than when it's experienced by the human body in massive overdoses such as weaponized delivery might create. It is not clear to me that we're prepared for dealing with the different way the body may react to super dosage um, and in that case a naturally occurring disease like Ebola or anthrax or something like that uh, could take on very different characteristics when it becomes a bioterror weapon. As we saw, the uh, attention to the Ebola virus in the United States, even though the risk and the exposure were statistically insignificant and very well handled by our public health resources, shows that behind the immediate biological risk of a bioterror weapon comes a psychological reaction um, that could have a very, very significant effect in terms of panic and public behavior. And I don't believe that the follow-on psychological consequences of the public psychological, psychological consequences of um, a biological agent being at work in the United States have been properly thought through or identified. Um, I think it's important that we look to make sure that in our preparation for this eventuality um, there is as little incumbency protection as Washington is capable of delivering. We are uh, the home base here in Washington, D.C. of incumbency protection, but if there's ever a place where we need to be extremely solicitous of new and disruptive technologies, this is it. But the voices of those technologies are rarely heard. The established actors usually have Washington's ear, and incumbency protection is a particularly dangerous phenomenon with respect to protecting ourselves against the bioterror threat. The last thing I'll say is that um, I hope that the Blue Ribbon Study Panel will take a look at how well organized we are both at the executive and legislative level for addressing this problem. Uh, my experience of at least looking at the executive branch uh, from my legislative perch is that this responsibility spans a great variety of agencies and is not gathered in a single individual who is at a level of clout and seniority adequate to pull all of those agencies together and produce a, an effective result. Um, if anything, the situation on the legislative side is worse. This spans an innumerable number of committees and subcommittees, and the difficulty of pulling things together is um, demonstrated by recent efforts that uh, I have made to try to get the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee to have a joint hearing to consider this problem. The Intelligence Committee has very important responsibilities in this area because it looks into the terror threat, but knowing about it doesn't help much if you're not ready to defend against it, and that's where the HELP Committee comes in. But because the HELP Committee staff haven't been cleared and for a variety of other institutional reasons, 
Um, we haven't been able to pull even that off when you throw in the fact that Homeland Security, Government Affairs Committee also has important responsibilities in this area, Armed Services also has some important responsibilities in this area, and there are probably other committees that could, with the uh, uh, entrepreneurial instincts of their committee staff at work, think of a way that they have an important role in this issue. Um, I think it's really important that we try to find a way to organize ourselves better. There is a Weapons of Mass Destruction Caucus, led by Senator Burr and Senator Casey. I commend them for their leadership. But the rivalry between a caucus and a committee is a long-established Washington phenomenon, and caucuses rarely win. So um, I think your work will provide a very important rallying point. And uh, if there's anything, that else, anything else that I can do to be helpful, I would like to do this. I think you are addressing a vital issue where there are truly important needs and where, for a variety of reasons, the uh, agencies of government have not been able to organize themselves to be as effective as uh, they should have been to date. Yes. Uh, Senator, uh, are you suggesting that we should look at the governance issue as well? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, well, you all have been around in very significant governmental positions. Mm -hmm. And I think the experience of those of us who spent some time in this game uh, is pretty clear that if the administrative structure isn't conducive to a result, it makes a result very hard to achieve. And um, the way you break through, there are two ways you break through that. One is you get the administrative structure right and get some focus on an issue ahead of time. And the second is you wait for something awful to happen, and then there is a stampede. The problem is that when things are done by stampede, they're not usually done as effectively and thoughtfully as they could be, and there's often very significant overreach. And um, so the best of all possible worlds is to set up the institutions of government in such a way that they can be effective in advance. Yes, On the topic of the both the executive and the legislative branches being unfocused or disorganized in this regard. One uh, very specific item is that it's my understanding that in the Bush administration there was a special assistant for biodefense, uh, a position that is not held in the current uh, administration. Uh, I know that there's uh, some negative thoughts about the proliferation of czars in, in the White House, but uh, that's a pretty important position. And, it might be something that, uh, given your expertise in this issue and in in, in your party, uh, you might be able to talk to the president about. I think that um, there, I wouldn't want to argue against such a position, but I would put two caveats uh, around it. One is that it, ha it has become a very prominent political attack that somebody is establishing a czar, that they're not subject to advice and consent, that this is more of a, you know, domineering and, and uh, imperial Obama presidency and that whole. And once you have a political theme like that that's established, it's a very hard to ask people to get out of that rut. And so everybody's going to want to go to that political theme if it suits their interests, and for a lot of people it suits their interests. So that creates a significant caveat. Well, maybe, maybe the other is that you could know, it's, not, it it's not clear that um, a position in the White House matters much if it's not clear that that position in the White House has the President's ear, has budget authority over the issue, and has an ability to get Secretary's attention. It's been, uh, as Secretary Shalala and Secretary Ridge will both know, it is a longstanding skill set within the various ca cabinet agencies to defend against White House appointees. And so the mere existence of a White House appointee, I think, is a long way from a solution to the problem. You really have to look at the whole administrative structure and see where the power network flows through it to see whether it's serious or not. 
I saw concern. smiles of recognition from the secretaries, by the way, for the yeah. record. <laughs> mumbling to each other. <laughs> How come he's so Been there, done that. <laughs> you were reading our minds, not our lips. <laughs> Just to pivot off your comments about cyber, I think uh, I agree with you. I see the parallels between the cyber challenge and the bio challenge. You know, w we could debate as to which is the greater threat to American security, but it does have a lot of the the bio issue has a lot of the same problems that the, the cyber issue has posed to us. You know, a variety of different agencies involved, coordination across, you know, a vast range of logistical challenges and the like within government, privacy issues, oversight issues. Um, since you've been in the trenches on the cyber matter, and, and we do seem to be making some progress there, obviously maybe a little late in the day, but we're making yeah. some progress. Any parallels there? Any lessons from where we've gotten to in the cyber area that you think can apply to this? I think the danger with bioterror is much greater. Cyber attacks come in so many different forms um, that relatively non-damaging forms manifest themselves and people can begin to get used to the idea. So it is a bad thing when Sony gets hacked. It is a bad thing when Anthem Blue Cross loses all of its uh, customer data. But it's a very different thing than having the electric grid go down for a month in the winter. Um, there aren't a whole lot of such intermediate steps when it comes to bioterror. You go straight to people dying and folks in very ominous looking biohazard suits running around the streets of our country and a very, very immediately serious situation. So we have a little bit more of a warning and a little bit more of a chance for there to be the political accommodation that something needs to take place. But I think fundamentally um, it's important that there be a recognition of the seriousness of the threat and then people will come into alignment. I think we could have and we should have had a very good cyber security bill back when, um, but some very rank politics that need not be the subject of this hearing interfered, and as a result, we are way behind uh, where we should have been. Um, so that makes the role of this panel or all the more important because if you can be a forum for helping people to understand how very serious this risk is then um, i think that's a very very important service and for those who are recalcitrant about responding because for one reason or another they have a political opposition to it it's always worth bearing in mind that if the risk is serious then there's the political risk that when the day comes then you get the stampede reaction. And whatever they may be worried about in a thought through process and a thought through piece of legislation becomes dramatically worsened when nobody's interested in hearing from them any longer because their bodies in the streets. Senator, uh, you've obviously decided to, uh, I'm kind of curious what brought uh, to your head in your heart the notion you wanted to deal with the uh, preparedness uh, uh, prevention and, and, and I don't know whether it was a previous experience but it's I, I think you're probably unique among the members of the House and Senate who's really focused on this as part of your uh, uh, legislative responsibility so I guess uh, the question I have is just one out of curiosity what is it that drives you to be so critically interested in this issue because we obviously think it's very important sort of the members of the panel and so the audience and the people participate Secondly, your sense of uh, among the priorities of your colleagues on the Hill, regardless of party, where does it fall? And that leads to a third question, which uh, is somewhat troubling, given the, your description of the diffuse nature of responsibility. This panel intends on uh, sending to Congress, uh, this is, we don't want this gathering dust. We're going to have some short and long-term recommendations, and it can get lost in the jurisdictional battles uh, and so unless there are, we have champions on the Hill that say this is very important, we ought to accelerate it, maybe we ought to have some joint committee hearings so some of these recommendations can be elevated, debated, and hopefully uh, uh, become part of uh, the, the agenda and, and part of our, 
broader national policy. So while I'm fascinated by your particular interest, yeah. I got interested a long time ago when a bunch of tornadoes bounced around my congressional district yeah. and wrote the Stafford Act. Secondly, a sense of your, your colleagues in Congress, and thirdly, how do we deal with a diffuse jurisdiction when we want to uh, bring very serious recommendations short and long term that uh, our chairman, Senator Lieberman, has championed from the moment he sat down? Let, so me <laughs> <laughs> uh, really. Let me welcome my friend and colleague, Senator Lieberman, who has just arrived. I'm let, let delighted me, uh, to see you, Joe. Right, let me return that welcome. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, this lies, everybody is aware of that familiar four-way box that divides the immediate and the important. And what's not immediate and not important gets no attention. And what is immediate and is important gets lots of attention. But what's immediate and not important always gets more attention than what's important <laughs> and not immediate. And for now, biodefense is in that important but not immediate box. And we need to raise the level of urgency. Um, I came into government working for a governor who you probably remember, Bruce Sundlin of Rhode Island. I know Secretary Shalala remembers him. A truly unforgettable governor. He was an unforgettable governor. And uh, we walked into a banking crisis in which virtually all of the banks in the state had to be shut down. All of the state uh, insured ones had to be shut down literally day one of the administration. We walked into the biggest um, percentage deficit any state has ever reported. And we walked into a workers' compensation mess in which every single insurer came into the governor and said, we're out of here. We're done. We're canceling all our policies at the end of their periods. And um, every single one of those, and individually and collectively, those problems caused an enormous amount of suffering for people in Rhode Island. We had our own private recession through all of that. There was an enormous amount of misery. There was an enormous amount of fear when people lost access to their bank accounts. Every single one of those was preventable if people in government had been doing their jobs. And it's not just our job in government to handle the immediate problems that come through the door. We need to be like Wayne Gretzky, who said that great hockey players don't just go to where the puck is, they go to where the puck is going to be. And if we're not ready where the puck is going to be, then when it gets there, we're going to look like fools. And so I see it as part of my responsibilities to try to figure out where the puck is going to be. And in terms of national security, I think cybersecurity and bioterror are the two great unmet, unanswered dangers that we face. Yes, Joe, uh, your timing was perfect. Yeah, I know. I, I actually missed uh, hearing all your presentation. I'm sorry. I had to plane. I'm and sure you can get it off YouTube. I was like, I will do it for sure. <laughs> but just in the little bit I heard, uh, <clears throat> Senator Whitehouse really has a real, a real clear sense of priorities and uh, works very hard uh, to uh, get some of the things done that he, that he sees as threats to the country. We worked a long time on Cybersecurity, uh, I, 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 with confidence, nearly made it. Passed the baton to him, and he's carried it on with some success. So, uh, thank you for being here. This Senator, My pleasure. Thank you very much. As I mentioned before, we'll be looking for champions on the Hill because we like we're going to make some very serious, short and long-term recommendations, and we'll be knocking on your door. We very much appreciate your participation. This well, morning. I appreciate this all is of you are. Precursor to our calling on you. All of you are busy and important people, and the fact that you've put your effort into this is vital. Washington is a city full of blue ribbon panels. This is an important one, and I wish you Thanks, Godspeed. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very Thanks much. Good Thank day. you, Senator. Sure, you well, uh, let's call the, uh, the, the panel one, which follows the congressional perspective. We have an extraordinary group of uh, people uh, who are coming before us today, and uh, Really a benefit of, of riches. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Julie Gerberding, Dr. Julie Fisher, and Dr. Norman Kahn. Thank you uh, all very much uh, for being here. It's one more coming. <laughs> I feel a little bit uh, humbled by the number of doctors here until I realize that I have a JD. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the equivalent. <laughs>
Who, who wants to go first? We have Dr. Gerber going first. Is that okay? That's true. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, for those who don't know, now Executive Vice President for Strategic Communications at Global Public Policy and Population Health, um, uh, Merck, and former director, uh, from which position we know and appreciate her very much, of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate um, the timeliness and the focus of this panel. Um, you know, when I was preparing for this, I couldn't help but think back on Ebola and the, um, the reaction I had when I was watching that crisis unfold was profound sadness because for the last uh, more than a decade, we've worked so hard at CDC and elsewhere in our government to try to be prepared for emerging threats. And we were not prepared for Ebola, even though it had been on the threat list since um, the threat list was created. So I had to really ask myself, well, where did I go wrong? Where did our government go wrong? Why is it that my company um, could make a vaccine in short order when it was absolutely needed, but we didn't have one in the stockpile up until that point? So what really was wrong with our system that um, despite everything that we've known and have learned, especially since 911, we still have not really taken threats off the table and created that strong line of preparedness that we had hoped to create. Um, you know, when I was responsible for the public health preparedness, I was relatively agnostic as to whether the threat was intentional or whether it was created by the best terrorist of all, Mother Nature. And I think in almost all of these cases, um, these are now in the category of predictable surprises. If we had sustained a level of alertness and systems of surveillance that were sophisticated enough to match the known threats that were in our midst. And let me just use Ebola as an example, even though I recognize that was a, obviously a mother nature threat and not an intentional threat. Um, we have known that bats in Africa harbor hemorrhagic fever viruses for a long time. We have watched the Egyptian fruit bat and the other implicated species move their migratory patterns across the continent. We have observed the presence of these hemorrhagic fever viruses in bats in more and more places across Africa. We've also observed the incredible social disruption the urbanization, the movement of people into areas where previously they would not have had contact with animals or bats. And we've seen isolated examples where spillovers have occurred and outbreaks um, with significant human consequence have erupted. We also know the infrastructure in these areas is weak, to say the least, and that there was very little preparedness for any kind of emerging infectious disease threat, let alone one that was as serious as Ebola. So in a sense, those are all domains of surveillance. You know, we think about surveillance of the pathogen in humans, <coughs> but actually we need contextual surveillance. We need the ability to understand the animal environment in which um, the natural threats arise. We need to understand the sociologic environment, the cultural environment. Um, particularly the social and cultural environment when we're talking about intentional threats. And we certainly need better surveillance about how systems of care do or do not have the capacity to respond and to, to deal with these threats. Um, when, we, when we were thrust into the anthrax crisis in 2001, we had to act fast and learn fast and respond very fast with very little um, experience dealing with an international threat of that nature. And it was an international threat, although most people didn't realize that it had extended beyond the United States because some of the mail um, extended beyond the United States. But when, when, you, when we did the after action reviews for the anthrax situation, we tried to codify the most important surveillance activities that needed to occur going forward. And what has happened since that time is systems have been created. Um, they've been, I think, repurposed. The funding has been repurposed. Um, the attention span has moved to other priorities of health and, and human safety. And so we have systematically built up and then disassembled that line of surveillance and response capability that we, that we built. Not because any one individual decided it wasn't important, but because we allowed competing priorities to interfere 
and to attenuate what had written off to a good start. But now, um, if you speak to people, at least in the U.S. public health sector, the funding has been dramatically reduced, the people are gone, and what was um, a potential strong front line of capability has been significantly diminished. And I, you know, I applaud so many of the efforts that have been sustained. I think the BARDA program is a very vital piece of our capability development for both surveillance and risk mitigation. But I think we need a refreshed strategy and we have to figure out how to make that process even more attractive to biotech um, industries as well as larger industries so that we create the stockpile of protection that we need. We, we, we can do it. Um, didn't take too long to get three Ebola vaccines uh, available for clinical testing when we had to do it. So why wait until the crisis when the capability has existed all along? And I think that's a shared responsibility. It isn't just the government. The private sector has a responsibility to play in that environment as well. But we do need to come together with strong leadership to say these are the national priorities. Let's step up to the plate and get the job done right. We can't afford not to. Uh, that's a great uh, introduction, and I uh, appreciate the directness of it, too. Um, I, I, I'm, with the permission of my colleagues on the panel, I think we'd like to hear the other two witnesses, and then we'll get into questions and answers. Dr. Fisher? I think you might have to use this. Okay. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank the panel for the work you're doing and for the invitation to address you here today. I appreciate it. So to follow on to what Dr. Geberding said, everything that was said of the U.S. is doubly true of trying to enhance disease surveillance systems and sustain their functioning in the international setting. There are myriad competing priorities. Um, the burdens of disease in many low and income countries are immediate, real, and take a toll on human lives and economic development on a daily basis. So when we look at building those capacities, the focus is often on disease-specific surveillance needs. How do we detect diseases like HIV, malaria, and TB, and do our best to address those specific burdens and to show the impact of programs? Efforts to do that, um, including the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which was started in the, the Bush administration and continues now, have had an enormous impact on public health and on child survival. But Many of those programs, although they strengthened capabilities, did so in a way that really focuses on specific disease reporting and specific disease outcome. Emergencies like the Ebola outbreak, um, like other emerging infectious diseases that can be listed on a periodic basis from the 1990s onward, uh, the emergence of, of viruses like Nipah virus, the SARS virus, have continually called attention to the need to strengthen systems across the board to help in low and, in and middle income countries um, to strengthen systems not just to detect a specific disease, but to knit together all the, cap the capacities that have been built so that information can be collected and acted upon with disease outbreak investigations, with the ability to respond and contain um, emerging disease events in real time. So what we, we have learned is that it's a continuum. Um, so if you'll pardon me for a brief excursion into my liberal arts education, um, we have, uh, which I also have with the doctorate, so I just, um, the, the novel Anna Karenina by Tolstoy begins with one of the most famous lines in literature. You know, every, every happy family is the same, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And unfortunately, that is true of disease surveillance and response capabilities all across the world. In low and middle income countries, there are distinctions in the structural challenges and the human resource challenges in the infrastructure gaps that mean that solving them with a broad stroke is quite challenging. However, we can also look at the Anna Karenina example um, to understand why this, is this, why this is so difficult. For Anna Karenina's marriage to work, everything had to come together, not just one thing. It all had to work at the same time. And that is true of the ability to detect emerging and epidemic prone diseases, whatever the origin, from bedside at the health center to the point of reporting them to national authorities who have the obligation to report them to the international community, 
so that countries all over the world can work together to mobilize resources and respond effectively. Um, as we saw in the Ebola outbreak, which is an unfortunate immediate case study, these systems uh, must, it, it's not enough to have a single astute clinician, although a sometimes an astute clinician with a, a good instincts and a, and, a, and a thick contact list can circumvent broken systems. That, that, that's not reliable. It ha the systems have to work from the point of care in which a community is aware of risks and has the access to a health system where there are trained clinicians aware of priority diseases and empowered with the acumen, the awareness, and the authority to, to report those diseases and those events to a designated unit that has both the expertise to conduct a risk assessment and the resources and the power to initiate an investigation and to begin the process of reporting and containing the event. Those, all those processes have to work from bedside to collection of information, to risk assessment, to outbreak or investigation, to reporting. So what are we doing about this? Well, in the, in the last 10 years, um, the U.S. and its international partners have invested in systems of governance and in systems capacity building. Um, in the U.S., through the efforts of the CDC, USAID, and also through security agencies, through the Department of Defense's Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Cooperative Biological Engagement Program, the State Department's Biosecurity Engagement Program, we are looking at building those systems to detect unusual events and to report them promptly. Um, that effort has been focused on the agreements of 196 member states to build the capacities to detect, assess, report, and respond to disease events of any origin, first in the international health regulations, which is binding on 196 member states, a standard that they agreed to. And then more recently, the uh, Obama administration has tried to galvanize and accelerate progress toward those goals with the global health security agenda that includes uh, milestones for measuring the ability to detect as well as to prevent and respond to disease outbreaks. We have a set of goals. We know what we need to do. We have an idea of how to do it. Now we need the who. We need a trained global health workforce that's aware of, empowered to, and, and equipped to act. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but it's a, a first step. We've made first steps. And the question is now how we sustain them and how we keep maintaining and sustaining the progress between outbreaks, not just during events when everyone's attention is galvanized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Khan, consultant, Counter Bio LLC, former director, intelligence community, Counter Biological Weapons Program. Where, where did you work when you were? CIA. CIA. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for being here. Well, I appreciate the invitation of the panel and the opportunity to, to share remarks with you on this topic. Good. Um, a bit of, of background, you've already heard this, I'm sure, for, um, uh, from other panelists, but is this, sure this is not on? Is, uh, is that better? Better, better, better. Ah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can hear it now. It's much better. All right. So I can hear myself. Uh, so, so we all know that the, the knowledge and, and the equipment associated with, with, with biology uh, are widespread. It's essentially uncontrollable, very different from the nuclear paradigm. It used to be that people would confuse bio and nuke. I think we've gotten past that, and people now understand bio is very definitely not the same as nuke. They're both WMD, potentially, but there are huge differences between them. You cannot control the spread of biology in any way, shape, or form, uh, nor can you control the, the availability of bio equipment. Uh, as you know, the sophistication within biology is is uh, it just it's, it's at a remarkable pace. And, and things that are done today in high schools that a couple of decades ago would have been state of the art science in biology. So it, it's it's devolved down to that level. Um, I know a lot of remarks are focused uh, on pathogens. I would also like to point out to the panel that from a, a biological weapons perspective, you don't, it doesn't have to be a pathogen. It can be a small compound that's a bioregulator. So if you think of a pill like Prozac, which has hopefully beneficial effects on patients, you think of the flip side of that. You know, these are not pathogens, but they are compounds that can have very adverse biological effects in the physiological sense, and that's all part of the BW threat from my 
perspective, all right? So it's not just pathogens, it's compounds that are biological in nature, small peptides. Peptides, for example, components of parts of proteins, all right, that, that have immense physiological effects. Uh, and how many people worldwide have the ability to play with this stuff? The, the number is in the millions. It's a huge number. It's increasing all the time. Uh, and again, this is, this, this is not controllable. Uh, and you have biology going on in labs, uh, government labs, private sector labs, um, academic labs, and in people's homes. You know, so you can, for X thousand dollars, five, ten thousand uh, dollars, uh, purchase very, very sophisticated equipment. You can get this on eBay. You can set up a, a lab in your garage or in your apartment. And people have done this. It's not that uncommon. And there's really, really, really good science happening in those apartments and garages, all right? Uh, so what I want to focus on today uh, is a part of the BW threat um, that maybe doesn't receive quite the attention uh, that other aspects of the threat do. So you can focus on state programs. You can focus on terrorist group programs. And then what I'm going to talk about today is the lone actor. There's a presentation later today that's going to talk about the psychology of the lone actor. I'm not going to be talking about that aspect of it. So my, my, my focus today is really uh, based upon what I did my, in my previous government service and, and thoughts that I've developed you know, since then. So if you ask yourself, what kind of damage could a lone actor do in biology, a lone actor BW person do? Um, the way I would propose to think about this is to say, okay, if it's a question of the balance between capability and intent. So at the low end, you can have a relatively unskilled person cook up ricin in a kitchen and use it to poison someone. And the FBI has plenty of files about ricin cases. So that's where capability and intent match at the low end. Right? Now at the high end, you can have a, a highly skilled virologist or microbiologist, molecular biologist. I'll throw in, there are, there, are, there are other parts of biology that are relevant here, immunologists and talking about tinkering with the immune system. A person with high skills in those disciplines with really nefarious intent, you've got a really big problem there because if that capability and that intent match at the high end, you're, you're basically done. All right, you have a, a problem that is, is, is you really can't deal with. All right, now there are also cases historically where intent and capability haven't matched. So, um, if you look at Aum Shinrikyo, the Japanese cult in the 90s, uh, they uh, famous for their sarin attacks. All right, they also had an anthrax program. All right, it did not work, it failed. Um, it failed, in my opinion, because even though the intent was there to do great harm, the capability wasn't. The person who was in charge of their anthrax program didn't have the right skill set to do it. Uh, they ended up using a vaccine strain. All right. Basically, intent and capability did not match there, and they got nothing happened with respect to, to anthrax. You can also have a case where um, capability is greater than intent, and for that I, w I would propose um, the Bruce Ivins, presumed Bruce Ivins, anthrax attacks, the Amerithrax attacks in, in the fall of 2001. Ivins could have done a lot more with his skill set. All right, so their capability was greater than intent. All right, so that's how I think about the degree of threat. And obviously, the, 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 the most pressing of those is a, a highly skilled individual who wants to do something really, really, really bad. Okay, um, ideally, you'd like to defend against this by preventing it from happening in the first place. So when you look at the intelligence community's function of an indications and warning, don't let bad stuff happen, right? Um, so uh, there was a, a study that came out uh, earlier this year, University, of, University College of London study. Out of 119 wo lone wolf attackers, these are not bioterrorists, all right, but these are just lone wolf attacks out of 109, out of the sample of 119 cases that they looked at, 60% of those attackers leaked details of their plans to someone. All right, so that this brings. Uh, uh, I'm not, I don't. I don't recall. 
I don't recall if it was a UK folk, only yeah. UK or not. I don't know. Right. Uh, can't answer that. Sorry. Um, so they weren't very long. Well, no. Well, no. I mean, uh, were you asking about where the countries of origin of the individuals or yeah, what? Yeah, I'm just curious, but it, 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 it's okay because they're all lone wolves. Yeah, they were all lo they were all they, they, acting on their own. They, they were alone, yeah. They, they they were all lone actors, right? right. But not bio, but they were all lone actors, and they were looking at what kinds of clues might be out there, and they found that 60% of them actually, in one form or another, could have been on the internet or take a telling a friend or family who were interviewed after the fact that it turns out somebody was aware that there was something going on here before the fact. So this, this brings me to what I want to talk about a lot today, and that's what I'll call bystanders. These are the people who become aware of activities of concern. They can be friends of the family, they can be family members, they can be colleagues, they can be the general public. And I'll give you just two examples of that. Uh, in April 2013, an Indonesian by the name of Sifa Riano uh, was arrested by Indonesian authorities. Uh, he had posted a farewell notice to his parents on his Facebook page. And it said, quote, God willing, I will take action at the Myanmar embassy. He was arrested in Jakarta uh, with another guy on a motorbike. They had five pipe bombs. They were on their way to the Myanmar embassy. And they were going to blow it up uh, because of uh, purported uh, insults to Muslims in Myanmar. Uh, so how does this relate to bystanders? Uh, the authorities were alerted to his Facebook posting by other internet users. Somebody picked it up turned them in, and bad stuff didn't happen. Another example, uh, I, I'll probably butcher the pronunciation, it's, it's Polish, Bruno Kwiecin, Polish uh, professor of chemistry, right? Was arrested in Krakow in November 2012. He had four tons of explosives along with detonators, and he was going to blow up the Polish parliament. Uh, didn't happen because he was arrested. Why was he arrested? His wife, who was a biologist, turned him in when he started asking her questions about which pathogens and which diseases were the most deadly. That's a bystander. And he was interested in biology, he decided to go to explosives instead. And he was a chemist, he probably had the capability to do something nasty with, with bio, but he chose not to do that. Um, and the police put him under surveillance after his wife called, called in that tip, and they ended up arresting him. And uh, some of his students at the university where he taught had also alerted um, university officials about some of the statements that he had been making in class that he had to take action and do something about the government. So those are all examples of, of bystanders. Okay, so how do, you inf how, do you, how do you work the bystander process? And I'll say process because uh, because you think of the end result of a bystander as an event, but it's actually a process. There are lots of things that go through a bystander's mind before a bystander actually takes action. Uh, you have to observe something and become aware of it. You ask, your, ask yourselves questions like, wow, well, do, is it my place to say something here? What if it's a trusted colleague? What if it's a family member? Is any of my business? Will it make a difference? Will they take action? Will I get in trouble as a whistleblower? So the, there's an actual bystander process that, that has been written on. Um, and, and the question is, how do, you, how do you work with the bioscience community to, to inform them of their bystander uh, responsibilities? Uh, there's something called the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, NSABB, which you may or may not have been, uh, been familiarized with in, in the course of of uh, the presentations, uh, and they're an NIH construct, and they address issues related to biosecurity and what's called um, dual research of concern, so legitimate research that has the potential to be, to be misused. Uh, in 2011, the NSABB issued a report. The title of the report was Guidance for Enhancing Personal Reliability and Strengthening the Culture of Responsibility. I that focus on culture of responsibility. So two recommendations that I'm going to read here. Uh, first recommendation of the NSABB in this report. Institutions conducting biological agents and toxins research are recommended to implement programs or processes that enable the reporting of concerning behaviors. Second uh, recommendation of the NSABB in the same report. Individuals working with bio stuff 
must understand and acknowledge their responsibility to report activities that are inconsistent with a culture of responsibility or otherwise troubling. Likewise, institutional and laboratory leadership must acknowledge their responsibility to respond to reports of concerning behavior and undertake actions to prevent retaliation along the lines of whistleblower. So those are recommendations in this report. Uh, the NSA BB does still exist, but these are just recommendations that are out there. Uh, so you really have to act on this. So you're going to get a talk later this afternoon uh, uh, from someone from the FBI, Ed Yu. Um, Ed has done what I consider to be absolutely heroic work to engage the do-it-yourself bio community, uh, other communities uh, across this country and, just, and also internationally in the, in the sense that there's something called iGEM, the International uh, Genetic Engineering Machine Competition where people from all over the world do really cool stuff with bio and they, and they get awards for it and it's, some of that research is, is knock your socks off research and some of that is done by high school students. It's actually a high school iGEM competition. So Ed has done amazing work to, to sensitize those communities to their personal responsibilities and it's not really about don't do bad stuff yourself because 99.999999 percent of all the people who do bio who dabble in bio across the planet are completely benign they're doing it for fun they're doing it because they want to advance biomedicine whatever but but what you're trying to to instill in them is a sense of responsibility so that if they see that point oh, 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 one person who's gone off the reservation, they have to tell someone about that. Um, Josh Lederberg, uh, in 1998, so former Nobel laureate, uh, perhaps one of the most famous U.S. biologists who has ever lived, one of the greatest biologists ever, uh, 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 this is a paraphrase of what Labor, later Brooks said because I forgot to bring the quote with me. But what he said was, there's no technological answer to biological weapons. If there is an answer at all, it lies in the realm of ethical and moral responsibility. And then he added, but how responsive is a sociopath to ethical considerations? And the answer is, he's not. <laughs> but that's where bystanders come in. I mean, th this is an insanely difficult problem for the intelligence community because the, the IC knows how to prosecute programs or activities where there's a defined target set. So country X may have a BW program and there's, a, there's, a, there, there's tradecraft, there's protocols to how you go about breaking into that and penetrating that. There, there, there are similar protocols and tradecraft for, for going after identified groups whether it's Al Qaeda or whatever. For the lone actor, there is no established, how do you, how do you go get a, a BW lone actor? There's no target. The IC works when you have a target. Doesn't mean you'll be successful in penetrating the target by any means, but we, they know how to, I, I can't say we, I'm not part of that anymore. Uh, they know how to do that. For lone actor, where's the target? That's where bystanders comes in. So my recommendations, to the panel would be, uh, and Ed can't say this because he's a current government employee, he's not allowed to do this, but I'll, I'm speaking personally. Uh, we need a lot more Ed use, a lot. And not just in this country, it's got to be international. This is an international problem. You can have somebody in, I don't care, pick a country randomly, Ecuador, whatever, who for whatever reason, you know, has, has an ax to grind against this country. How are you going to know about that person, right? Or, and that, or that person could do something in, in, uh, in Ecuador that happens to be a contagious agent and we end up with it anyway. So it's got to be an international activity. Uh, I think there needs to be uh, the, the fostering of, of ethics-based programs for biology students. You can start at the college level, but it's got to filter down to high schools at least, right? Uh, and, and the purpose, again, is, is not just to say don't do bad things yourself because that's not going to be relevant to most people. It's you have to take responsibility for everyone else, all right? Uh, you're and you're trying, you need to instill that sense of responsibility, which includes the obligation to report, whether it's a family member, your best buddy, whatever. You have a societal obligation, an ethical obligation to do that. Uh, I do think there needs to be more research to understand the whole bystander process because different cultures around the world will have different 
ways of acceptable reporting. So what might work in the United States or the UK might not work in Bangladesh for cultural reasons, or it might, I don't know, but the research hasn't been done to figure out how do you do bystanders internationally. Um, and so um, I, I do think there needs to be a, a, a fostering of, of, of international programs, not just US-based programs on, on bioethics, and it's got to be at the lowest level possible. And this is something that's over time. It's not going to be, doesn't happen overnight, but the point is today doesn't exist in a formal sense. So something like that needs in to be institutionalized, and it's got to go on forever, because this problem is going to be with us for a very, very, very long time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Doctor. Um, that was uh, really good. Uh, actually, what you you did was a subset of the general lone wolf problem. You did it re uh, relating to uh, uh, biological weapons, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I thought you did two things that were very helpful to me. One was that uh, you cited that study, uh, which was interesting. That sixty percent of the lone wolf studied told somebody, or, or, or at least, mm -hmm. if not specifically said, I'm going to uh, attack the Myanmar embassy, mm -hmm. that I presume they said something that should have raised mm -hmm. uh, concern. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the second was that you had the two examples. Am I right that the, uh, I don't know what the study showed, mm -hmm. that the individual um, in Indonesia had not uh, been on the screen of law enforcement before yeah. he posted that. Cor that's screen. correct. And the same with the Polish example. Yeah. Totally not on anybody's radar screen at all. So these are people who beforehand had no reason to, to be of suspicion to the authorities. And all of a sudden, boom, there they go. So mm -hmm. it, it um, always seemed to me that uh, when you're dealing with lone wolves, the, the concept that I guess began in New York, I don't know, but it, and then was also adopted by the Department of Homeland Security, maybe it started in DHS, which is see something, say something. Mm -hmm. Th that is uh, uh, uniquely and almost indispensably relevant to um, lone wolves, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and the examples you give and the numbers you give from that study are, argue strongly mm -hmm. for that. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say, see, see something, say something. So if I'm... In a, in a subway, for example, yeah. and I see somebody doing something that makes me nervous. I don't know who this person is. I'm, there's a good chance I'll report that. If, I'm, if I happen to be working in a lab somewhere, so I have a buddy who's dabbling in bio, my best friend. It's, 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 I th I'm, my point is it's easier to report someone you don't even know on a sub, in a subway car than it is to report a family member or a, 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 an esteemed work colleague. And right. so again, this is where th there needs to be some more work done on what motivates bystanders to report in various situations across different cultures. Because in uh, the Polish case, you had both of those. You had the uh, family member, a wife, who knew right. enough about what was going on to be concerned about the mm -hmm. questions her mm -hmm. husband was asking. And then as you reported, you had the students, the students or colleagues Correct. who were told the university. Mm -hmm. So they were. Uh, ethical and in that sense heroic. Um, let me ask just a, a question or two. Do you say gerberding? Gerberding. Yeah, yeah okay. Like the baby food. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. Um, so uh, I, I appreciated your directness in saying that during the Ebola crisis you, you were feeling remorse, what, why weren't we prepared? And um, you mentioned a couple of things that strike me. One was that we've cut back, we built up and then we've cut back because, maybe because of the distance from the anthrax attacks, um, uh, the time that passes, or because other priorities come along. So I take it one priority, you would say, uh, would be so that we're not unprepared next time, would be to increase uh, funding through the U.S. public health system. I think we need to come to some kind of a national agreement that there are certain capabilities that need to be built and sustained right. and that they can't be put in emergency budgets or things that are post-crisis and then wane when the budget needs to be balanced. Yeah. And unfortunately, we all recognize the incredible budget difficulties that our Congress is pacing, placing, so I, I don't... I don't misunderstand why it's hard, but I do think that we're either serious about building this capability and sustaining it or we're not, and we can't have a ping pong of there's a crisis, let's build it up, it 
gradually erodes and there's a mini flu pandemic it gets built up again and it erodes now we've got Ebola and we make an enormous um, appropriation for Ebola we've got to have a, a sustained commitment to really build invest in and you know dual purpose these investments because they do right. address both the intentional as well as the uh, mother nature terrorist events but uh, the worst thing is yeah. to um, hire people and then you know your workforce goes away people move on to mm -hmm. other things and you've created almost a false sense of security that you have that kind of preparedness so, so yes Donna, can I go ahead. follow up on that Please. Julie to what extent does the existing <coughs> infrastructure for detecting that CDC and the states have uh, that infrastructure for detecting outbreaks poison outbreaks I mean other kinds of things is that the infrastructure you use to build out in my opinion absolutely and that's why I mean by the concept of dual <coughs> dual use that the very same people the very same laboratory capabilities the very same bio detectors if you're talking about environmental sampling the very things that we need for bio threats also have the dual purpose of helping us respond to more naturally acquired and transmitted can threats. Can ask the international question? Because there are labs, uh, some labs that are supported in other countries. To what extent does that infrastructure, can that have dual use as well? I, I think it's absolutely the same answer. We build the systems to be able to detect um, events and laboratories to be able to safely, reliably, and rapidly um, screen for and confirm uh, uh, diseases and events. So we can't just build systems to detect unusual events. You have to build a system that works day in, day out. That's a very important point because what they're arguing is that you shouldn't jerry build the system for, for bio uh, terrorism, right. for bio defense. Mm -hmm. You have to build out the existing uh, system. And, and I, w I would like to just make one really important point about the Department of Defense laboratories on a global basis, the NAMRU and the and the Army laboratories that are strategically located are absolutely essential to this kind of surveillance. If we didn't have NAMRU, we wouldn't know what to put in our flu vaccine. So um, it seems um, kind of a, most people aren't aware that these laboratories basically serve as global public health laboratories around the world. And as a CDC director, I felt like it was my responsibility to step up and really champion the military lab system. And this is critical. Is the WHO <coughs> infrastructure in this area? Well, I, I Our CDC has had people allocated there for Yeah, I mean, I think we have come to recognize that there are some structural issues with the WHO and one of them has to do with the fact that the Director General of the WHO does not really have jurisdiction over the regional WHO offices, and that was certainly a concern during Ebola. But in addition, the WHO itself is not properly funded to create global laboratory support, which relies on partnerships with governments and the entities like the CDC. So you have some in Northern Europe, but not. Not in really. It's not a global network of, of strong laboratory capability and response. Sorry. No, no, that was great. So let, let me follow up. So, so uh, how, how do we get to where you think we should be? In other words, um, what, what is the, let's start globally first. What, what's the global mechanism for achieving what we're describing? If it's not the WHO, or is it to strengthen the WHO? I, th I think that there's a lot of interest in strengthening the WHO, but I think it's also important to recognize that WHO doesn't have deep human resources and capability to put in countries to supplement or work from the outside. WHO has technical assistance and norms to help countries, but the strongest <coughs> assistance is coming from other country partners, and, and in this I think the U.S. has been a leader. And to address the what we can do, I think we look at the countries where we have had a solid impact. For example, the U.S. has partnered in the long term and effectively with the governments of Uganda, of Vietnam, and I think most significantly of Thailand, to partner in building a skilled laboratory workforce that doesn't just ramp up during outbreaks, but that tests itself on a regular basis with detecting disease outbreaks at events of any origin regularly, shows its capabilities, and um, because it operates sustainably, can ramp up. So why those three countries? How, do, how did that happen? By the invitation. Actually. By invitation. Yeah. Those are three countries that were... Go in without invitation. Exactly. And those the are three... Three countries asked for help. 
The three countries that asked for help and were open to partnership with the U.S. government agencies that came for the long haul, uh -huh. did not just parachute in during an outbreak, but came in and said, Which we'll train US you for 30 years. Um, CDC and USAID have been the longest term right. partners, and right. uh, DOD has more recently come to the table yeah. in those countries. Just, uh, on this uh, question, I had to implement some of it, I had to get to where you think we should be. What about uh, domestically, just so I understand it anyway, is, is this something that um, has to come from the White House? Uh, OMB. 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 Yeah. That's, that's usually right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there are, there is a national, at least I, I, I believe there is a, a current national laboratory plan which really lays out what the capabilities requirements are and what needs to happen. There are standards of l levels of laboratory capability that have been evolved and state and local health departments build to certain levels of capability. Um, I, I really, you know, just to cut to the chase here, I don't think it's a, a, the problem is that we don't know what to do. I think it's that we don't make a sustained investment in assuring that we get it done and we're not holding the system accountable for demonstrating the ongoing progress towards success. And, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's something that is directly related to appropriation. Let me open this up to other members of the panel. Go ahead. Go ahead. Jim? Uh, Dr. Gerberding, you you know, cited the, the example of, of Ebola when you said that the government has long known of the threat uh, and you've said that the biotechnology industry has long had the capability to respond to the, to the threat but the twain didn't meet. And the, 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 the structures we have to do that are BARDA and the Special Reserve Fund. Uh, and the problem, a part of the problem is that um, from the point of view of the companies because very much We'll have a break. Eat these products. Um, from the part of the point of view of the companies, and many of them are small companies, uh, it's not always clear what the government wants. There's not a five-year plan. Uh, it's not clear that uh, if you make the product, they will buy it. <laughs> so there's no market for the product. So, the, so if the government doesn't ensure procurement and, and ensure it early, uh, no one will um, take the risk. Uh, uh, and particularly not the investors that need to invest in those companies if those companies are going to long exist. And so you talked about the need to take it to refresh BARDA, and I think that this panel really needs to make some strong recommendations. It's, it's, not, it, it's important to have enough funding for BARDA, it's important to have enough funding for the Special Reserve <coughs> Fund, um, but if, if, that, if there can't be more certainty for the okay. companies that we are asking to um, meet this critical need, then the critical need won't be met. And I'd be interested in your comments on that or any of the I, I completely that. agree with you, Jim. I, I think the, um, the prioritization process um, understandably changes as threats change or circumstances change. So I um, um, have nothing but respect and appreciation for how hard it is to try to stay ahead of that curve. Um, but I do think that now we've learned a lot of lessons from BARDA since its inception, and it would be a good idea to step back and kind of review it collaboratively and what's working, what isn't working. P different industry partners have had different experiences as well. And um, conceptually, it's just it's a brilliant opportunity, but we need to make the most of it. And I, oh, yeah, I will be fully transparent here that Merck has a Ebola vaccine and we certainly didn't have an Ebola vaccine program before the Ebola crisis occurred in Africa and we um, did not have any basic science in Ebola vaccinology but a very small company uh, as you know had uh, taken the intellectual property from the Canadian government and brought it to a point where it was clear this was a viable opportunity and and yet uh, a small company can't possibly scale up and you know, get into the manufacturing uh, volume situation like a large company can do. So I think the lesson there is that from the very beginning we need to understand the importance of partnerships and how do you facilitate the legal surround to that partnership evolution and then the whole um, problem that has always been a rate limiting step, I'm just thinking back to the smallpox days of the liability. So, you know, if you're doing a clinical trial and you're about to <coughs> release a large-scale, life-saving, epidemic-stopping vaccine for the first time in countries where the systems for informed consent and adverse event monitoring and so on and so, so forth are not 
optimized, there's an enormous liability that you know we certainly had to step up to as, as a company to say we're, we're, there will be no heroes in this effort, but it's the right thing to do. So we have to we have to do what we have to do. So I, I, there's, there's an opportunity to learn here. You got some other things. Um, <clears throat> could you help me uh, understand when it's when our friends in the intelligence community and in the public health community identify particular threats, either pending or we've we've seen them, be they from a terrorist uh, cell or naturally occurring, anthrax, Ebola, smallpox. Those were on lists that I saw in 2001. And I got the NIH and I got the CDC. And yet today I don't think, I mean, I'm not sure we've got uh, adequate uh, detection capability for anthrax and we've always <coughs> we went through this <coughs> trauma associated with Ebola. So what is the role of these institutions once the government identifies a potential health problem, either naturally occurring or potentially uh, thrown at us from terrorists. I, I just need to understand from your perspective why we were so ill-prepared and why no basic research was done on vaccines for Ebola, or did I miss something? Was there basic research that was done that was on the shelf and if it was done, we did not have the capability to take that research and begin to, uh, to manufacture. I mean, I, I just, I, one of the challenges we're going to have, I think, making specific recommendations to the Hill is, is a better understanding of the role these institutions play, how far you go internally in research, where you connect with the private sector to have that basic research done, and then what, what point in time and where if uh, do we have a surge, a manufacturing surge capability to get them out, uh, to get the vaccines or the antidotes out there? I just would you just walk us through that process? Well, I'll take a, 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 I'll take a stab at it, but I think there are others in the room who might want to chime in. You know, we have national response plans, thanks to the well, Department of Homeland Security, and they do have robust. We have one for Katrina too, and they didn't use it. So well, I mean, it, but I mean, they have I, robust objectives, and the agency accountability for the various steps in the process are laid out in the plans. The plans are not generally exercised. Um, the plans are not fully funded, and therefore you can't really expect the performance to be what it should be. So I think that's just kind of a broad perspective. The second point is that we do have a large long list of threats. There are the agriculture threats and there are the human threats and it's probably unrealistic to think that we can solve every threat uh, in, in parallel. So we have to make priorities and um, if I were looking at the threat list prospectively I might not have put Ebola at the top of the list either from the standpoint of U.S citizen protection. So there are some threats that I think we've advanced much further in being able to take off the table. For Anthrax, for example, in terms of the vaccines that are available and the countermeasures um, and the biodetection, biowatch type systems that allow environmental sampling for right. these agents to occur. And then there are others that we are further behind on. But I, I think where we need to have broad leadership agreement in, in our cascade of government is on the prioritization process and where w w what is the result we're trying to achieve so that we're very clear that for this one we want vaccines and countermeasures for this one we want the earliest possible detection that we all work toward the same set of goals and they're prioritized and they're properly funded Who's if we sitting at the table to set those priorities in your judgment if you could if you got a blank sheet if you got a blank board and you said who do you want at that table to set those priorities? Well, who because is sitting? This is a contagion, but Ebola is. So, uh, yeah, who's sitting at the table right now? I don't know. I, I don't know who, who would be at the who, table. Who should, should be at the table? In my opinion is, is obviously I believe the locus of overall accountability is the Department of Homeland Security because that's what we're talking about here. But I think for the 
um, the threat mitigation that is the responsibility of the Assistant Secretary of Pub uh, for, for preparedness and response within HHS. And that, that, that individual, um, and we have a very good one right now, that individual really needs to um, be empowered and supported to, to build out these operational plans to achieve these goals and objectives. We have to have somebody from the intelligence community? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a multi-agency effort, of course, but I do think that, you know, uh, my, my theory is you should be planning horizontally, but when it comes to executing, it needs to be vertical and you need to have very clear ideas of who's vertically accountable. Right. And sometimes that gets a little mushy, as you know. Yeah, yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> just, thank, uh, go ahead, Dr. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just one point. I, uh, Yes, the intelligence community does have a place at the table, but bear in mind that it is extraordinarily difficult for the intelligence community to actually tell you what represents a threat. They can do it in a notional sense. They'll say, somebody's doing, working on this. Country X is working on that. Uh, does that mean that Country X is actually going to incorporate that as part of their doctrine? So it's, a, it's, a very, it's one thing to see research. It's another thing to say there's a clear intent to do something with that. And, and, uh, and my other point would, would be that uh, if, if I were a bad guy, I w and since everything that we're doing is public, vaccine for this, vaccine for that, countermeasure for this, and so on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engineer around it. I'm going to do something that, that you will not be prepared for if I really, really want to hurt you. Okay. Well, you're distinguishing between mm -hmm. um, countries and individuals. Ab absolutely. Or, 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 or terrorist groups. Or terrorist groups. They had no problem warning us about mm -hmm. this destruction. I mean, they were very mm -hmm. specific. When, when it comes to BW, that, that's a very difficult problem for the IC. I just mm -hmm. want to add one thing, which is sort of the 3.0, or 1.0 was the good old days, 2.0 is where we are now, and 3.0 is recognizing what's happened with bioscience in the interim, and, you know, our old way of thinking, here's the pathogen, let's make a unique vaccine to this. We've got to move into a platform world where we're agile, can sub in and out antigens, where we've got the ability to rapidly create monoclonal antibodies, you know, with scale and speed. There's a whole lot of technical capabilities here that, you know, BARDA, mm -hmm and the NIH and, and the private sector need to really come together on because what even 10 years ago was pushing the envelope is now sort of a, you know standard and we we're so much further in our biological capability that we ought to be able to think a little bit differently but about also our technology because we can be more nimble exactly yeah both in surveillance as exactly well as Julie, how do we get to 3.0? Oh, can, can, can I just say one thing? Sorry, can I just say one thing? What, what Julie we'll just said, back. okay, uh, what you just said is a way of compensating. I, I, I applaud that because that's how you compensate for the fact that the IC isn't going to have necessarily have the answers that you need in terms of what's the clear and present danger. So by having a much broader approach that, that is very agile and very rapid and very accurate and very effective, you get around the, the reality that it's a very difficult problem for the IC. So, Tevi, to your, to your question, how do we get there to 3.0, um, you know, this, by definition, high-risk research. And we're in an environment right now where we're, we're risk-averse in our research funding because we don't have the investment that we need. And so the, even the entities like DARPA, from my understanding, that are intended to push that kind of an envelope, we're really scaling back and being much more parsimonious on where we are investing. So you will not get you know, the needle on the dial moved if you're conservative about what you're willing to try. We've got to place a lot of bets. Most of them won't work, but that's the only way that we find the, you know, the, the wonderful golden egg that will get the job done right. Dr. Khan, let me ask you this question from the IC point of view. Um, after 9-11, the anthrax, that, which was carried out, as we know, by al-Qaeda, violent Islamist extremists, um, then came the anthrax attacks. The, the immediate um, uh, suspicion was that it mm -hmm. was, had the same source, but of course there's been no evidence that, that, mm -hmm. that uh, in fact, the evidence, that, such as it is, points in a very different direction mm -hmm. as to who caused it. So a, as you look back now, um, 13 plus years since then, w one of the things that thankfully uh, uh, surprises me is that the violent Islamist extremists have not 
you carried out a successful biological weapons attack. I always worried that that was easier to do mm -hmm. for the reasons you've talked about, mm -hmm. the people in their apartments and garages, mm -hmm. uh, than a, a nuclear, uh, for instance. Um, but I want, uh, now we've got uh, ISIS or IS mm -hmm. or ISIL, whatever mm -hmm. it is, Daesh, uh, and it seems to be uh, breaking all, uh, and part of its mode of operating seems to be to, to maybe because it's a terrorist organization, it wants to terrorize us, so now it shows mm. pictures of it cutting the heads of 21 mm -hmm. people up. Mm. Um, it, it, does that, in your opinion, coming out of the intelligence community, raise at least the possibility that, or the probability that ISIS would attempt to carry off a biological attack against a target? Uh, the honest answer is uh, nobody really knows. My personal opinion would, would be yes, and what I would be concerned about, uh, particular, I would be concerned about two things. Number one, there are Europeans, for let's say, a few Americans, but also a lot of Europeans who are educated uh, joining ISIS. I wonder if uh, the backgrounds of any of those, of, the, of those individuals have anything to do with biology or chemistry, and that would be a hell of a concern for me if that were the case. Number two, because they control territory, they have a sanctuary, which means they can do things there. It's like doing something in your apartment. How would I know if you're doing something in your apartment? If you control that territory, you have the ability to do something in a way that, that no one else is going to, to know about. So my personal opinion would be yes, that, that would be of concern, that, uh, especially with a group like ISIS, who, who seems to be extending the boundaries of what yeah. is morally acceptable behavior. Yeah. It's, the, it's the, the, the way in which they have catapulted over mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. Islamists. Yeah, and I, and I guess also I would be especially concerned if, if they look like they're, they're, in, they're going down. Uh, because when a group is in extremists, the rules change, and you need to do something that has a huge impact at that point. And at that point, I would be concerned about any kind of terrorist activity directed against us, and obviously BW would be... The, the, uh, would be perhaps the most dire, depending upon the capability of the individual they asked to do the job. Ken. Thanks, Senator. Um, Dr. Khanna, I was very intrigued by your comments about the bystander issue. And of course, I think as Senator Lieberman just said, that's not just limited to the bio threat, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not just limited to terrorism, it, right. it extends to crime in general. And, I think I remember reading after the July 7th bombing out in, in, uh, in London, mm -hmm. we were reading a story about how mm -hmm. people noticed that in the, uh, the bushes outside the apartment where the, the mm -hmm. bombers had been mixing the chemicals mm -hmm. had mysteriously been dying and nobody mm -hmm. said anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so once again, it's the kind of thing that happens everywhere. So the question, I guess, is you've teed up the issue that how do we motivate bystanders who see something to say something? And you can look at it at different levels. You know, there's you said there's a societal and ethical obligation to do to to say something if you really mm -hmm. think there's a possible you know chance that this there's terrorism behind mm -hmm. whatever they've seen. Um, but in our country, there's no legal obligation to do so. Correct. And mm -hmm. I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon. No, it's, it's yes. So I, I think mm -hmm. that's probably not mm -hmm. um, the. Uh, uh, that's probably not an outcome we can expect anytime soon. Mm -hmm. There are rewards, you mm -hmm. know, that, hey, if, if you provide information that results in the mm -hmm. foiling of a terrorist plot, then you get a reward. Mm -hmm. That raises the issues that Tips Line had back mm -hmm. after 9-11, and sort of the people think that that's going to create kind of a KGB mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. rat on your mm -hmm. neighbor kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be what would be some of the, the possible ways of incentivizing people? And, the, you know, if you talk about... The area where this threat is greatest, as you said, in labs, mm. in, you know, bio, um, biological concerns in labs, mm. um, you know, your idea that there be a tip line that people call in if they see something. Um, that's great, mm -hmm. um, but can you make it even stronger than that? Can you make it a condition of employment that anybody who works in a place like that, who sees something that could read, mm. what, you, you come up with the, the term, legal terminology mm. that reasonably, a mm. uh, reasonable person would think is concerning, mm -hmm. must um, make a report, and I guess in turn you can make that a, a condition of certification for the lab. I mean, mm. I'm just coming up with ideas, but mm -hmm. this has been a tough nut to crack forever, but especially since 9-11, and do you have any thoughts about it in the body? Yeah, I, th I think I th you raise really good points. I think you have to come at this from a lot of different angles, so you can, and, and, and again, I think Ed Yu is going to address some of this in his comments later this afternoon, because that's what he's been doing uh, in his role with the FBI, is going around to labs, going around to do-it-yourself bio meetings, to iGEM meetings, 
uh, and engaging the bioscience community. But, but it's really about um, instilling a, a culture of responsibility because at the end of the day, you can have a legal obligation that doesn't mean you're going to follow it. All right. It, it, so it really does go, come down to you have a personal responsibility. You are your brother's keeper. That's it. Uh, and, and, and I think most people in the biosciences are very receptive to that. Again, Ed will talk about this. He's had tremendous reception. For, he, he, he talks to packed audiences. People want this. They want th people want to know that they're responsible and they're willing to step up to that. So I really, I, I don't think the, you can, I, don't, I wouldn't do it legally. I would, I would it, it's, it's about having classes at high school levels. So if you have a biology curriculum, there should be an ethics piece of that. If you're dabbling in molecular bio or bacteriology, virology, and that's done at the high school level, certainly in this country and, and in Western Europe and in other places around the world too, that ought to be part of the curriculum. You need to start at, at, a, at a young age in, in instilling in, in individuals that they're, 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 they have the potential to do spectacularly wonderful things for the benef benefit of mankind with biology, but there's a flip side, and they have a personal responsibility there. There's no easy answer to this, but you, you do have to come at this in as many ways as you can at the school level, the, at the private industry level, government level, government, I mean, with the government, you can say every government lab employee will attend, you know, once a year uh, an, a, a program on bioethics. So that you can mandate for government facilities. You can maybe even mandate that for, uh, for, for organizations or institutions, uh, research uh, facilities that receive government funding. But you really want to do this, I think, at the lowest level. You want to start getting kids in school who are, who are playing with biology because if you're touching on something within the labs, you're getting one population that doesn't necessarily get uh, the individual who happens to be uh, an IT person. There's, there's a great picture. Uh, 2008, there was an article in, in the Associated Press. Lady in San Francisco who had put together a beautiful biology lab in her apartment. She was moving genes around. It was completely legit. It was fun for her. She was an, I, she was an IT. She wasn't a bio person. She was an IT. Yeah, sure. And uh, so you see a, a synthetic biology. That's biology and engineering. So you're getting people who aren't hardcore biologists playing in biology and you need this instruction at, at the lowest level possible. Uh, I was about to uh, 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 question somebody else on the panel, but it's a longer discussion. It was you. Oh. You've had experience in criminal law, and is it probably not for now. This is a really interesting discussion. To what to what extent is the criminal law is the criminal law able to hold accountable somebody who knows that a crime is uh, being planned, about to be committed, and doesn't uh, um, notify the police? Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the point that we were just making. I don't believe that. That is criminalized. Yeah. I mean, I think there are countries where they do have such yeah. obligations. But I don't think we do. We, we don't. And, right. and just to play devil's advocate to you, your, your point about how we can have all the laws we want, but unless it's in the culture, we're not going to get people to tell on the, by, you know, the bystander to tell what they've seen. Maybe it's the lawyer in me, but I also think that in the situation that you um, posited, mm -hmm. where it's, it's you know, Bruce Ivan's friend noticing something, that you can have all the culture you want, but there might be a situation where he says, I don't want to tell on my friend. And is there a question? Is, is there a, a, a benefit to having some "quote unquote" legal or administrative requirement that will help that person overcome the loyalty to the friend that they don't want to tell them? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. So again, you come at this from lots of different angles. So and legal is one of them. I just you don't go on. You're not putting all your eggs in the legal basket, obviously. So absolutely, you come at it from different angles. And point well taken with Ivan's. His colleagues did not. I mean, some of the techs who worked for him raised concerns, but not people at his level. All right, so yes, the answer is yes, absolutely yes to, to legal and anything else you can think of. First of all, I would love to have Dr. Fisher, Dr. Gerberding, after you leave, I'd love to have you put some thoughts on paper, short and long-term recommendations in this area of surveillance and detection. You've been, you've been very generous with your time and very, very thoughtful in response to our questions. Just some longer terms, short and, and Obviously, we're not going to take a laundry list uh, to Congress because we're just talking about setting priorities. But from your perspective, what they be? But I want to follow up something particularly you, Dr. Perrudino, because I think it's very interesting. You said it's about time we figure out a way to engage in high-risk research, knowing full well uh, that we'll be – we won't get every time the outcome we, we, that we desire. I mean, I, I get – so if you were going to create a platform with that, would it be a permanent uh, 
entity? Would it be a lab or a series of labs where the joint funding and responsibility was from both the government and the private sector? Uh, I mean, I personally think the notion of you know, the, a little bit of research here and a little bit of, re I mean, parceling out that kind of research to individual pharmaceutical companies may not be as effective as saying, okay, your mission today, tomorrow, and forever in this entity working with us is high risk research across this. Have you thought about what the infrastructure would look like? I, I've thought about it in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, obviously, creating an innovation environment is something that every pharmaceutical company is challenged to figure right. out Absolutely. for their own interests. So, um, I don't think anyone has completely solved the problem. But you know, I like to look at where is the most exciting innovation going on in any sector. Um, you know, is it at Google? You know, where, what are the models that people who are really driving innovation forward use to get the collective ideas and unleash the energy and the creativity of the people they're trying to attract into that area? And one resource that is not conspicuous in this area are the really brightest, youngest scientists coming out with the most fertile and creative mind. So, you know, imagine what it would be like if you took these young, very digitally tech savvy kids who are interested in biology and gave them prizes or created um, hubs where they could really come work with more established scientists but to take on some of these most challenging problems and really engage them at the stage of their career where right now they're starving for NIH funding. And that can be done in partnership with industry, it could be done in lots of models through NIH or whatever, so I don't think there's any one given structural solution, but I think it's the who. Um, we bring to bear on the problem that is the most important part. I, I, I completely agree with that. And I think that one of the challenges now is that we've created a very conservative funding model for basic research in which we reward success. Um, but establishing that success takes a very long time. And, and uh, the age of first award from NIH is getting uh, longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm in that demographic, I find it less objectionable. But um, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of innovation, the idea of creating these safe hubs where people can brainstorm, innovate, and try to approach these challenges of emerging diseases, whether they're intentionally released bio threats or naturally occurring infections, in a way that looks past the one bug, one drug approach and really starts broadening platforms and looking at quick turnaround. We have to create some safe spaces where that research is funded and encouraged and where failure is not penalized by lack of professional development. A lot of fail. We've got about yeah. five minutes left. I wonder if anybody in the story. It's good. Dr. Dr. Libby, I'm sorry. <laughs> Doctor of Jurisprudence. I'm a doctor as much as you are, sir. Yeah. Um, I'll come to you with my ailments. <laughs> Just for the record, my bushes are dying all naturally. <laughs> <laughs> there are some ISIL-inspired deer in my neighborhood. <laughs> seem to be taking uh -huh. care of them. Um, Dr. Gerberding, I want to applaud your comments about the lack of exercising of plans. And my question is, do we have any indication how well, in reality, the system would work? if something presented itself in the absence of such exercising. We require the military to exercise, and they actually learn and do better as they go along. If we're not exercising in this area of national defense, how confident are we, or what do we know about how well we are going to get prompt as prompt as possible. I, I don't want to imply that there is no exercising. There is obviously exercising, largely tabletop exercises. And when we were galvanized around pandemic preparedness, there were um, crawl, walk, run exercises at the federal level, even three-day functional exercises. There was a functional exercise to bring a plane into Miami airport and isolate the people and see how well that would work. We learned a lot from that exercise. Um, so uh, there is exercising going on, but again, is it systemic? Is it really reaching the front line of the problem, which is not going to necessarily be in Washington. It could very well be in uh, Texas hospital. And so we need to have that kind of support and culture at all layers of our preparedness effort. And it's not there. It's, it's absolutely not there. So, we, And I don't think we should kid ourselves that a tabletop exercise is the same thing as really testing our capabilities. Having said that, I think Ebola was an exercise. So w you, the answer to your question is fairly clear. 
this is a really important point that I think we'll want to speak to. Yeah. I just wanted to take the opportunity to echo one of Dr. Gerberdine's observations earlier that there really was um, the beginning of a strong foundation for infectious <coughs> disease um, preparedness, I would say, from the 2001 time frame to Hurricane Katrina. Um, and for a lot of good reasons, we all had to jump on the all hazards bandwagon. Um, but that began to dilute our focus on low probability, high consequence infectious diseases in retrospect. I don't think all of us really appreciated it, you know, in that at that time frame, but I think if, if we think about it in that, that perspective, we <coughs> began to lose focus on really what has become a new norm, and that's the emerging infectious disease that, and the bioterror threat going up. And so I think it really becomes a question are we going to prioritize by our bioterrorism preparedness and infectious disease preparedness as a very focused area, in addition to all the other all hazard preparedness? But it, it, I think that really is the question that we need to come to is, it, is this going to be sufficient? Is this a sufficient, sufficient threat that, that we need to provide that priority and focus on and the resources and the incentives? Uh, necessary for all levels to participate, including government and the non-government sector, and particularly industry. I think uh, you're talking about more than a couple of decades. You're talking about four or five decades of going up and down in terms of yes, building. Yes, absolutely. I mean, try testifying on public health infrastructure <laughs> for Congress. I mean, that's what you're talking about. And um, CDC has had trouble holding on to the money that it distributes to the states because people's eyes glaze over <laughs> them when they talk about the, the funding. Even when you make it disease specific, it just goes on for a while and then they, yeah. and then it's shifted someplace else. It's aggravating. So this is a really important point that, <laughs> I'm still uh, that we should come back to uh, as we think about our recommendations. Uh, so my bias is that, that we ought to separate this out and give it a priority, the combination of the, uh, what I think is an increasing threat of biological attack, but, but the obvious growing I mean, uh, concern about uh, naturally occurring uh, diseases, pandemics, and foodborne illnesses. I mean, I don't know if anybody mentioned it before I arrived, but you know, almost as if uh, sending us a mes message in this morning's paper, you probably saw it. There's uh, an avian flu breakout in Arkansas, in Missouri, I think, and uh, uh, turkeys. And, uh, and that's thought not to have a high probability of moving to people. But then another story, that there, there's a return of the avian flu in China. And that uh, already has apparently killed approximately 100 people and uh, has re represents real danger because everybody's moving around the world. Uh, so uh, these are very real and I think, I think unique, unique problems that we ought to, if we can get the government to focus on them and pull them out of the all hazards uh, system, I think we're going to be a lot better off in the future. Senator, can I just add one thing that, because we're not really representing this point of view, that agriculture terrorism and agriculture right. surveillance and response capability and countermeasures are just as important as um, the human <coughs> pathogen side that we're talking about and with the One Health perspective that the majority of the emerging infections are in fact zoonotic diseases in origin. We really need stronger efforts in the agriculture side and I would feel remiss if I didn't really no, try to make that point. We, the speaker at lunch today is the topic is the human animal uh, interface. I think uh, we should break at this point and we'll reconvene at 11.30. Thanks very much to the three of you. You've been extremely helpful. I want to second uh, Governor Ridge's uh, request to you that you put some ideas on paper. And Dr. Kahn, if you're so inclined, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to everybody. The second panel is on environmental surveillance and detection, a discussion of the technological and policy challenges to early and reliable detection of environmentally dispersed biological and chemical agents. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey, how's the, what's the right pronunciation of your last Rungi. Rungi. You, you got it right at my confirmation hearing, Senator. Yeah, I know, but it's been, it's been so long. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, I had so much staff then. Yeah. <laughs> I know the I know the feeling. They put it right, you know. Um, okay, Dr. Rungi, thanks. Now I'm president of Biolog, former chief medical officer, assistant secretary for health affairs of the Department of Homeland Security, and I add, though it's not here, a principal at the Chertoff Group. Yes, sir. We always like to you know, say a kind word about a former secretary of Homeland Security. Security. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Rungi, uh, please uh, proceed. Thanks to the three of you. Thank you. Um, my remarks are uh, much more general, I think, than my fellow panelists here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, taking a step back and about surveillance and detection as a as pull a unit. For it. You sure. got a good strong voice, but okay, thanks. This one's not working. Oh, no, it sounds like it's like working. It is now. Yeah, okay. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present here, and thanks very much to Dr. George uh, and to Dr. Carlin for asking me to distill ten years of thinking about this almost every day into uh, ten minutes and one page. I did take the liberty of having a front and back to the one page, and I think you have that on your desk. And what I'd like to do uh, in my in the time allotted is to go straight to the recommendations, and then we can fill in the uh, fill in the gaps um, as we go along. Uh, a lot of what I have to say has been said. I understand uh, in the regional meetings, and I actually uh, heard some of it again uh, this morning. But uh, if we go back to the uh, Homeland Security Pres Presidential Directive 10, HSPD 10, which, uh, which lays out a framework for biodefense. Surveillance and detection was contemplated as one element, not separated into environmental detection and uh, biosurveillance. But in fact, just as in other uh, preparedness pillars, uh, surveillance and detection should exist a as one. Um, uh, sadly, uh, due to uh, funding lines, uh, budgets, um, interests of, of uh, different industries and so forth, uh, it has remained as a separate, uh, as a separate uh, interest within what should be the same enterprise. So um, the other thing is that we've had sort of a, a widget first mentality uh, with environmental detection, and that is thinking first about the technology and what the technology can afford rather than the information requirements of decision makers. Uh, I'm actually a pretty strong supporter of environmental detection as well as syndromic surveillance and laboratory surveillance and other, other means of biosurveillance. Uh, but we have not started at the elemental level of the, of the decision maker. At the state level, the local level, the local level in particular, these are the people that are really are the tip of the spear. They have to interpret what's going on in their environment uh, and, and say something, call for help. The federal government is vast but not fast. Uh, and and it, every disaster we've ever had has shown us the value of, of local level decision makers making the right decision and the consequences of them making the wrong decision. So at the state, local, territorial, and tribal level, um, uh, those decision makers' information requirements need to be harvested as well as at the, at the federal level. And that's where we should start. Um, there is a need for very, very quick situational awareness. Uh, even if the information is less than perfect, uh, we, we absolutely have to have the earliest possible warning. Uh, while there is value in the forensic analysis of 40 people dying from cantaloupes uh, because of listeria, uh, it in, is it in fact, it, it does guide how things are done in the future. But for the purposes of the Department of Homeland Security, they need an interventional system, not simply a, a forensic system of, of surveillance. So the earliest possible time uh, is, is, is critical. Um, so, I'm gonna, so getting back to these information requirements, those requirements should be the only drivers of data sources, the technology deployed, and the operational processes around that decision making. I would also encourage us to think more broadly about the definition of sensors and detectors. Uh, sensors can be um, uh, PCR tests that are harvested from a, a biowatch machine, but they can also be farmers, veterinarians, uh, EMS uh, practitioners, health officials, uh, uh, laboratory uh, science folks, um, and others. And you know, through this array of detection, I think we can focus in on the truth with the proper uh, analytic. Uh, algorithms that we develop over time in response to those, for those decision makers information requirements. <clears throat> Something that has been alluded to 
uh, here, and I hope we can revisit this during the question and answer period, is the issue of the governance process uh, around uh, uh, this uh, uh, surveillance and detection issue across uh, the federal agencies as well as the state and local tribal and territorial governments uh, and the end users and sometimes the victims of our actions or lack of action and that's the private sector where 85 percent of the critical infrastructure in this country is controlled by the private sector and the vulnerability uh, built in is, is demands a, a completely integrated approach with the private sector uh, and government and to do this I I'm sad to say that I think there needs to be some forcing function to ensure interagency collaboration at the federal level, the embracing of private sector input, and truly um, what has been referred to uh, um, by the authors of the National Biosurveillance Strategy as an all-of-nation approach. Not an all-of-government approach, but an all-of-nation approach. Uh, because we are so heavily dependent uh, on the private sector, not only for critical infrastructure, but for vaccine production for antibiotic uh, countermeasure uh, production uh, and, and frankly uh, operating health care systems uh, across the nation uh, uh, that actually take care of people. Um, and I want to just close uh, before our, our Q&A period and before my fellow panelists with a, with a little bit of a story. So when, uh, when I was uh, in my job, I frankly was, uh, I had no clue what a chief medical officer for Homeland Security ought to do. I was the first one. We pieced together an Office of Health Affairs by going around and seeing what was going on in, in the department uh, that had anything to do with, with biodefense. And we, we pulled it together under this office with the, with the help of our congressional uh, overseers. <clears throat> um, and one of the first things I, I realized was is that we had 15 planning scenarios. And five of them had to do with, with biological events, uh, although most of them had to do with the effects on biological organisms, people and animals. And I looked to the DOD to try to help us figure out how do we plan around these planning scenarios. This was uh, in December or January of, of 2006, uh, December 2005, 2006 range, and, and we got a detail from NORTHCOM to come in and, and take a look at how we did planning at DHS and how we should be doing planning at DHS. And after two weeks, she walked in and she put this New York phone book down and said, Dr. Rungi, this is your plan for pandemic influenza. And she walked in with something about the size of a half of a legal pad. And she said, this is NATO's plan to defend Europe. And I realized that we didn't have the right planning methodology at that point. <laughs> uh, I would make the case that we still, on the civilian side, do not have the right planning methodology. Uh, and with respect to planning, there is this cycle that is defined in the National Response Framework, and that's planning, equipping, training, and exercising. But it doesn't stop there. The exercise has to come back into the plan. So Dr. Groberding mentioned that, that the Ebola is, uh, event was very much of an exercise, but I, I question whether or not we've actually learned anything from that exercise and whether it has, in fact, gone back into some sort of a plan. Uh, I would challenge the panel to uh, try to identify those plans uh, and and see if they make sense. I, I think you're going to come up empty. Um, and you know, very quickly, a, 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 a second uh, vignette is about governance. Um, back when NORAD was inside Cheyenne Mountain, I made a trip in there and went to the Ops Center and I looked around at at the governance of operations and response. Uh, there were it was an interagency collaboration in the room. Um, and while we were there, a, an event happened. Everyone's phone rang. They picked up, they listened for 15 seconds, and they put it down. And I said, what just happened? And up on a status board, there was a solar flare. And as I began to think about the radar array that we have for intercontinental ballistic missile protection, that's sort of our, our, our biowatch system. But that's not enough. There are folks from three-letter agencies, from the NGA, from FAA, from the National Weather Service, and other all with a contribution to make in this array, their own array of detectors and sensors to making sense of an event. Nobody complained that the telescope that picked up the solar flare might not be, have a high enough definition and might really not be something that they have to worry about. It was an event and they dealt with it. We do not have that same kind of, of either governance or leadership or unity of effort 
on this issue of, of, of biodefense, much less with surveillance and detection. And I think that's what we should shoot for, and I would summarize my recommendations as, you know, let's, let's make ourselves a bio-NORAD. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, as, as we've heard uh, throughout our deliberations, particularly on the questions of surveillance and detection, this is uh, obviously more than a federal government uh, responsibility, and that's why we're so happy to have you here, Dr. Denise Pettit, Assistant uh, Director of the State Laboratory of Public Health. Well, thank you so much. Is this working fine? <laughs> How about this? Good? Okay. You hear him back? Looks like it's affirmative. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you so much for your invitation, and it's with pleasure that I come here to speak with you today to discuss environmental surveillance and detection of biological agents that are of public health concern. Um, the objectives of my talk today are really to describe to you the role that state public health laboratories play in environmental surveillance and detection, to outline the technologies that we've utilized and the existing limitations within the technologies, and also to um, explore the outcomes achieved by conducting this type of environmental surveillance and dete detection. I am currently the Assistant Director at the North Carolina State Laboratory of Public Health, but prior to this position, I directed biological emergency response at Virginia's Division of Consolidated Laboratory Services. And in this capacity, I partnered with several um, agencies to conduct environmental um, surveillance. In 2001, our laboratory in Virginia um, detected the first inhalational ca um, case of anthrax in Virginia. Um, I have also worked with the Department of Homeland Security to conduct environmental um, surveillance in the National Capital Region. I've worked with the United States Postal <coughs> Services and the Department of State to conduct verification and confirmation of signal detection that results from these systems, such as the biodetection system currently employed in the postal facilities. And I've worked with EPA to develop incident-specific sampling plans and participated in full-scale functional exercises. Um, I have been a member of the Laboratory Response Network since its inception in 1999, and this network is composed of local, state, and federal partners, and um, it was founded by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the DOD, FBI, and also the Association of Public Health Laboratories and it was stood up to enhance um, biological emergency response throughout the United States and now has moved into international um, jurisdictions as well. Um, all state public health laboratories are members of this network and as a member of the network we provide training to various um, laboratories throughout our jurisdiction. This includes clinical diagnostic laboratories, military, environmental science laboratories, and also veterinary laboratories within the jurisdiction. Um, we utilize state-of-the-art rapid molecular detection capabilities as well as culture-based characterization for pathogens that are derived from clinical specimens as well as environmental samples and the data generated from the use of these methods is provided to partnering agencies to allow for evidence-based decision making during an incident or during an outbreak of unexpected disease. There are approximately 12 laboratories within this LRN structure that, or state laboratories, that have an advanced reference capability and these uh, laboratories have a more extensive testing menu. They bring on assays very rapidly to address emerging issues such as Ebola. They also conduct laboratory-based surveillance to detect biothreats in the environment and conduct applied research to evaluate, validate, and implement advanced technologies. Um, in my experience with this system, um, and looking at the outcomes we've achieved through implementation of environmental um, surveillance, what I can say is that 
it has helped us to establish strong interagency partnerships at all levels, so at the local, state, and federal level, and also facilitated the robust inter interagency notification protocols that provide situational awareness when a detection occurs. Um, in addition, we have enhanced detection and reporting of naturally occurring disease. So this is what um, you have been referring to as dual use. So to give you a practical example, when we've conducted environmental surveillance, this has often allowed for the detection of Francisella tularensis, an organism that causes um, tularemia. And this organism is naturally occurring in the environment. And so detection of this organism doesn't necessarily mean that an attack has occurred. Um, however, if we take a detection that we feel is um, naturally occurring, we can then use this incident as an opportunity to provide situational awareness to our clinical diagnostic partners. So to accomplish this, we'll send out health alert information, providing just-in-time training for those diagnostic laboratories so that they have a clear understanding of how to rule out and refer organisms that meet the criteria um, that enhance public health concern. Um, these detections have also triggered active epidemiological surveillance for the disease, and this has resulted in the outcome in increasing disease reporting for tularemia. To facilitate a rapid response to a biological attack, the existing system of laboratory-based environmental surveillance um, incorporates three discrete processes. <coughs> this includes sample collection, um, sample analysis, and also reporting of the results that we obtain. Um, currently, in terms of sample collection, we use automated systems, and these automated systems that exist today um, inactivate the majority of organisms in which they collect. And this is a concern because a live agent is needed to provide confirmation and also to fully characterize the organism so we know what types of therapeutics can be employed to treat individuals that have become infected. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> can you give us a, a little more understanding of what, what the actual mechanism is by which the environmental surveillance is, is conducted? It, it, um, de are you meaning what types of samples are collected? No. I mean, what's the, what's the device by which you collect them? Like where, where do you, how do you distribute them, et cetera, et cetera? Um, The collection devices are placed in the environment. They collect air samples over a period of 12 to 24 hours. Um, Detection devices are in postal facilities that um, are canceling first class mail and air is collected from the cancellation point and the air moves through a liquid impinger in that instance. And then there are also environmental samplings that can occur where a team is deployed at a location an outbreak uh, that is thought to be the epicenter of an outbreak and they can manually collect samples. Does that help? Is the post office chosen because of the anthrax experience? Yes. Yeah. And it is put in place to simply detect bacillus anthracis. Yes. And these, I'm sorry, <coughs> and these devices all render the samples inactive by the process of detecting them? Um, in terms of the environmental sampling that occurs for multiple agents, an air filter that um, where it's collected. In that instance, the majority of organisms are inactivated. Bacillus anthracis is a spore former, is a little bit more hardy, and so we're likely to be able to detect a live agent with that type of um, collection for Bacillus anthracis. But There can be. Um, the goal is to process the specimens within 36 hours of collection, initiation. 
so the major drawback in the existing sample collection processes is that end users, those of us that are in the laboratory, are not aware of performance specifications and we don't have information about the validation of these systems so that we can better understand the performance limitations. Um, these specifications are needed to ensure the quality of the sample being collected. And many of my colleagues use the phrase garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a good specimen or sample collection, then the test we're conducting really is not valid. Um, the next process is sample analysis, and here we use molecular-based assays that incorporate reagents that have been provided by the Department of Defense and the LRN network. These assays are extensively validated. We have performance characterization and it's well established. The laboratory has a robust quality assurance program on site that must be maintained. And the, um, so these assays provide a high confidence result. But again, often the in, when we're conducting surveillance, we're just simply looking for a molecular signature and not the presence of a live agent. And presence of a live agent is when we have a true risk. So once we have identified the molecular signature of the organism, this then allows for the um, verification of a biological actionable result in what we call a bar. Um, once we've had this detec detection occur, this initiates our notification protocols and it allows engagement for several partners as Dr. Rungi was explaining. So we can then include the veterinary communities, environmental science communities, and intelligence communities so we can get a broader understanding of what could be happening in the environment. To date, no bars have resulted in the deployment of countermeasures. The results that have been obtained have been attributed to naturally occurring disease, such as tularemia, as I um, previously alluded to. Since the system is designed to detect terrorist activities, these detections can really be considered false positive results. And then the concern is that we've established a system that can lead to complacency. Public health concerns with environmental surveillance for biothreats have existed since the inception of the program, and few enhancements to address the shortcomings have been made over time. In my opinion, the major limitation of the system is that by the time it takes the system to determine that a viable agent has been released, infected individuals will likely be presenting to healthcare facilities and surely this isn't the intended outcome of the system. The reality is that the system places high-level decision makers and public health systems in a no-win situation. Um, in the absence of a terrorist attack, um, an individual may be questioned to determine if mobilization of resources is needed and um, antibiotic prophylaxis um, could place individuals at risk of adverse reactions to the therapeutics. Um, when a bar occurs and it's due to a terrorist attack, if we're complacent with the system, we won't um, mobilize resources to distribu distribute antibiotic therapies. So this is quite challenging for public health. Additionally, routine environmental surveillance as it's conducted today doesn't provide us with the data needed to improve the identification of the, of the population at risk. This is the cornerstone for an effective public health response to allow for timely identification of probable or laboratory confirmed cases to limit morbidity and mortality in the community. Given the existing limitations, developing meaningful risk communications is challenging and um, leads me to question, will the community trust the public health officials and accept treatment if it's offered? Lastly, given the current economic climate where we are um, being asked to optimize our resources, I question the outcomes that we have achieved and are they in worth and are they worth the investment we're making to conduct the surveillance? 
what is the return on our investment. The system associated with routine environmental surveillance isn't perfect, and many argue that something is better than nothing. But I would argue that we have something far more effective in place, an outstanding public health system comprised of astute, forward-thinking physicians and epidemiologists, a laboratory response network that has a strong history of rapid implementation of assays to detect agents of public health concern, and a readily available educational, um, readily available educational materials to inform um, patients and the worried well. Uh, my recommendations to improve our return on investment and to enhance biodefense are to prevent the erosion of critical funding that sustains existing epidemiology and laboratory capability and capacity develop sample collection specifications to facilitate the design of automated collection devices that allow for live agent collection. This will facilitate rapid confirmation and characterization to identify appropriate therapeutics. Consider the reduction in locations of routine environmental surveillance to allow for more event-based surveillance or implementation of environmental surveillance based on intelligence data. And this could enhance public health capacities in all jurisdictions, not just those that are um, testing to, um, for BioWatch purposes. Um, establish and utilize focus groups to better understand public perception and the willingness to abide by public health advisories. My fear is that in the absence of morbidity and mortality that individuals won't seek treatment. Um, I would advocate also for the promotion of research and development of novel technologies to rapidly identify pathogens in patients presenting in healthcare facilities with respiratory illness, explore advanced technologies that would facilitate pathogen discovery, and support the characterization of microbial populations in active surveillance environments. Thank you so much for your Excuse time thanks today. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Just a really quick question. Um, do, do you, from the, to the best of your knowledge, is the system that uh, a biosurveillance detection system in North Carolina typical of what exists in most or all states, or, or is? I would say it is in the majority. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, but some states don't have a, any surveillance, or are not up to where North Carolina is. Um. I would say that all states have a surveillance system. Right. In terms of environmental sa um, surveillance system, conducting environmental sampling yeah. in order to achieve early detection of an attack, um, that is not the normal situation. That's not what we see. Understood. Thanks. Is it Van Giesen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eric Van Giesen is the uh, last witness on this panel, formerly was the Division Chief for Diagnostics and Disease Surveillance at the Defense Threat uh, Reduction Agency, so brings that uh, unique perspective. Now is the Senior Director of Diagnostics and Biosurveillance and Innovation in Global Health and Security Operations. They're busy at uh, MRI Global. Uh, thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much, um, and, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've, I want to give you a little bit of background and also sort of echo Dr. Runke's comments about trying to distill a lifetime or a career's worth of information into a few minutes. So I apologize if I leave out some details. Um, in the past, I've served as a developer of innovative detection systems ranging from medical diagnostics, ground-based detection systems, and even detectors that go on UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. So I have a broad perspective, both from the medical uh, diagnostics perspective, as well as the environmental detection perspective. And so in 2011, um, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency asked me to develop a capability in a new division. Um, we stood up an entirely new division that was focused on merging the diagnostics capacity in the DOD with the biodetection capacity in the DOD under the chemical and biological defense program. So we did this in an isolated pocket of the DOD. Um, and I want to also use that as, an, as a way to illustrate the fact that, 
you know, we've seen great investments of effort and funding to build a biodefense capacity over the, over the past 15 years and beyond. Um, and many of these investments have created pockets of robustness in our biodefense infrastructure. And yet some of the early decisions, even dating back to legislation in the early 1990s, um, left our biodefense capabilities disjointed, uncoupled from other capabilities that could assist and enable our ability to detect early events of biodefense uh, concern. Um, and so working in isolation, um, we've, we've left, we are left now in a situation where we have really parallel efforts going on, but many of them are laudable. And if we could bring them together in more effective ways, we can become more robust in our defense architecture. To summarize some of these biggest challenges that we should face in the future, um, I have two main points. The first point is uh, the environmental sensing component of our biodefense system right now is not adequately linked to our medical electronic health records. This is true in the DOD. This is true on the Homeland side as well. So in other words, when something happens environmentally, as, as Dr. Pettit just brought up, um, we want to be able to link that anomaly to what is going on in the electronic health records. We've spent about a hundred billion dollars or more on something called meaningful use. And meaningful use was designed to essentially electronicize, if you will, um, or digitize our health record. Meaningful use data right now is not directly linked to the data coming from the state public health labs at a national level. It might be linked at a state level, but at a national level, these linkages are not happening. So what happens is environmental anomalies are not digitally linked with our digitized public, um, you know, national electronic health record. And as a result, we can't automatically search anomalies across these two regimes. This is, again, paralleled in the DOD. Um, the second point I want to bring up is that in both Department of Defense and domestic programs, we have decoupled our medical science and technology investments from science and technologies in CBR and defense, chem, bio, rad, nuke, defense. This decoupling continues all the way through to acquisition programs, which end up fielding equipment for the biosurveillance community and detection community that is not necessarily relevant to the medical community and vice versa. And I know that sounds kind of complicated, but let me try to illustrate. What happens is we have DOD programs that have spent billions of dollars fielding medical diagnostic equipment that's designed specifically for detecting biothreat agents, maybe our top 21 list. These devices are not used on an everyday basis. They're used separately, only in times of emergency. Now there is progress being made and in some cases there are efforts being attempted to try to merge these two worlds so that a single device in our DOD medical care facilities is diagnosing both common everyday pathogens and infections as well as diagnosing diseases of concern, emerging infectious diseases or biothreat agents. However, this is not widespread and this is definitely not happening on the Homeland side, except for in LRNs, but not in commercial diagnostic laboratories. So to, to illustrate the, the challenges we face from a, a, a both a environmental surveillance and detection um, as well as a health surveillance perspective, um, I'll give you a few quick, um, a few quick stories to explain this. Um, first, um, it goes back to 2007. Uh, this example was where a colleague of mine in the White House National Security staff um, was dealing with tracking the penetration of melamine into our nation's food supply. As you may recall, animal feed was contaminated um, through a number of sources in China and we were worried that other food sources which might have been contaminated um, would relate to human consumption. Uh, while melamine is not a bioagent threat, it was concerning to my colleague in the White House to learn that there was no way to search our na nation's electronic health records for abnormally high occurrences of kidney failure, which is a key indicator of melamine poisoning. In this situation, we had information from animal surveillance or environmental surveillance, if you will, um, that was telling us that there was a potential health threat to the U.S. population, yet we could not verify this within our existing electronic records or other records. Uh, we were really depending on well-meaning physicians who are very capable, well-meaning state public health lab experts to report pockets of kidney failure events nationwide. There was no way to search this automatically. And in the case of melamine, we knew what we were looking for. We knew that even, um, even when we were under this threat, we knew to look for kidney failure um, you know, anomalies. What if we didn't know in the case of an unknown biothreat, as Dr. Khan brought up earlier, 
if we were dealing with an, uh, you know, an actor who was trying to pro provide us with a threat, a bio threat that we did not have a defense for, did, we didn't know to look for. In this case, and that was in 2007, and currently now, we still do not have a way of detecting aberrations automatically in our state public health lab data, as well as in our data that comes from the electronic medical record. And again, the story is paralleled inside the DOD. If we continue to link, think holistically about the linkage between the medical community and the biodefense and biodetection communities, we ought to think about harnessing this emerging field of point of care diagnostic capabilities. These are emerging ca capabilities, similar to home use diagnostic tests for glucose, things like that, but they're also capabilities that you are starting to use every day in your hospital and your doctor's office when you go in to get a strep test or when you go in to get some very fundamental tests for influenza. But they're becoming much more capable. And I've, I have championed innovation in this field through point of care and home use medical diagnostics through my role in the XPRIZE Foundation. This, this foundation represents a resource. It's a resource of technology that's being developed in the private industry and the private sector, which is pushing for ubiquitous medical diagnostics. Imagine if we had ubiquitous medical diagnostics in the presence of an Ebola threat or other types of endemic diseases that are going on every day. An illustration of how this might have had an impact on a global scale would have been, I'm sorry to do it again, use the Ebola example. Um, in the Ebola example, um, if we had had uh, the ability to uh, use point of care and, and ubiquitous diagnostics capabilities, we might have picked up something that was described in a 2014 CDC paper which showed that Ebola um, was present in the Sierra Leonean population as far back as 2006, the human population that is. Um, in this study, published in 2014 July by CDC Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal, they, were found, they found that out of 300 samples collected in Kenema, Sierra Leone, 8% of these samples were seropositive, which means the patient had been exposed to Ebola, and 4% of them were seropositive for Ebola, um, uh, Marburg. So 8% positive for Ebola, 4% positive for Marburg. This was in 2006, before the outbreak even happened. These were patients coming in, complaining of febrile illness. No diagnostic was available to identify the presence of that disease. This begs the question, what's going on here in the US right now? What diseases are, are being presented? And you can think about Thomas Dunks, Duncan, who was sent home because he was not immediately diagnosed for <coughs> Ebola and potentially exposed many other people to Ebola. Luckily, that didn't happen. So it isn't all bad news. We have the ability to marry environmental mon monitoring and detection and diagnostics. And uh, Dr. Gerbeding brought up the GEIS lab network, specifically the NAMRUs, as an example of a pocket of robustness, as I referred to earlier. In this case, in 2009, the Armed Force Health Surveillance Center and their network of global um, epidemiology and infection surveillance labs um, used a worldwide network of diagnostic labs that weren't part of the DOD infrastructure. They were part of the global community infrastructure, and they had made relationships over the past 60 years through private diagnostic clinics, hospitals, etc. And they distributed point of care diagnostics for flu, influenza. They distri distributed detection systems for influenza in animal populations and in the environment. And they successfully detected the emergence of H1N1 or swine flu in Asia, South America, and other parts of the world very early in those pocket outbreaks so that things could be controlled rapidly. They made an impact. They had an impact on the global spread of that disease, which originally originated in Mexico and actually penetrated the U.S. more than it did anywhere else in the world. So that is, a, that is an example of a pocket of robustness. And why did it work? It was first it worked because of the ability to distribute and have ubiquitous diagnostic and detection capabilities. Secondly, it worked because there was a single communications platform that linked the diagnostic community with the detection community and led to immediate um, you know, interventions that could minimize the spread of this disease. So as we think about an effective biodefense architecture, there are common themes that I think can apply to effective solutions. Uh, number one, affordability. There's a whole talk I could give you on affordability, but let's think about the cost of false alarms and false negatives. In other words, when we miss uh, or we abs accidentally report um, a threat, and also the cost of the actual equipment that we're using. Those things need to be balanced. And in many cases, a very, 
very um, quantitative analysis can be done to decide how much the investment needs to be put into the detection and diagnostic infrastructure versus how much of an investment needs to be put into consequence management. Second is ubiquity. We need these systems everywhere, okay, as much as possible. It doesn't just mean in the environment, and Dr. Rungi brought up a great point. Why are we de decoupling environmental detection from medical diagnostics and medical surveillance? We shouldn't be. Um, and that allows us to then be more ubiquitous by bringing those two worlds together more effectively. We need specificity, we need speed, and we need connectivity. And I brought up the point of connectivity before. Um, so the panel has, has presented me with a set of questions before I got here, and I was going to go through and answer them specifically. Um, I can answer them. Um, I've also submitted my, my writing um, and that is the content of the speech with the answers, but um, please feel free to stop me if you want me to answer them directly or, or otherwise. Let me suggest um, that, that you, you submit the answers in writing because it will allow some time for the uh, questions and answers before we have to break. Your, your testimony has been... Um, Really excellent. Do you want to finish, uh, or, or, or is this a good time for you to stop? I, I leave it up to you. Okay. In other words, uh, it, it, were you going to do anything but answer the questions in the remaining time? Um, yes, I can do that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, no, I'd, I'd say give us the answers in writing, and this will give us 10 or 15 minutes to ask you questions. I, I want to pick up on first on what you said and what Dr. Rungi said, and uh, it almost sounds a little bit like in a smaller scale, more focused. What we confronted after 9/11 that actually led to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, it was it was made complicated, made simple with the statement that um, uh, the, we, the dots weren't on the same board, so we couldn't connect them. But it sounds to me like part of what you're both saying, and to a certain extent, maybe Dr. Pettit, is that uh, there are agencies that ought to be of our government that have information that's quite relevant that ought to be involved in uh, the overall system of surveillance and detection that are not. And Dr. Rungi, why don't you speak a little bit more to that? And uh, are you suggesting that we ought to separate out uh, and create some sort of higher profile um, biodefense um, agency or uh, person? Mr. Chairman, I think, I think we actually have uh, enough institutions yeah. We're not using them properly. Right. Uh, the institution that you just referred to was, was created, in fact, to be a chairman of the board among equals uh, in order to uh, integrate, uh, collaborate, and coordinate. <clears throat> um, what we encountered in, in setting up the, uh, well, first of all, I, I inherited something called the National Biosurveillance Integration System when I became the chief medical officer that had been going on for about a year under the uh, Infrastructure Protection uh, Office. Um, and uh, by, its own, by its name, it was, it was destined to fail at the beginning because it was a, a widget. It was a technology that was being developed without an assessment of what the decision makers actually needed to know. But the idea was exactly spot on, and that is, is that the federal agencies and the private sector have Im information that can be integrated, analyzed, uh, the signal to noise can be sorted, and a common uh, product can be then distributed to the decision makers on an ongoing basis, just like you got your intelligence briefs in the morning. Uh, when there is a need for, when there is an event, then the, the uh, organization can spin up and have a current ops function uh, so that it can then go out and ping and grab information from the other agencies and the private sector. <clears throat> Sadly, the agencies and government have their own uh, jobs to do, and most of them do not include Homeland Security, as was pointed out to us starkly by USDA, who said, Homeland Security is your job. Our job is protecting the agriculture economy of the United States. And I don't want to diminish their, their mission, uh, but they were concerned that if they told us where their sick pigs were, that somehow it would affect import, uh, export uh, 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 prices and the price of pork bellies on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So, so, so our institutions, you know, we, we created them, but we, we have not properly implemented the ability to do this. We have other federal agencies that have exclusive relationships with states and private sector to share data only with them. Um, so I, I would maintain that we have the institutions in place, sir, 
I just think that we need a, a little, uh, we need a sharper focus on, on governance and leadership. So does it require legislation or just uh, um, more uh, aggressive or outreaching leadership? Well, w without meaning to um, uh, be starkly blunt, the, the, the problem is, is, is that uh, uh, there are so many committees of jurisdiction in Congress, uh, all of them overlap ag, um, uh, health, uh, uh, health, education, labor, and pensions, and, and others that, that sometimes are not necessarily working uh, at, on the same purpose. Um, I've long been an advocate, as you have, Senator, for consolidating the oversight of the department in the same way that uh, that DOD's oversight is consolidated, and I think that that really is a huge root of the problem. Well said, Doug. Do you want to add to that at all? Or did you, did you? Just a little, uh, just a little Please. bit. I think it was well stated, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that one of the um, one of the challenges that we have, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of tail uh, onto your last question about legislation. Um, one of the challenges we had that I highlighted in my discussion is the fact that. Um, you know, we've created this entity, especially in the Department of Defense, and to some extent within, um, you know, the other USG components, uh, that focus specifically on biodefense, which I think we need to do. However, um, because of that, these entities don't, they're not funded to the scale that has the buying power to create an industry around them. So in other words, we don't have the buying power of a B-2 stealth bomber program, and therefore we can't influence industry. When industry is looking to build solutions or capabilities for us, um, you know they're they're looking to build uh, something. That, you know, if it's a diagnostics industry, they're building for an 82 billion dollar market per year. The biodefense market in the government is probably five to ten billion per year, roughly, sometimes less. So the the real issue is that um, without combining our resources and driving towards very specific problems, and 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 by distributing our responsibility. Um, you know, and, and diluting the investment. We don't have the ability to affect strong solutions. This also bleeds into the interagency collaboration challenge as well. And I think ENBIS, as, as Dr. Rangi <coughs> inherited and, and spoke to, was a good example of there were many well-meaning government entities, including my own, that were trying to become a part of ENBIS. But we had our own responsibilities that we had to follow because the we built our own pockets of robustness, if you will. So just to give a little more color commentary um, on, on something that Eric said about, about ubiquity and affordability, I mean, um, this array of sensors I was talking about in the abstract is actually very concrete. The, the, the technology of BioWatch, a uh, current BioWatch system has been leapfrogged, not because of the investment of government in, uh, in biological detection, but because of, of the need for people to get well from illnesses. Uh, and the investment of what is it now 18 percent of our GDP on health care has allowed technology to leapfrog uh, collecting a uh, filter out of a vacuum cleaner and taking it uh, to Dr. Pettit's lab um, and having it having it tested not to say that that doesn't still have value uh, but you know there is a ubiquity of, of point of care testing and of the, the recording of those point of care tests um, on an electronic health record uh, that with a touch of a button can be reported anonymously to um, to a, a place where it can be accessed by decision makers. So I just think that, uh, you know, something that Senator uh, Whitehouse this morning said just resonated with me completely, and that is, is the protection of incumbent institutions and technologies. And I, I think this really does require a, a completely fresh look. Dan or Jim? Uh, I have a question. Um, but setting aside uh, medical records as a way of detecting threats, um, what what do we know about um, the history of sensors, be they in post offices, be they stationed elsewhere, uh, and either quantitatively or anecdotally of actually detecting threats that were <coughs> natural or man-made, or um, failing to do so, something slipping through the, the system for lack of its ubiquity. So, I mean, someone brought up the, the, the use of sensors in the post office. Uh, you know, for a period of time, this goes back to Dr. Rungi's point, there was a sensor called the Biological Detection System, which was leveraging a diagnostic company's product known as Cepheid. 
and it was operating in the post office. Actually, the program manager for that project is behind me in the audience. And the, that system um, had a very, I'd say, exemplary performance um, in terms of its specificity and sensitivity. So in other words, its ability to catch um, what was thrown at it as a, as a real target, and, and it was challenged many times in, in, in the post office setting and also outside of it. I personally tested the system early on in its development. And I can say that from that system's perspective, it was its performance was very good at identifying what we were looking for. We had to tell it what to look for, but it was very effective at identifying what we were looking for. And I think the BioWatch program that was brought up earlier, and I think um, and, and other programs have been very effective at and, and, and shown reasonable false alarm rate. In other words, they've been very good at, at detecting what's really there and, 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 and not my, my saying things that weren't there. My question is not so much to capability, it's to the history. So um, what about the non-false alarms? I mean, the, the, my question, I'm trying to get at how many times have, we act, has, have these systems actually um, encountered uh, a threat and made it known to us or missed them? That's what I'm trying to get at. Well, uh, so, the history of this program is quite interesting, and we don't have time to, to go through it right now, but it was basically set up in 32 days in response to uh, some concern that uh, our adversary in Iraq could bring the game to us uh, via a biological incident. Um, and this was the first time that we'd actually started looking for these things in the atmosphere, and guess what? We found them, particularly Francis L. Tularensis, uh, brucella, which causes brucellosis in, in, in cattle and pigs. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you don't see aerosolized or you don't see uh, airborne anthrax, uh, but, you know, gosh, who knew that they were there? And so there was an iterative process that took place when the system was set up to, to actually adjust the thresholds for even, even the conference call. Uh, and, you know, uh, we don't know what we're not measuring. Um, but I, I will tell you that during the, the BioWatch Generation 3 development process, the instruments that were created were so sensitive that they are actually detecting a DNA in the reagent. Uh, and yet, uh, because of the cost and other issues which we won't get into here, the Gen 3 program was, was, uh, was um, let go. Uh, so this is, not, this is an iterative process. And um, uh, what was alluded to by Eric earlier is, is that is that environmental detection in and of itself is completely insufficient in order to mobilize uh, uh, the, um, the stockpile. And I, I put it on my remark here, that, you know, the goal of, of biological detection is to support a conops of response. That's it. It's not about information. And so we need to move the time of detection as far left on the timeline as we can, preferably even before the boom. But, but if, I, if I may, I, and I'm sorry to sorry. be persistent, but yep. I, I feel like you're still talking about capacity. I, I'm trying to find out, have we ever, in the history of this program, found a piece of mail going through a post office that was sent by a bad guy uh, with a, a, a harmful intent? Have we ever, uh, has, has mail gone through post offices and been undetected where there are detectors? I'm trying to find, find out a little bit about the history, not the capacity Sorry. or where we should go. I can't talk about the mail. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm sure or, the people or, behind me are. Or, or any kind of environment. But yes, yeah, so the environment, there are, there are lots and lots and lots of what we're called biowash actionable results. Uh, the action being, uh, let's get on the phone and talk about it. Um, the the ultimate action. Other than just naturally occurring background? <clears throat> so, yeah, okay. you know. If, Can we evaluate that? Do we know if we attribute a detection to its environmental presence of the organism and you do no further characterization, how do you know what the signal right. was attributed to? So this is a point I was making about clinical context, okay? This is where the biosurveillance piece comes in. We have detection, and in and of itself, an environmental detection, which happen all the time, we don't really understand. If it's making people and animals sick, it ought to concern us. If it's not, it shouldn't. So the, the creation, the, pr the provision of this clinical context underneath the, the environmental signal is critical. But that can't happen as long as the institutions are completely separated uh, institutionally and, and by governance. And, and I just wanted to state that that was part of my point, is that these collection devices haven't, been, the performance um, verifications <coughs> haven't been published. We don't have any data to suggest how they're working. Um, I've uh, attended presentations where they've actually looked at aer aerial release of surrogate organisms 
and detections first occur in detectors 50 miles away from the release. So is that giving you good data to make a decision about what populations are at risk? Sorry, we're taking so long to answer your question. There is one example in Korea where there was a detection of a particular agent of concern um, that was part of the DOD defense network. And that's, that is still, I mean, to this day, there, there's no absolute resolution as to why that possibly, you know, why that came up in one of our detectors. And, you know, I can't go into too much detail other than to say that these are, every time an, an event occurs where there's a positive result in one of the environmental sampling systems that we have out in, in you know, deployed, um, we spend a lot of time investigating. And even in the E. coli outbreak, which was a clinical scenario in Germany in 2011, we didn't resolve whether it was intentional or not. I don't think we've ever really resolved whether it was intentional or not. Um, and I think that is part of the, the challenge we have here, is that um, we may be able to detect things. We don't understand the backgrounds completely still, for 13 years later. Um, and as a result, we don't have 100% certainty of what is real and what is natural. And that's what makes us vulnerable. You have somebody, you wanna, do you want to add something? Or? Let me, I apologize. Come on, come on up uh, closer and just identify yourself. Thank you. 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 I apologize to the panel. Um, Ed, you from the FBI Web's Master Trust Directorate. To answer your question, uh, there were two widely publicized cases where the postal uh, detection system picked up the rice and lace letters that were attempted to be sent to the president and to a federal district judge. Um, the system picked that up, and then we investigated and actually prosecuted and convicted two individuals. Okay. Were they lone wolves? Or were they, were they, were they, were they were colorful lone wolves. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, other Tommy, you questions? Yeah, questions I mm. Dr. Pettit, I'm not going to ask you the tough question. That is, Tar Heels or Blue Devils? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to answer that one. She's a Virginian. <laughs> but, but, but tell me, uh, you have a general impression, not only in North Carolina, but in the balance of the, uh, in the states, the relationship between public health and the, the infrastructure that you Testified about and uh, the animal and veterinary community. I mean, how uh, how connected is it? because some of the pathogens and some of the problems are associated with animal health and et cetera. How how well connected uh, is the public health system to that to that potential source of the health problem? And I can certainly speak for the systems that I have been involved with, but not um, the systems comprehensively throughout the United States. <laughs> But in Virginia, their laboratory is a consolidated laboratory, so it brings in data from all populations. It does um, veterinary, environmental, human diagnostic. In North Carolina, they accomplish that integration through One Health and pulling communities together to have One Health discussions. So I think that each public health system in each independent state accomplishes that in different ways. I'm not sure about that, uh, uh, Dr. Ronnie. Let's, uh, having worked in that infrastructure of homeland security, there's all kinds of homeland presidential directives relative to uh, biodetection, biosurveillance, bio this, bio that. Let's start from the get go. Is it HSPD 5? HSPD 5 is a I'm sure I'll just tell you, sir, it was a hotly contested Homeland Security Presidential Directive. And, uh, uh, and for, the, for the people in the audience who aren't HSPD literate, uh, this, uh, this defined the Secretary of Homeland Security as, as basically the, the head of bad stuff. Uh, and, and I needed an HSPD to tell me <laughs> But 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 a chairman among equals, right. uh, so that when the homeland when the principals of the homeland security council get together, obviously the, the president is, is ultimately in charge, uh, but the but the secretary of homeland security um, is responsible for the for the coordination and integration of the various services um, to protect the nation, including its critical infrastructure. Um, I I don't think that every cabinet secretary completely buys off on HSPD five. In fact, I don't know where it is. I don't know if it's been lost in a drawer somewhere. 
uh, or or but it clearly is uh, uh, does not seem to have the at least the same even the weight of debate uh, that it had when it when it was first published I just appreciate the commentary because as we talk about governance and leadership in an epicenter of accountability uh, I think as a panel we need to go back and take a look at that and see whether it's going to be enforced on the hill or some other way so I appreciate your comment either and the other witness care to comment on that but uh, okay very good thank you thanks Tom um, uh, we probably should close but is anybody on the ex official panel that I had a quick question for Dr. Ruggie with the way I enjoyed working with the administration a few years ago. Uh, you had this catchy phrase of the bio NORAD, yeah. and um, I, I thought it was interesting and, and catchy, but I wonder if it's the correct model. So uh, before we go too far down the path of bio NORAD, I'd like you to elaborate on it and explain why that that's the right way of looking at it. So I think about this in terms of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. And uh, we had a uh, extremely elaborate um, infrastructure that spanned 60 years now for uh, for protecting ourselves against uh, nuclear warfare. Um, I think we're all aware uh, of the the threat now of, of biological uh, terrorism. Uh, there's you know it's hard to keep track of all the fatwas, but there's one out there that says uh, that it, it it's desirable to kill 10 million Americans, a half of them children. And without 11 pounds of, of highly enriched uranium or 9 pounds of plutonium, I don't know how you'd do that other than with a biological weapon. So there's the threat. We've been talking a lot about the vulnerability. Uh, uh, you know, the, one of the points that I try to make here, and I, I was uh, buoyed to hear Senator uh, Whitehouse this morning saying that, that all, of our, our, all of our response con-ops were based on looking at these diseases as if they're naturally occurring, as if we have 72 hours. Uh, to respond to aerosolized anthrax, as if we have, uh, you know, seven to ten days to respond to, to aerosolized tularemia, uh, when in fact our own biological weapons program in the 60s showed that that absolutely was not true, uh, and that, you know, the, the, the primates died quickly when they got, as Bill Patrick said, a snootful. So, so not only was our modeling that we started out with this um, kind of behind the curve, um, so I think our, our, you know, in addition to the threat, now I, I see an, an additional vulnerability, uh, and the consequence, frankly, is, is is the complete loss in confidence of government. So, so to me, there is no more important issue than this. There are a lot of other important issues that maybe equal it, but but, but unless we unless we have a NORAD unless we have a NORAD response. Urgency. I agree on the urgency. Okay. I think I think both of those things are required, uh, Tevi. You know, um, I'm going to steal a phrase from Bob Cadillac years ago, who, um, when he was at at the HSC, said, "You know, this whole thing kind of reminds me of telling Mayor Bloomberg at the time, here, here's a, here's a radar system, and let us know if you see any ICBMs coming over uh, Manhattan." Um, so, so we have we've decentralized our biodefense to the point where we actually need those resources very much, uh, but they they can't be. Uh, the only thing that we, that we depend upon. We, we, we really do have to have a national approach as well as a federal approach. That last question to Ken. Thanks. Just a um, quick follow-up for you, Dr. Rungi. You mentioned earlier on that um, you talked about the process of planning, training, equipping, exercising, and then the exercising feeding into the planning, refining the plans. And it's your impression that didn't happen after the Ebola crisis, that the, the lessons from that haven't been fed back into the planning. <coughs> process. Uh, is, do you have a sense of where the fault line is? Why, why that isn't happening? Well, I'm not on the inside anymore, but I can tell you that uh, the, the, the interagency process that we've created with, with uh, HHS and USDA and EPA and DOD around planning guidance for aerosolized anthrax, uh, it, it, it died, uh, or it got stalled, I should say, uh, because um, frankly, uh, there was a disagreement at levels higher than me about what the planning methodology should be and what we should call it, because the DOD system that we were using was thought not to be uh, uh, acceptable to civilian agencies, that, that they don't like to speak DOD. Uh, and so the planning guidance that was created never emerged into a full-scale operational plan 
through the interagency. You know, so we, as a result, we have one plan, as far as I know, one plan of those 15 planning scenarios, and it's pandemic. And, you know, President Bush said, he, he, he told all of us, he said, I'm going to give a speech on November the 1st on pandemic, and you guys better be ready. And all of a sudden, you know, in addition to being five days after Katrina hit, all of a sudden now, you know, Vanderwagen and, I mean, you know, a lot of people in the room uh, put our, our absolutely uh, resources to the front because the president said so. And as a result, we, you know, however flawed or however great they are, we have a full system of interagency pandemic planning, but we kind of stopped when it got to intentional bioterrorism. Uh, thanks to the three of you. Uh, some have already given us papers, others will. Uh, that'll be very helpful to us. You, you've been extremely constructive. Thanks for all your work uh, in this area. We're going to now move to lunch without a break. Uh, Asha and Ellen, tell us how we do this. Uh, thanks to everybody. Dr. William Parrish is the Executive Vice President for Health and Policy at the Eagle Health Alliance. I don't know if you all get these uh, bios, but it, um, they're a really uh, impressive bio. It's just about every, as everybody knows where it's today. So this is about the human animal interface, as I was saying before. If you think about it, just, just open the paper today and you see these um, two avian flu stories. subset of those 1,400 diseases and three-fourths are emerging, um, or 
two-thirds are, are these emerging diseases. And these are the ones that tend to freak people out. And as we heard this morning, uh, part of the fact is, uh, let's say SARS only killed 700 people. I hate to make that sound trite. Um, but it did result in about $50 billion in economic losses because it shut down global trade. So our fear, our human response, actually sometimes makes the disease much worse. And, um, and our inability to get ahead of those and reduce them. Um, so once again, these biological threats have huge impacts that are independent of the number of people that get sick. And they're not going away. In the last 30 or 40 years, the number keeps increasing. So we expect a new emerging infectious disease now about every probably eight months. Um, and that is confounding this ability also to detect uh, what's intentional versus what's natural. So I think the, the story is getting more complicated, not simpler in that fact. And I think we have to come together and deal with these in a kind of a unified approach. We, the organization I work for, EcoHealth Alliance, we have, um, we're in the field, but we also have, as Dr. Gerberding was talking about earlier, we hire a lot of really smart 20-year-olds that like to play on computers and really push us to think about things very differently. And they do a lot of analytics, and one thing we've done is created this hot spots of where emerging diseases occur in the world. The world is not all equal. Some places in the world are much more prone to emergence of infectious diseases than other places. We've never really done this for the United States. We've done it for the whole world, um, and the U.S. comes out on that. But I think it's interesting that at a national level, we've never taken a systematic approach to say where's the, where are the highest risk. This is a complicated analytical process, but it's all doable. And once you do that, once you identify the factors, we know it relates to the diversity of wildlife, population changes, land use change, they all affect disease emergence. But it comes, becomes very predictable. I know a lot of people don't like that idea that we can predict the emergence of disease, um, but the truth is we can. It's not as sophisticated as weather forecasting, but we know when certain conditions come together, we get snow, and when other conditions come together, we get rain. And the same actually works for emerging infectious diseases. We know the things that drive them and what conditions prevail. I can't tell you what day of the week they're going to occur. That's the problem. We don't know if it's this year or next year, and that really limits our ability. But we kind of know where. We can do some nice work with that. Um, we did a global vulnerability index. I won't go into the math on that. Um, but we can tell you which airports in the world are most at risk of an emerging disease arriving at an airport. And then we base this on IATA travel data, so you can get passenger data, and you can calculate where, which, what are, where should we, which airports should have the highest level of preparedness, and which ones are much lower risk. Um, coming from. So we know that flights from southern China and northern parts of India, there's a higher risk of disease emergence, and you calculate the number of people traveling and what airports they go to, and they tend to land at JFK and at Dulles and in Houston, and they don't tend to land first in Des Moines, Iowa. And then you can actually calculate a percentage risk. It's, um, there's never zero risk, of course. But it's much higher, it's relative, so much, some places are much more likely to do that. Uh, we did that for Ebola back in August, so we could tell you which countries, and we actually went to state levels of airports were most likely in the U.S. for arrival of people with Ebola coming from Nigeria, Guinea, Sierra Leone. Um, we did this in August, and it turned out to be actually pretty accurate. We shared it across the U.S. government with uh, DOD and CDC and DHS and some groups were very appreciative. Others said, oh, don't worry, we have this under control. Um, and that was before we had the cases in Houston. Um, but Texas was one of the red, one of the four red spots for the US, um, as was Dulles um, and JFK. Makes perfect sense. Um, we can lay this on other businesses. This is extractive industries where diseases, so with mining, gold mining, forestry, coal mining, you know, where are those operations in, in relationship to where disease emerges? So what are the operational things those companies need to do to reduce the chance of a human getting affected and then traveling back to the U.S.? Because a lot of these companies are international companies. So there's a lot of things you can do um, with a kind of strong analytical approach. Um, we're doing this now for 
Defense Department, this is uh, some machine learning and uh, language characterization that just pulls information off the web and gives a probability of a diagnosis for a disease before you, a sample ever gets to a laboratory, just from the conditions that are described. So you read an article in the newspaper, this will pick it up off the web, and it will give kind of the likelihood based on the descriptions of syndrome. So um, this is being um, developed for the Defense Department, for DITRA, actually, uh, Dr. Van Cleason's group, um, but eventually going to be shared with the, the general public. Um, and we, most of our work, we do very little work that's classified. We, we feel that the more information we can share, the better. This is another DOD project looking at Rift Valley Fever. Rift Valley Fever is a hemorrhagic disease like Ebola, but it's transmitted by mosquitoes. It's common in Africa. It's uh, moved with livestock shipments into Saudi Arabia, the Middle East. It's found in, um, in Madagascar. It causes huge losses when you have outbreaks. Um, like all the, goat, all the sheep, most of the cattle will cause abortion, so farmers will lose their whole calf crop for the year, and then people start getting infected. Um, so it's, it's kind of a devastating disease, but it's rare events. Um, it's typically been thought to be weather-related, but the weather models in South Africa don't work uh, very well, predictions. Uh, so we have a large kind of One Health project where we're looking at domestic animals, wildlife, humans, vegetation, climate, and then training the South Africans to really adopt these models and do it themselves so we don't have to wait for disease to get so bad and then somebody bring it to the United States. Um, and I think it's a, you know, I, I see DOD kind of taking a real leadership with the global health security agenda and also with uh, the One Health agenda, which is bringing these things together so we don't have to do it repeatedly with different sectors of government. So, you know, let's just do this together one time, get everybody working together. Uh, it's a huge, huge study site now. Everybody in South Africa is joining in, actually not even asking for money. There are very, a lot of local excitement, so the National Weather Service is coming in and setting up weather stations. The soil scientists from the universities are coming in. So it's kind of exciting to watch that and to build this kind of big partnership there. And even the Defense Department of South Africa is engaged in that too. So it's a really kind of thing. And we also now, they have a BSL-4 labs there that we have complete access to and they let us know everything they're doing and we get to information about what their capabilities are but this is a real partnership so it's no longer like some secret they have secrets we have secrets let's let's do this together and they become part of this global network of information um, I want to talk a little about MERS this is a coronavirus like SARS and this is a last year before Ebola um, WHO declared that it was the biggest <coughs> infectious disease threat, uh, current pandemic threat to the world. Um, and then a few months later, Ebola emerged, and then we've all forgotten about MERS. It's no longer important, because we can only really deal with one disease at a time, apparently. Um, so everybody stopped working on the MERS vaccine, and then we started pushing for the Ebola vaccine. And that's, clearly that's come up this morning, you know, one bug, one drug, and there's an issue there. Um, camels are huge, and even in the U.S., there's a quite a little camel dairy industry um, that's around on the West Coast and on the East Coast. Apparently, camel milk is thought by some people to tr cure autism. Um, it might be the same people that think that measles vaccine causes autism, and there's probably some relationship in these in the stakeholder groups. Um, but they're here. Um, but camels are traded around. Um, but when we and they're used for just like in the equine industry, they're pets, they're shows, they're racing animals, but they're also used for meat and dairy. So it's a big part of the culture in the Middle East and the Horn of Africa. Um, in most, of you go to a slaughterhouse in the Middle East or Northern Africa. There's no really biosafety or biosecurity. Workers don't wear masks. They don't wear gloves. And it's really so the opportunity for zoonotic disease emergence is pretty bold. Um, and then on the wildlife side, you know, we talked to the public health people in Saudi Arabia in the midst of this and said, well, have you checked bats? Because in Mexico, we found similar viruses, coronaviruses and bats. In Thailand, we found it. In China, we found it. And I'll show you those. those. And generally, in the Middle East, people said, well, we don't have any bats, um, which is impossible because they're globally distributed. And they have about 50 species of bats. And this is in somebody's living room. They're actually up in the roof. And they didn't realize they had bats because they're small, and if you don't look for bats, you don't know. So that opportunity, when we actually started testing,
testing them, we found the virus in bats. Now we don't know the, yet the relationship, but we, you know, most of these emerging diseases have a wildlife component, and we really have to bring in the wildlife sector. In our case here, it's U.S. Fish and Wildlife, it's uh, USGS. There's some really smart, knowledgeable people that are usually left out of the table when we're talking about disease and health. So as we're thinking about bringing the groups together in the U.S., we want the wildlife people there, since most of that's the background disease is in wildlife and it exists. So we're talking about tularemia, anthrax, those are all kind of linked either with wildlife or livestock. The traditional approach when we map out the where diseases are, we just do it historically. So we'll say, where in the United States has this disease occurred? And we do a little map and say, okay, that's where we need to be worried. That's not very proactively thinking. There's no forethought there. If we map out MERS, we'll go like, well, this is where it's been detected in camels, and here it is in people, so this is where we should worry. But the ecological approach, what we would do is say, well, where are camels and where are bats in the world? And those become kind of the hot spots. Let's think, just because no one's found it, it's probably because no one has looked. So we do that here. We talked today about surveillance coming and going. Much of the world, there is very little detection and surveillance, so we're just flying blind into most of these places. So I think we have to have a broader understanding of the kind of the natural history of infectious diseases and their relationship uh, to do that. Bats get a really bad rap because as we keep looking more, we find out they have more diseases. So it's uh, rabies and we had SARS. We've now found SARS in it. I'll show you that. We've got a new influenza A from bats now. Um, and it makes sense. There's 1,200 species of bats. Um, and we're just one species of mammal humans. And why wouldn't they have lots of viruses? I mean, each species has their own viruses. So now there's 1,200 species, so there's probably thousands. In fact, we've calculated in mammals, um, there's probably about 340,000 viruses that we have yet to name circulating in wildlife around the world. I don't know what we do with that. But it's actually, if you figure it's about $1,000 to find a virus, uh, we calculated it out, it would only be a 2 or $3 billion to detect every virus circulating in the wild and have that in the library. So if some hospital sequences a new virus, we could say exactly where it came from. Over 10 years, they are only talking you know, millions of dollars every year. It really breaks down pretty interesting. It would probably take 10 or 20 years to do it. This is, we thought SARS came from civets. Did anybody see the movie Contagion? Oh, poor Gwyneth. I mean, she died early in that movie. It was very sad. Um, but the end of the movie was about how they were clearing forests and the bats got moved and they flew over to a pig farm and they contaminated the pigs and the pigs went to the restaurant and the chef shook hands with poor Gwyneth and she got infected and she came back to the U.S to the Midwest and spread the disease. It's a very easy scenario. We saw it with Ebola. Somebody came back and they started, you know, potential to spread that disease. Um, we're finding that same virus now in uh, many different bats in China and Vietnam. So that opportunity is much wider than we thought it was before. We thought it had to do with the civet cat, um, but it's really a bat virus and it's pretty widely distributed um, in China. So you know, we're working with the Chinese on that, and this is kind of, it was just published in Nature last year. Once again, if we take that and say, where are the hot spots for bat viral diseases, we actually know where in the world we need to be looking. We don't have to go to Canada to really do this kind of work. We need to go to Africa, we need to go to Asia. Um, so we can focus our money, we can invest our money wisely, and I'm gonna talk about an AID program that's doing that now. Um, this came out in National Geographic. This is really the story of uh, zoonotic disease emergence from the wild. Uh, this is a friend that's in Gabon that's a hunter that also helps us on projects. Um, and Ebola has been a great example of this, and I, I wanted to bring it up this morning about the role of civil society is not just uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the role of civil society in health is, is really broad. 
So I kind of mentioned ecologists being involved. When we studied avian influenza, with your support, we had ornithologists, all bird watchers, bird watchers around the world looking for birds. We can invite my friend Tom McGinn, who's from Homeland Security, Dr. McGinn, who says, oh, let's include the hunters. You know, if you want to know about avian influenza, ask duck hunters to collect samples. We don't have to pay for everything ourselves. It doesn't all have to be government. Civil society can really participate. And as some people are saying now, can we please put the public back into public health? That's kind of an interesting thought. So it's not just, you know, experts controlling public health. Let's engage the public. Um, let's engage civil society. <coughs> this guy, and we have a lot of pygmies now, We've actually trained pygmies that used to be the victims of Ebola. They would get it from finding dead animals. Now we have pygmies who are actually illiterate, um, as I love the term Dr. Wang used, uh, the tip of the spear. It's very fitting for the pygmies, because they go out there in spear hunt. Um, and they have become the surveillance, the front line of surveillance, and they don't ask for any money. So they pick up on Ebola outbreaks, and I'll show you some of those pictures. Um, because they're out hunting bushmeat. And bushmeat is really the source for some of these diseases, like Ebola comes from eating wildlife, either bats or apes. It's huge. It's about a billion kilograms a year of bushmeat's consumed in Africa, Central Africa, a billion kilograms a year. So we're talking about low, low probabilities, yes. But if you bought a billion lottery tickets, you'd probably win. And that's what the viruses are doing. So they're in a billion kilograms of bushmeat. It only has to be one piece, bushmeat. and it gets into humans. What's the definition of bushmeat? Ah, thank you. Um, I'm trying to convince people just to start calling it meat from wild animals. But that upsets a lot of hunters in the US, cause, and for good reason. But all um, wild animals don't carry the same diseases, and I'll show you a little bit why. So deer hunting is really safe. Um, but in Africa, they call it bush meat um, because it's the meat they get from the bush, yeah. from the wild. This is our typical response to Ebola. So this is a picture, of course, from West Africa. This is what we were able to learn in Central Africa, that we see it in wildlife. You see wildlife dying often. And if you ask the hunters, like the pygmies, to tell you when they find dead animals instead of eating them, don't have Ebola outbreaks anymore. So this is in Congo, the Republic, Republic of Congo. We have a great example this year of early detection once you really engage communities. So it's about education and outreach. This was funded by the U.S. government too. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, why don't you teach people um, this? And for $30,000, we trained everybody in northern Congo not to touch a sick or dead animal. We never had an Ebola outbreak ever since, even though the virus is there. And it's engaging them, empowering them. Like I said, we don't have to pay the hunters or pygmies to do this. They are so proud that they have a role in protecting their village from getting sick. They just do it for free. It's just raise their stature. So I think we have some creative ways to engage civil society. This don't always need a high-tech solution. They don't need a bio-watch sensor because they're out in the forest every day and they have eyes and they have ears. And um, So some things are simple to do. Sometimes we need... Sometimes we need great technology, sometimes we need some simple things. This is going on every day. This is our bats for sale in a market in Indonesia. And it's about, they go through, they told me about 3,000 pounds a week they sell of bats for human food. Yeah, and um, I don't know if I should show this video. Are oh, any of you still eating lunch? Yes, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to show this video. This is me walking around the market, but these are dogs for sale. And then across... We have strong stomachs. Yeah? Let's see if we can make it work. I don't know. Can somebody push the video thing? I'm just, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not... Uh, I'm sorry, I, can't, I can't click the button. But as you walk around, they're selling bats, there's pigs, there's dogs, there's chickens all for sale in this market, and they're just chopping them up, and people are in flip-flops, and there's just blood everywhere, and there's 10,000 people come to this market every day, and it's wide scale, and this is typical in Asia. And then we're surprised that we have a disease emerge, like SARS or Ebola, when this is going on every day, and millions of people
people are flying to the United States every day from Asia after they're been out or with these people. Um, so that potential, we'd have to really think seriously about what can come in, and this is unintentional, but it, um, if we're prepared for the unintentional, I think we can also be better prepared for the intentional. And we can use this every day, as people say, if you don't practice every day, running this kind of diagnostics, this kind of thinking, linking to the emergency room, this is a great way to keep everybody prepared. There, I think society is changing too. In Indonesia and in China, people like this more than they like bats. Uh, so some of the problems will go away. So, so we have, uh, this is working in our favor. Thank goodness, now they might have more heart disease, but you know, that's a different, a different panel has to deal with that. Um, but also the pet trade is huge. We import about 250 million wild animal wildlife into the U.S. every year for the pet market. Huge numbers. So we've started some kind of public campaigns. You might have seen this at Reagan National or at Dulles. This is in some of the airports around the U.S. because um, they, um, they've offered free space. Just to try and engage the public once again and say, don't buy these animals. These are not good pets. Monkey pops came to the U.S. because of the pet rodent trade from Africa. It cost tens of millions of dollars to clean that up after the fact. And the people that it's, it's completely legal to import those, so there's no penalty for that. There's no risk for the importer. Society, the government, bears all the risk when those disease outbreaks occur, and we have to pay the price through our tax dollars for that. We have a little program, once again, the kids at the office, I shouldn't call them kids, that wasn't very nice, but <laughs> the younger people in the office um, said, well, why don't we do an app on the iPhone and help people make good decisions? So this has kind of healthy choices on pets, and people can use this on their phone when they go to the pet store, it says, don't buy a Gambian pouch rat, buy a hamster. You know, and you'll be happier and safer. Um, so some simple things to change consumer demand. It's sort of, it's the whole industry is driven by consumers. It's not driven by bad guys overseas. It's driven by uninformed people in this country. So there's some things we can do. And then I just want to finish up here. We need to finish up, don't we? Yeah, it's timely. Um, with this program, with the USAID program. So this is the emerging pandemic threats. USAID has really stepped in boldly um, as they name this program from Star Trek and um, to preempt at their source emerging zoonotic diseases. And we have lots and lots of partners on this. There's actually hundreds of groups involved. It's a hundred, now it's a hundred million dollar program. This project is working in probably 25, 30 countries. And the goal, as uh, Dr. Rungi was saying, is to move this curve, this epidemiological curve. Instead of waiting till people are dying, can we start picking up in animals or in wildlife and reduce that? And the benefit, I published this in The Lancet, these control benefits are the savings by reducing human impact. And that turns into dollars and it turns into lives. So the further left we can pick up and detect things, the more lives we save, the more money we save. And it's really, it's actually doable. We have great examples. Um, we talked a little about targeting surveillance. We kind of see that in looking at the relationship between the pathogen and the host and the environment. And there's places and there's behaviors that are just more risky than other things. And we know where those are. We can actually put those on a map and direct the funding to best stop diseases at their source. And I mentioned before, we know which species are more dangerous based on history and what we've been finding. It's uh, primates and bats and rodents are the most common source of all these infectious diseases. That's why I said don't have to worry so much about deer and ducks, uh, unless you're worried about influenza and ducks, it's a different story, but generally it's safe. People are not, American hunters are not getting emerging infectious diseases from what we have in North America. It's really not an issue. It's an issue in some of these developing countries with that. Land use change is a big driver. This is a palm oil plantation. When you change this ecosystem, diseases emerge. And it's like Pandora's box. And once you open the box, it's really hard to get diseases back in that box. Once they start spreading around the world with global trade or with airplane traffic. So we know we have to work upstream. Um, so we can map out in a country where to work. We've been building laboratory capacity in other countries. I, interestingly enough, not so 
so much here, uh, but developed capacity in about 18, 20 developing countries for some very simple techniques to detect any pathogen, not one disease at a time, but all viral infections simultaneously. So they can pick those up using old-fashioned PCR. It's really inexpensive for about $5,000 and some training. We can get labs set up. We've done 27 labs overseas. We teach them how to collect samples. We have tens of thousands of samples, how to maintain biosecurity, how to maintain bio, um, cold chain, how to protect themselves, how to get the samples in, how to test them. We have discovered 900 new viruses that were never described before. Before this project started, in the history of humankind, we only knew there were 540 viruses in mammals. And we've more than doubled that number in five years just by looking. So there's a big world out there of interesting viruses uh, that any of those, or many of those, could become pandemic. All the data shared publicly, we've talked today about um, information sharing and how difficult that is. And when we talk to the government of Malaysia and the government of Indonesia and say, you get to participate in this project, but all the data goes public. There's no secrets. Um, and they go, no, we don't want to do that. I said, well, Malaysia's doing it. And we show them the screen. They go like, oh, well, if they're doing it, we have to do it too. That's very embarrassing that we're not there because they're doing So we use some kind of interesting peer pressure. We're talking about incentives for information sharing. We have to kind of be creative between them. So they all kind of like that no one wants to be left out. Some are now the Lao government says, can we name the viruses with Lao in it? Because we really want to get some credit for doing this work. So it's kind of funny how, you know, different people <laughs> see it. Um, but it's fascinating, and this is public and anybody can have this. On the downside, as we were saying earlier, um, anybody can reverse engineer a virus once they get the gene sequence. Um, so it's an opportunity to, for us to know what's around the world and who's doing what um, at the same time. There's always risk that somebody can take one of those viruses and re-engineer it in their garage. The truth is, if they really want to do that, they probably can just do it anyway. So our stance has been the more public we get all these countries to be, the better we'll know about what their capabilities are and what they're doing, and we can encourage them and partner. We do a lot of outbreak response during the years, during this program, including Ebola most recently. Um, and moving forward now, USAID has refunded the program um, for, its, I think now as of yesterday, with the West African countries and Ebola, it's about 28 countries. Um, and, and USAID is the major funder? Yes, for this. And it all started here, Senator. In 2005, I got asked, I think I'm the only veterinarian who's ever asked to write for foreign affairs, and your office picked it up. There was a young medical doctor in your office, Wilson Wang, and you told him to call me and brought me down to the office, and we discussed this issue about human-animal link, and you pushed through the legislation um, that started the Global Avian Influenza Network for wild birds that turned into this USAID pandemic threats program. Makes me feel wonderful. You should. I didn't so know that there was, I remember that Wilson was wonderful. I've lost touch, but he's kept, have you kept in touch with him? I, I have because he is, was the International, the Emergent, International Emergency Corps, one of the yeah, groups that's I doing know. Ebola response. So he's been going back and forth every other month. He's, so he was he's, very smart and very enterprising. And good, good. So he really educated me. So anyway, that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and your time. Uh, tell us what the um, Eco Health Alliance is. What, what kind of entity is it? We, uh, we operate as a as a nonprofit, we're based in New York City, right. um, and we kind of blend ecology and health. So that's the, that's the kind of work we do. Um, and the alliance part is that all our programs are implemented internationally by local partners. So we don't, we're not top heavy. We don't pay a lot of money in staff. We really push out and have engaged partners in every country. Some of those partners are governments. Uh, some of the partners overseas are universities. Some. A few are other NGOs, so it's mostly the universities or, or direct government relations. So, uh, and you're funded mostly by foundations or government? Or? Um, currently, traditionally, a lot of the funding came from NIH and NSF because of the 
the ecology side, um, and then more in infectious diseases, and then more recently um, USAID and Defense Department. Uh, so it's a, a fair amount of federal money, but from different pockets, and we try and, and bring them together. In private industry, we do some fairly good good support from private industry. It's really noteworthy, and we've heard it today, what an increasingly important and apparently constructive role the Department of Defense is playing in this. So, they don't I like to talk about it very much. We don't talk about it very much. Maybe they don't either, right? I don't think so. They don't think so. <laughs> but it's, uh, now part of it is, um, relatively speaking, that's where a lot of money is. So, but obviously this all has uh, very significant implications for security. Um, so they're doing the right thing. I'm glad to hear about it. So it sounds to me that in this case, um, with the area of zoonotic based diseases, that um, they're through what you're doing, through the PREDICT program, there is now taking shape a response that's um, really effective. In other words, in some of the other areas we were talking about today, uh, there's some things going on, but there's a, a lot more that has to be done. Not, am I right? Or are right. you just more, uh, are you have you convinced me to be more optimistic? Than I no, I think um, in some places some good work is being done. I think we should look at it more as a model. Yeah. Um, it's so not at the scale right. that we need okay, um, gotcha. to protect ourselves or the world. But it's, we're testing a lot of things, you know, a lot of these are kind of feasibilities and trials. Um, and I think, you know, we make some things don't work very well, and then other things seem to work really well. So I think there's some lessons learned. I mean, it would be really, I always call it fun. We kind of talk about how fun it is. Um, but it would be probably worthwhile to try some of the more of this in the U.S. and, and see. Know, how to engage the private sector and civil society and, and move some of that. We were at uh, JFK, we used to go with, um, we had a little project looking at, at the mail sort facility at JFK, three hours a month, just for three hours a month, we'd go with CDC and open every package and take samples and look for what viruses are coming in, bushmeat, wildlife, that's being smuggled in. It's all illegal. And, and you found it. Uh, in three hours, you get at least 100, 150 packages have animals in them going through the mail to all parts of the U.S. We had a box of bats going to um, to um, to Iowa. There's somebody who's one of the bats. I mean, it's just you just open this stuff up, and it's just you know, this blood runs out. You know, they smoke it on the outside when you cut into it. It's, it's juicy on the inside. It's crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside, and there's blood pours out, and it's coming through the mail every day into the United States, and the CDC used to have more staffing to deal with that, and USDA and Fish and Wildlife, but those, no, no one no, thinks so of it that seriously. Oh yeah, happen. every day. Oh yeah. What, what about if, if um, what do you expect the people at JFK or Dulles to do, that, that is the people run the airports in response to the uh, graphic that you put up before about the number of people coming from problematic areas through there? Um, Boston and Logan got very upset because they thought it was bad PR for their airport. Um, the others, they were <laughs> like, oh, not sure what to do. I think they kind of, it's funny, I think in human health, um, speaking as a veterinarian, in human health we tend to look to the um, health experts to tell us what to do. In veterinary medicine, if you're a farmer, you don't wait around and your cows or your sheep are dying. You don't wait around to be told what the government to tell you what to do. I mean, you're like on top of that. It's a different, I think that we have a different, really, the way we think about health is different. So I think with some of these, I go like, ah, somebody else should deal with that. And um, that's why I said we have to have a much broader engagement in biodefense. I think it's, you know, everybody, all hands on deck kind of approach to that. And if everybody can do something. We could go train the baggage handlers and the workers at JFK, you talk to them, they said no one ever told us any of this. Sure, they did. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Jim. <clears throat> are the standards for, for how these meat products, for instance, are handled and transported and so forth, is, is that become the subject of treaties? Trade agreements, I should say? Yes, there are. So there's the... Are we doing 
TP now. Malaysia's in. So come, sorry. Just yeah, if I understand, there's the phytosanitary regulations that are enforced by the World Trade Organization. So the plant ones are done out of Rome. The OIE, the group I work with, is the World Animal Health. They set the regulations for the animal products and animals. Um, and then every country has their USDA is, you know, when it comes to livestock imports, I mean, USDA is all over that. Um, when it gets to wildlife, they kind of say, I'm not sure that's in our court. You know, so like an awkward thing that falls between the cracks. And Fish and Wildlife says, well, we're not the health people. We're the wildlife people. And USDA says, well, we're the livestock people. Um, so there's a bit of gap, and that's what we've been talking about for quite some time. Tom? Cool. Um, Dr. Gerberty. I, I'm sorry to jump in here. That was just fabulous. I, I just wanted to try to make one point about There are also foundational questions about, for example, bats, who are the most important reservoir for most of these human diseases. There really isn't a funding resource within our government that concentrates on the reservoir. You know, NIH might study the pathogen or the countermeasure, but nobody's really understanding why are bats so good at harboring these horrible human viruses, particularly single-stranded RNA viruses. Bats don't get cancer. They, they have very low risk of tumor genesis. There are a lot of really important basic biologic characteristics of bats, and there's no real, you know, robust mechanism for understanding them as a source. So it, it's important that we grapple with that kind of root cause. So that's a matter of funding <laughs> research. I think so. Some agree. Yeah. Where, where does zoonotic research? Well, CDC has a, a division of vector-borne and zoonotic diseases in uh -huh. Hounds, Colorado, so they, I'm right. sure, would love to do this, but it's a combination of what you're doing with things that are upstream from the field research perspective. And NIH has taken certainly more interest in it. But it's just as it was described this morning, you know, that funding comes and goes depending on yeah. the last big outbreak. And we're always right. ch chasing the last disease and the last outbreak. We're not being aggressively forward yeah. thinking on this or what we need to do. So we'll chase flu for a few years and then we stop. And at CDC under Dr. Gerberding, I mean, they had 600 people kind of centered around this one health concept. And then she left and things changed and now they have one person, you know, two people. So it's just, um, and it's unfortunate that the winds kind of change this kind of roller coaster of whether it's surveillance or whether it's with this disease, the disease du jour, was it chronic disease or is it infectious disease? And, so, and, uh, and maybe the uh, the news and the public burns out on it, everybody gets the tired of it, right? The news is part of it. I don't, yeah. I don't like to br uh, blame everything on the media <laughs> and, and they don't but there is a way in which the news today focuses on a problem. I mean, it could be, you know, a, mur a murder case somewhere. Or, uh, but then when Ebola went, uh, they were totally all over it for days and days. And it, it raised a level of fear here that I came to understand was way beyond uh, the real risk involved. But people were terrified that it was you know, coming to the, their neighborhood. So Did your research extensive enough that you would ever be comfortable submitting a list of, uh, uh, of a virus carrying foreign animals that should be prohibited from import into this country? Oh, that? I think there's, we could clearly narrow down some taxonomic groups just to be safe. I'd rather you know, err a little on the side of, the, of caution. So let's say 1,200 bats, it's easier just to deal with bats instead of like 1,200 species and name each one. Yeah, I did. So um, yes, definitely, and we've been dealing that, I mean, there's <laughs> bio threats. Yeah, who the bat lobby is. Though. Yeah, there's, there's a big bat lobby. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could be some. Which is COVID. Well, actually, the pet industry has a very active lobby, yeah. uh, so it's very difficult and we've been talking with Fish and Wildlife um, there's the Lacey Act I and mean, there's long-standing legislation to about alien invasive species and I would love for you to include the idea that when you're thinking of biodefense it's not just as was mentioned not just about protecting people it's protecting agriculture Absolutely. and protecting our natural resources this country would be a mess if we lose our forest if we lose our wildlife and uh, life 
I mean, there are stakeholders across that spectrum of people that like to go hunting, people like to go hiking. We need, you know, clean air to breathe. The trees make for us for free. So we don't want, there's a lot of things to defend besides humans in this country from bio, biological threats. It's a bigger issue. And there's other stakeholders that would join us and say, yes, this is a good idea. You know, forestry service would probably say, yes, this is a good idea. You know, so there's partners in here available. From your, uh, from your uh, obviously, global work in uh, Echo Health and the Echo Health Alliance, are there any lessons uh, learned that you think we could begin as we're trying to build up that mindset? It's, it's a philosophy. It's an approach, right? Uh, it's a, you're building a culture. Uh, are there any lessons learned that you think we ought to, uh, that somehow can be at least legislatively nourish, nurtured as we send recommendations to the Hill. I mean, I, for one, am going to ask you if you got a list of those things, that we have, those creatures that we should bar and import. Uh, I'm a free trader, but I'm not into trading bats. Uh, a few other things. But I mean, but beyond that, lessons learned that, uh, as we start thinking of what well, this conversation, first time I've ever heard of One Health. I mean, I got it. I thank you, Dr. Gerberding. I thank you, Doctor. But it makes so much sense, particularly from a governor of a state that ag's the number one industry. So I, I kind of get it. Uh, intuitively, but I appreciate that. But lessons learned from the Echo Health Alliance uh, that we might want to begin to nurture in terms of policy in the United States? Um, I think um, at the legislative side, well, you all well know the challenges of getting the different committees <laughs> to collaborate. Sure we do. Um, but I think if there are some, you know, we, our experience has been, like in South Africa or with Ebola and Central Africa, is that if we bring the, uh, a group of people together to work on a specific issue, and there's a relationship grows there. In the U.S., our system, I don't know how that's maintained through the different election cycles, but I think at the agency levels, if we encourage that, they build trust and relationships. So I think probably around pandemic flu preparedness, okay. there's probably a lot of interagency yeah. interaction. Uh, somehow that's fallen by the wayside because it's been dropped as a priority. But those are the kind of pick up the phone relationships like yeah. Bob, I know that we worked on flu, can you help me with this? And I it's a human relations kind of issue. But I think the more we can get the different agencies and of course they have to defend their budgets, of course, at one time a year. But the rest of the year maybe, you know, if there's some mechanisms that require them to work together, either it's on exercises or practice but there must be some way to kind of mandate, but it gets that leadership and governance issue. Um, if we, you're, you're a great witness. We could go on for quite a while, but I but think we, we've got uh, to go to the next panel. Thank you uh, very much. We probably would sure. like to be in touch with you again. Thanks for your Thank work. Thank you very much. Really Thanks for all your support. Thank you. Uh, we go on to uh, uh, panel three now, clinical surveillance and detection, Dr. Dan Didier. Um, Dan Desmond, Deborah Rosenblum, and Robert Van Dyne. All right, so top that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but don't show us slides that are that disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I can go first. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Uh, the topic here is uh, key elements of an effective clinical surveillance and detection architecture and impediments to opportunities in increasing situational awareness for early and accurate disease detection and clinical diagnosis. Doc, Dr. Didier, I have you first. Great. Uh, Is it Didier or Didier? It's Didier, thank you very much. Uh, the French um, and I want to thank you for inviting me here, but more importantly, I want to thank you for putting this whole panel together. The work that you're doing is tremendous. It's something that needs to be done. Um, I'm not in, and I never have been in public service. Um, I work for Thermo Fisher Scientific, and we service this community, both on the, the food and animal side of things, as well as the public health side of things. And I actually head up our public health business in this regard. Give us an idea, of what, just quickly, what do you make that the uh or, or is it actual services that you provide? Um, it's actually products that we make. So the detection systems that you're hearing about, we produce most of those that are out there. We um, have those in place on, again, the animal, the food, and the, the public health side of things. 
Um, we do, you know, Ebola, we, the company is a very large company. It's, you know, we do almost $20 billion a year in annual revenue, 50,000 employees um, spread out around the world. And my portion of the business, the public health portion, I travel around the world working with these different organizations um, and, and have first hand with them. Um, I don't think I'm going to say anything new. I hope I don't say anything new because I hope that you've heard this already. I hope I'm just repeating it. I really have one main point and four messages that I'd like to make. Um, I'm going to start with the, the main point, and we've heard this over and over again, and that's the need for sustaining funding. You know, I, this morning's panel, when they talked about that ping pong ball, that's exactly what we see out there. You know, something like Ebola comes up and it goes up, and then it goes away, you know. MERS, it was a great example of MERS, I knew this last example. And MERS was high up and we were talking about that and we were over in Saudi Arabia and we were trying to stay away from the camels. And the next minute is Ebola that's up. And I like the, the studies they did that every eight months a new virus is out there because there is something that's out there that's affecting our public health. Um, I'm going to bring two points really that, that solidify this. I think that you've heard many of them already and this is really from Jim O'Neill. He's a former Goldman Sachs chief economist. He said that antimicrobial resistance will cut global GTP, GDP by a hundred trillion dollars and 10 million people will die by 2050. That's big numbers. 2050. By 2050. All right, I think that's actually pretty conservative. We already saw the Cree outbreak in California for the orthoscopes. Influenza, we always think, you know, influenza. No one thinks about influenza. <laughs> Three to five million serious cases occur every single year. 250,000 to 500,000 people die from complications of influenza every single year. That alone shows the importance of this. Four main messages I want to bring forward, and I work with these groups. The first one is CDC, DOD, BARDA, LRN, and Public Health Labs. They're doing a tremendous job. They need a round of applause, Life Person of the Year, um, Time Life Person of the Year for the Ebola fighters. That was great. That was great recognition. They are doing a great job, that facility out there, those people out there, they do not get enough recognition for what they do. Their counterparts around the world as well. It's so important, those global aspects of it. You could see the movement of the disease just on the zoonologic areas. Second, there's a need, and a lot of this has been said before, for rapid, reliable, accurate, and set sensitive detection systems for known and unknown threats. Some of those unknown may be bioterrorist threats or viruses are known to rearrange, reassort, and they come out there. We have to make sure those are available. Systems exist today so we can do that, but unless the funding's in place, they're not going to be there to do it. They are naturally occurring and man-made man -made both. That dual purpose, I, like, I think it might have been you that brought that up, the dual purpose nature of these instruments. So every day you're using it for something like influenza, but you have systems in place and you have reagents in place and detections in place for other things that could come along. That's how you make it sustainable and something that will work. Third, these threats are real. And fourth, these threats are not going away. Again, technology exists. We need to keep funding these technologies so they are out there. We need to be partnering those public-private partnerships to make these things happen. I know some of the people on the panel also come from this regards. But we cannot have that ping-pong approach. Otherwise, we're looking in the rear view mirror. We have to work on those things proactively that are going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I <clears throat> uh, appreciate that very much. Dan Desmond is next president. Is it SIMI? SIMI. SIMI uh, group, which I will, uh, is described for me as a leading innovator in healthcare 
Public Health and Community Health Solutions. Thanks for being Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to give a little perspective, and I, th I think I, the, the speakers beforehand, especially with Dr. Gerberding and Dr. Rungi, kind of set me up for this because uh, we work with the other 85%. So we work with state, local health, and the healthcare partners in the healthcare community. So this includes emergency departments, hospitals, uh, clinics, and fairly qualified health centers. And so what I want to speak to a little bit uh, today is um, the perspective of a ground-up approach. Um, for biodefense on how this relates to biodefense and biosurveillance from a clinical perspective but also from the local public health side. And the, uh, the, the national strategies are important and critical. The global health strategy, the national strategies, but the really question is how can we do it better when it actually translates it down to the field with the everyday practice and use of this. So I'd like to take this from pre three perspectives. First being the federal perspective the local, which includes the local health community being healthcare, and then finally some suggestions on some ways to improve the efforts that have been in place. And uh, there, there's been good discussion on the interagency efforts that go along and the challenges in the interagency of sharing data across the federal government itself. And uh, the model that uh, I'm going to describe this being used by some locals actually came out of HSPD-5 and the BioWatch program uh, when it first started at Homeland Security, and that is when do we need data and when do we need information? And there's a difference between the two because you lose the context with this um, as, as you look across these. So um, on, on the side of this, uh, there's the federal health architecture that plays and relates to this because that aligns how the federal government and the federal government systems share their data. There's the high-tech program with health electronic health records across the country. There's the, the work of obviously DOD and the VA with theirs, but there's also um, the Health Futures Group, which is a program out of the DOD to look forward over the next 30 to 50 years with what the landscape's going to look like for the health and the impact on the communities. So when I talk about local and the, the examples that we're going uh, to use today, it's not just local in the United States. Domestically, if we can't do it here, it's very hard to export it to other places. But how does this work internationally around DOD facilities, embassies, and other national interests for doing this? So, um, and I'll do this very shortly on the federal side. One of the, uh, came out of a lot of these discussions, um, including many at ONC on the federal health architecture, is that everyone agreed to agree that we should all share data, and then they went back to their day job. So that's been described pretty much at use, and they said, well, my promotion's not based for doing this. It's a really cool idea. And data sharing agreements have been very, very, it's been well documented, uh, very, very difficult to get for data sharing agreements. Well, trying to get a individual or a healthcare system to share their data on access to their electronic health records to do query will be very challenging because that's outside of their interest and the interests of the patient populations. So it's really about people, because when you talk about <coughs> policy, it's about people agreeing and, and knowing who to call on the phone. The second piece is technical solutions, many of which have been called surveillance. And there are many, many surveillance systems and efforts across the DOD and VA and CDC has done a great job subject to the funding um, that was available with the great progress they're making with NEDS and FIN. Um, and there are different needs for doing this. And as we saw some of the systems, it was very interesting to see the interest in defining d data and information from social media. And when we looked at a lot of these systems and a lot of these search-based ones, we found out that the source material said, according to a local health officer, which means someone at the local level knew the information before it was being shared with the others. So how could we tap that information at the local level and make the information available to decision makers at the regional and higher level going forward. So the technology, as you mentioned, the technology exists. It's how do we apply that technology. And then the third thing that happens is how do we reduce this to practice? And this gets to the dual use with this on these, with how it goes forward. And I want to mention that in addition to like the public health emergency preparedness program, hospital preparedness plan, many of the programs that we see at the local level say we can't move forward on this because what do we do when the grant ends? We don't have consistency with this. So there have been some efforts to provide some continual funding to move forward with that. And then the final piece is we talk a lot about surveillance, but there's a difference between biodefense and biosurveillance. And a lot of it's perspective. So I want to take, I didn't want to talk about Ebola, but let's look at measles. We had a recent outbreak of measles with this. And the public health systems really dug in. They did a great job. They were able to respond to it, contain it. Kudos to the, the public health labs, the CDC, and especially local public health in California and the state. But 
If I was wondering, was this a test of our system and our capacity to be able to respond to a bioterrorism event? Because here's a disease that we had vaccines for. This reminds me of the National Smallpox Vaccination Program. Are we ready to respond to this and how did it adapt to us? And was it just the government, federal, state, and local? No, it was the Magic King Kingdom that put some pixie dust on this. But if you realize, they did not shut down. They stayed in business. They were resilient. The travel companies, the transportation participated. So when you talk a whole of nation approach to this, it has to include the private sector. And when you look at the healthcare industry, 85% of the data comes from there. So before I didn't want to be all gloom and doom, um, I want to say there is, there's hope from this, but it didn't come from expected sources, especially when it comes to biodefense, biosurveillance. And uh, Dr. Tara Tool testified back in 2009, 2010 about biosurveillance and gave a very interesting quote. The interagency process is inherently slow and cautious. That might be the right approach when we don't know what we are doing and we don't want to make major missteps and we want to carefully husband limited resources. On the other hand, I think this is an area where the threat is growing, the consequences are potentially so dire that the United States of America ought to make a few big bets and think about in what areas we could invest where a leap ahead would make a huge difference. And I think that's the situation we're facing now. A question and answer period follow that, and she said, we could start with electronic links between public health and hospitals would make a huge difference. We are seeing that today, but not through funding for biodefense, biosurveillance. The CDC funds have been cut short on doing this. This came through high tech and electronic health records, because there's a component for public health reporting, and in NEMSIS, which comes from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to make public health aware of what's going on at the local level when someone shows up, calls 911, and appears in an ambulance. So taking a step and looking local at this, um, went back and did some review on what happened to this, and there was legislation back in 2006 that was passed called the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act with BARDA, set up ASPR, and those types of things. And it called for an interesting phrase. We've heard about, a lot about systems today and processes, but it actually did not call for a system. It called for an interoperable network of systems. And there's a distinct di difference between those two. And when you look at the language, it also includes healthcare partners. And that's not the system that's, that we're talking about. We're talking about individual systems that are all necessary, but how do we make them work with one another? Um, and they come down to three things people, technology, and activities. So how do we turn all of the healthcare systems into our sensors, not just like BioWatch or point of use devices, but that astute clinician who says something weird's going on, why do I have three people in the waiting room all throwing up? Little simple things like that. And many of the preparedness plan, including the pandemic plans, note that an astute clinician recognizes someone's coming in with the flu or some type of things with that. So we, we have those as a process in place. So we needed to change from what can't be done or why don't we do this to why not. And so I, I'll take this with and give you some specific examples that have been happening. Public health proportion of this has been through a redirection of funds. They're taking resources away from other activities because they said if we can get data, more actionable data, we might be able to provide better care and save money over the long run or redirect funds. The healthcare community was given financial incentives through high tech to actually pay to participate in this if public health can receive the data. So if public health doesn't have the capacity at the local level or the state level, they do not receive the data. We're still talking faxes. And this includes laboratory results. So point of use diagnostics that doesn't have, isn't actionable, I call point of shelf diagnostics. They buy it, they put it up on the shelf, and it's not used to move forward. So as we've done this and, and move forward with this, the private sectors, um, there was funding for something called high tech. And in the high tech, there were the beacon communities, or 17 of them across the country. Uh, North Carolina that uh, w was spoke about earlier is one of the examples and exemplars of this, as they did this across the community. But a couple of them focused on emergency medical systems pu and public health as part of changing their programmatic practice with this. So they got people together and they started building ad hoc relationships through a shared business value proposition. What is the value of the healthcare community to provide nice clean data electronically to public health after the financial incentives are gone? And the reason is because if there are diseases in the community, they impact the healthcare system and cost them money. 
If there are infectious diseases around a hospital, it can impact the hospital. High tech reinforced that with a 30 day readmission. So there are actually incentives in there to actually help public health to become more, more effective with this. But a best example of this that actually gets into the rapid diagnostics and identification started with emergency departments. You have an emergency department, someone calls 911 and says, I'm, I'm having, I'm, I have chest pains and my left side is bad. Before it'd be, take two aspirin, we'll send an ambulance and head you over there uh, to the, the ED, well, an ambulance and take you to the emergency department. Well, now what happens is the EKG run data is actually being taken in the ambulance and sent to the emergency department before the patient shows up. They can now know if they need to activate their heart condition things. They <coughs> save money if they do this. They ask what other information could you provide? Oh, we can tell you if they have flu likes, all the chief complaint data that's important for syndromic surveillance. But why, who's gonna pay for us to send that to you? Working together, they found out that if the discharge summary, which was also required under state law, if you would give us that electronically while you report it to the state, we can bill faster, we will provide you all the ambulance data for free. It's a, it's a fair exchange of data. The next thing they asked, uh, speaking of some of the devices, well, could you test people if they have flu or something like TB before they show up here, if it's someone who's had TB in the past? What can we do beforehand? How can we move the epi curve forward with this process? So now as they're doing this, they created something called the Community of the Public's Health led by the Public Health Department. And so this is the broader context of public health that now includes the VA, the DOD, but fairly qualified health centers, community clinics, doctor's offices, schools, large populations to do this. The second piece is technology with high tech. And uh, I, I mentioned high tech in one little short aside on standards. Um, we've been asked many, many times, you know, what well, we need more standards, we need new standards. The nice things about standards is there's so many of them. It costs money to implement and build systems every time a new standard is developed. It takes three to five years when a new standard is to actually see the impact. If you change the standards every two years, you never get the return on investment, which is why we're still receiving data with 1992 standards because we keep changing the standards. So how can we move forward and protect that? High tech does that because it actually implemented the electronic health record systems. That includes the ability to get faster data and make the uh, diagnostics available much, much faster. There's been a lot of discussion on electronic health records to say, are they effective? Do they interoperate? Yes, they can interoperate. That doesn't mean they're the same. If you have a cell phone, you know that when you dial a phone number, it doesn't matter what cell phone carrier it's on. They interoperate, but they're proprietary and they can work together for doing that. So the final piece with this is, is the business case on the technology. And this is where the point of use diagnostics and the rapid diagnostics fit in, and also where the crucial role for the public health labs fit in. Right now, a lot of, we saw this first with the white powder, uh, with the surge in white powder and the burden on the public health laboratories, and especially on the CDC and the guidance <coughs> and the LRN network, where now the screening test that public health sometimes needs to done can be done with technologies like we've deployed from Thermo, Fisher, and from others. And they can now be looking at characterizing what is this we're looking at. It's a type of flu we haven't seen before. How do we characterize it? Which is into the science that the public health labs are uniquely qualified to do. So final, there, were, there are three recommendations that I had for this. Um, public health infrastructure, people have already talked about and funding it. But that is to raise health security to a priority of the nation, as we said with the whole of nation approach with this and that the private sector must be empowered to be a part of that process to move forward. If 85% of the actionable data is generated by the healthcare system, and it takes 60 to 90 days to get that data in a form that can be consumed, then you, our biodefense is looking retrospectively at the data and cannot form action plans and be able to be effective to do that. The second thing is that biodefense and law enforcement must be a part of this community. I know the FBI is talking afterwards and so I'm sure they'll mention this. But concepts such as chain of custody, the things that we went through with the BioWatch program with who had access to the samples. Public health laboratories have chain of custody. <coughs> Healthcare systems have chain of custody. It's just called HIPAA. They track where every single sample, who touches it and everything's done. So it's a different context. Surveillance and public health, surveillance and law enforcement mean two things. But they need to be at the table for doing this. And then the final thing with this is 
to realize that the diagnostic companies have technologies now that can make, as, as we mentioned before with the post office, we have companies that have bought that system from Cepheid. It still uses UAC funds to pay for the anthrax test, but it does drug resistant TB. It does HIV, uh, I'm sorry, uh, influence of those types of things. We have BD with the Veritor, which we get through uh, Fisher. And they're doing rapid tests here so they can actually know when the flu is hitting faster from the clinics with real time data. So the data can now be connected. We have pretty good connectivity in the United States to take it straight from the device before it's associated with the patient and make it available for national surveillance programs. So those are my, my, my three recommendations. Uh, thank you for your time. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank, thanks very much for your analysis and for your recommendations. Uh, next is Deborah Rosenblum. Welcome, Executive you. Vice President of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Some of my best mentors are there. Great. Well, thank you very much, Senator and Secretary. Um, it's a pleasure very much um, to address everyone and to talk a little bit about the need that we see from our perspective for greater regional and cross-border work on detection. As mentioned, I work at NTI, and our mission is to reduce risk from nuclear and biologic threats. And over the past decade, when we looked out at the very complex public health and early detection field, both domestically as well as abroad, there was a very much of a glaring gap, and that is that a lot of the very good work that is being done is being done bilaterally. And there have been very little incentives nor work to encourage, particularly in war-torn regions and over difficult borders, to promote um, cooperation amongst countries to work cross-border. So over the past decade, in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and Skoll Global Threat Fund, what we at NTI have done is created a number of what we call early disease surveillance networks. There's one that's operating in the Middle East between Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority. There's another in the Mekong Basin, one in Southern Europe, one in Southern Africa, and as well as one in East Africa. And what we have found by encouraging these ministries, supported by their public health labs, as well as academia, to work together on a regular basis to exchange data they've negotiated what those protocols are, that they give very early warning to what they're seeing coming out of their public health labs in a manner that's far quicker than you would have with the World Health Organization, where the country is notifying WHO, WHO in turn is then notifying other countries within the region. Because of bureaucratic as well as some inertia at WHO, we have found that that piece has been fairly cumbersome and that by creating these informal networks and by providing that support and funding, there has been very good cooperation. I'll take the Middle East as an example. I just got back actually last night from a trip in Amman and Jordan and Tel Aviv. And what we've seen is in the case of the Middle East network, they started on an area that was safe for them, which was foodborne illnesses. They share the same waters, the same food. But the nature of the cooperation has been so good and so effective quietly that as these countries have faced pandemics over the past decade, the level of cooperation has risen dramatically. With SARS, avian flu, they're now working cooperatively on MERS. They're doing research together on it in their laboratories. And so it's a real example where if countries can be encouraged to work cross-border and multilaterally, that not as a substitute, certainly, for what they're doing in terms of the UN system, but additive to that, both the informal and the formal channels are working far more quickly and help from US security perspective that these countries are developing capacity indigenously to get a jump on some of the pandemics that they're seeing. I would also point to the Ebola crisis. Of course, there are a whole number of reasons um, <coughs> that that has occurred, and there are others certainly far more schooled in that than I. But one of the things we would say is it's notice, notable the absence of any kind of network between those three countries. And their efforts underway now as part of the reconstruction and the rehabilitation to put one in place if the three countries are interested in cooperating. But the fact that there was very little cross-border communication 
or coordination of any nature, I would put forward certainly um, had an impact in terms of the spread of Ebola as well as uh, the response to it. And the final thing that I would leave as you're kind of thinking about how to take experiences within the private sector or the foundation world and make them relevant to um, the work of governments is, you know, as I think uh, was mentioned earlier, there's a tremendous amount of work that continues to be done by the Department of Defense, particularly under the Cooperative Threat Reduction. And as that program is being reschooled from being one that was very U.S.-Russia focused to one that's very global, you know, we would very much encourage that a portion of the monies that are going there would be used to encourage, you know, regional work that be done through bringing the countries together, through exercising, through some tabletop exercises and things like that with a specific writ or mandate to have them be for more than one country and to complement the bilateral work that's being done with really an equal focus on the multilateral. Great. So with that, I will stop there. Thank you. <coughs> Excellent. Uh, and last on this panel, uh, Robert Van Dyne, founder of Rapid Pathogen Screening. Screening. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I just want to mention it was 1994 that I then um, met a uh, young representative from uh, the Erie area who was the first uh, enlisted individual from the Vietnam era to, um, I thought it'd be cool for him to become the 43rd governor. Nice job. And Thank you, you did. I <laughs> <laughs> Senator Lieberman, I just want to say I'm once removed. Uh, Senator McCain was um, uh, in Vietnam. I was a young ensign off the shore and was in, uh, in that period of time. The only reason I mention that is that it was, it was a period of time when threats were an ocean away. Right. And since then, they're you know, in our house. Uh, I'm here as a private uh, individual, uh, formed a company, and to represent really my opinions, and you know, just my personal opinions. Uh, 12 years ago, uh, three of us formed a biotech company. Uh, 12 years, I'm sorry, 12 years later, we have three FDA products, we have almost 90 patents, and we raised over $50 million in equity. We're one of uh, maybe a few hundred that are able to survive the valley of death. <clears throat> and now we're growing up to become a real biotech company. I just want to reflect for on the personal level, have any of you ever had children or yourselves get pink eye? Recall? Yes kind of confusion, indecision, do we do antibiotics, do we not do antibiotics, do we take the children out of school, do we leave them in school? We developed a product that's FDA cleared that differentiates viral versus bacterial. Sounds like a, um, a really solution, but we run into problems at the state level because the guidelines say a child who's diagnosed with conjunctivitis must have an antibiotic before they can return to school, even if it's viral. We're working to try and overcome that, but it's difficult state by state. It's a long and hard trudge to get through those kind of barriers. Or have you ever had a fever, or your children have a fever? Then what's the question? Do we go to the doctor? Do we wait? You go to the doctor. Is it antibiotics? Is it viral? Is it bacterial? I have to make some disclaimers. This product is not available in the U.S. It is CE marked and sold outside the U.S. So what I say has nothing to do with the indications for use in its current clinical trials. But this product is like a glucose test. This is the point of care test that can differentiate whether you have an immune response to a viral or a bacterial pathogen, or whether your immune response is fighting off and is not responding to a pathogen. There are evident gaps in our healthcare system, and that's where we see the commercial opportunity. I won't go into the chart that we passed out, but if you have questions about that later, I'd be happy to answer those. I would like to point out that the, uh, the path to innovative diagnostics is fractured and challenging. I'd like to make a couple recommendations. First, for the agencies like DHS, HHS, and DOD, um, promote collaboration and innovation. One of the things I see is that funded projects are very safe and it's very it's um, difficult for any contracting officer to take a risky decision. So I see projects like that are funded for things like sample preparation for PCR. <coughs> a PCR is a 20 year old technology. If we haven't figured out how to prepare samples after 20 years, we shouldn't be investing in that kind of uh, activity. Collaboration and not competition. BARDA, DHS, DITRA, 
they all have specific missions, but they could collaborate on some common platform investments. There are intersections where the platform may be usable in different missions with adaptions, but I don't see that collaboration. The FDA, I have to be careful, <laughs> I don't want, we are in clinical trials, but I see that there must be some additional harmonization of FDA guidelines along with clinical and medical practice. Um, innovate, don't suffocate. If a developer can't identify a predicate to which to compare his device, he might as well give up because it's going to be a long, long road and very difficult. And for all, I'd like to see, I would hope that the agencies could improve their processes. Um, I get concerned when I hear a request for a special case for this reason or for that reason. It's as if we're going to turn um, the FDA into the IRS where you need an expert to figure out what the special case is and what special path you wind down. Our company is a market disruptor. And as a market disruptor, we should not be the last to be adopted in the U.S. Unfortunately, this is CE marked. It'll take another many, many months until we're through with our clinical trials. But uh, as a retired uh, naval officer, I stand willing to uh, answer questions, serve our nation. I'd like us to be the first to innovate rather than the last to innovate. Thank you <clears throat> for your service in those uh, many ways. Um, I'll open to questions. Tom, do you have any? Or any others on the panel? Or how about the ex-officios? So I think we have kind of a recurring theme, excuse me, leaning over. Um, this, the replicate versus innovate, and so that's come up several times. And, right. And I think, you know, we got to it about um, NIH funding, you know, you're probably more successful getting a grant if you're kind of replicating a former study with a big twist versus something that's higher risk. And so we're talking about some of these high risk, and I don't know if any of you have some thoughts on how we can kind of slow, move that far forward, you know, the innovation labs. There's some interesting concepts out there that are worth exploring. I don't have an answer. I don't know how flexible the agencies are. I just know from the private sector, you know, associate with a lot of people who have a lot of, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of things that are on the edge, but, you know, you need, for an FDA-approved product, you need about six to ten million dollars to get through. So, uh, it's, it's a large hurdle to, uh, and if, you, if you're truly innovating without a predicate, you're at the 10 million plus. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to uh, add a, a little bit on that um, from the perspective, especially for this with biodefense and biosurveillance, and that is um, public health, the CDC, local public health, state and local public health, they have the ability and a lot of ability to try out innovative new things and a lot of diagnostics companies are not aware of that as long as they're used for surveillance purposes. The DAD has it with the clinical investigation facilities where they can actually use and test out new things and say, hey, this is what we think, it's not an FDA approved test, okay, this is not what we have with this, but now that we know what it isn't, we can actually do some investigation. Um, and the reason why that's, I mentioned that's critical is that's how H1N1 was discovered in the United States. It wasn't the local health department. They were one of the last to know, and that was only because the CDC found out about it. But it actually went to the Navy facility from the Border Health, which is actually part of the Border Health Surveillance Program that goes on there. So part of this is to coordinate and align these efforts it is very, very crucial to do and to make those aware. But once again, public health has to have the resources to do that. I'm sure the speaker from the public health labs would be more than happy to support that effort, but they're just trying to you know, keep their staff come there. You were talking about the antimicrobial resistance and the uh, potential lives that could be lost and uh, dollars would cost. Would you, A, could you talk a little bit more about <coughs> the nature of that threat? Second is, would you fold in the effort to combat antimicrobial deaths with the, uh, the bioterror preparedness we're talking about here, or do you see it as separate and apart? So I think there's dual effort, so we have to look at it that way. Because the antimicrobials, you know, a lot of that is sprung out of overuse of antibiotics. The, your system is tremendous here, you know, give antibiotics when they have a virus. Well, you know, it doesn't work. 
Um, so it sprung out of that. It's a as a terrorist threat, especially these one-off guys. You know, they get a hold of these things. They infect an individual. They go in and around and affect everybody. You know, so it's very easy to spread. You're not carrying a nuclear bomb. You are the nuclear bomb in these cases. Um, the threat itself is going to continue. I mean, there's not a uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies, they, if they cure a disease, they sell it once. If they have a chronic disease, they sell it every, over and over and over again. So it's how do you combat that? The only way you can combat that is through funding from the government to support these type of programs. The innovation that was mentioned here, the only way you get those innovative ideas is through this type of thing. Um, it's continuing to grow, though. You're, gonna con you're continuing to see this. You know. You, you see it in, in sports, high schools where they're next to each other. You see it in kindergartens, which are breeding grounds for these type of things. Um, they are. They're little incubators. I, I, everyone that's had a kid knows that. You know, you come down with every disease. Um, I travel like you travel around the world. I think I've had six different forms of the flu in the past, you know, six months. Um, those type of things happen. That's what's out there. And so you're going to continue to see this. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a huge impact on the global GDP but as well as on people's lives because what do you do you know and, and again from a bio defense type of I, I hate to be the grim reaper here but one individual ten crazy individuals contaminate themselves you use Ebola as the case one of them gets Ebola and they just bathe each other in it and they walk around you have a surveillance system that looks at your temperature body temperature well you take a couple Tylenol before you go to board the plane I mean, there's so many ways around these things. So those systems and detection systems have to be in place. The innovation has to be in place. Um, and so it's a terrible problem. With regard to some of the technology that exists in this space today, sensors, detection systems, and the like, how difficult is it within the, in the government infrastructure, if you're the entrepreneur, if you're the innovator, you know it's in the market, you believe you have a demonstrably better widget that would replace that. Is there any mechanism in this, in this public health arena where you can go in and uh, test, basically a competitive testing lab? This is what you've been using, we think our system is better, and we can demonstrate that capability. I mean, I, I, one That's of the things, essentially the question that you have to answer for the FDA. Yeah, but but but, but that takes forever. Uh, we well, were because it's a safety agency. Well, we were able to establish a collaboration with an army hospital in Texas. Okay. And under we have national labs that can do those one ops. Go ahead. I'm, tell me your example, though. It was um, an army hospital, um, <clears throat> and it was done as part of. Um, pre-investigational device due diligence. It took a couple years and a couple rounds, different scenarios, different demographics, until we had enough data to then approach the FDA with what's called a pre-investigational device exemption. Now, <clears throat> by the time you get, that's two years, in, you have two or three years pre-trial, um, pre then you have a couple years of uh, pre-investigational device exception work, and then you probably have, well, we're in our second year now of FDA clinical trials. So six years, and there are people out there where you can do your pre-investigational device exemption under research use only and, and, and um, all the appropriate HIPAA and uh, local regulations and all that. They're out there. You can do them, but it's, it's methodical, it's long, and it's costly. And when you get to the FDA, it's as if you're not very smart. Um, we have typically 12 or 15 people who are saying, why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you do it that way? Wouldn't it be easier if you did this? You don't have a predicate. It just goes back and forth and back and forth. It's like, um, it's like the Inquisition, but you got to keep, you got to keep on going. So the other health and human services, BARDA, they have a tech watch program, which I found very helpful. I don't know if you guys utilize it, but we can actually present an idea there they bring in experts from across the area, Department of Defense, CDC, all these different areas. And if, the, if your idea um, merits within their area that they're looking at, uh, they will fund those things all the way through to clinical trials. And their goal is to have a regulatory cleared product. 
Um, it's never easy, and it's never short-lived. But it's an interesting it's contrast. So you've got a private sector entrepreneur, someone that's willing to invest, and has to run through the hoops. Or you got somebody walks in and says, "I got an, I got an idea. I don't have a device. I don't have a sensor. I don't have a diagnostic. But I have a good idea about this, and you convince a panel to give you money." I, I mean, I guess that's, what? Yeah, that's you get you get you get funding to that point, and then, then you, you have you. the valley of death. Yep. And that's the three to four to five six years, clinical trials. Reimbursement is just getting a clinical trial approved is only the first step. Then you have to get through CLIA, and then you have to get reimbursement, and then you have to get your CPT codes lined up. So it's a long and arduous process. Is there a similar process in uh, Europe? Um, Europe lets the market decide. You submit your data. Um, you have a registrar who reviews your data, and then you you can obtain the CE mark. And then, then really the market takes over and decides if your product is uh, meets your indications for use. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah another thing that, um, and Dr. Van Giesen, you know, that's how I met him through the program the DOD ran, and they actually had a 24-month challenge for diagnostics where they invited industry in to say, we're going to fund some efforts to do this. And so DITRA has done a number of these where they've actually developed some test diagnostic tests for things like H5N1, H7N9. But the problem is once you get the test developed, by that point, the you know, is the disease prevalent in people in the stockpile? It has a shelf life of two years to be used for an investigative technique to what starts that whole process. That he, so the government has a number, you have to wade to find these. DOD did uh, a call out for this to the industry for doing this, but you have to find the different paths to do this. It's very, very cumbersome. And like he said, a lot of the people that we've met with said, uh, why do it domestically? I'll just go over and get my C mark and do this, test it out in other places, and at least I'll be able to get some money working over there to pay for the two to three year experience, as they called it, to move forward. Wow. Fascinating in contrast to the testimony of the panels before the panels today, and I suspect the panels, uh, the next panel on April 1st, there is a sense of urgency around this whole issue if you believe that it is a serious issue, and yet we hear from your testimony and that of others, yeah, but if we come up with a good diagnostic, we don't, it's going to take us four or five or six years in order to get to the marketplace. I, I don't know how we can figure well, out a way well, to well, part of it. that, but help, help us a little bit. Oh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example with, with this, and it goes back to your H S yet. who's in charge? HSPD-5. If you're, yeah. you're going to do something, and I'll, I'll go back to that one, like I said, I don't know if it's been superseded or not, but there are a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, pockets of, ex I'll just use Dr. Van Giesen's term, uh, pockets of excellence um, that are across the federal government for doing this. There is a lack of alignment of these in order to coordinate and have a single message. For example, with HSPD-5, which then had HSPD-10 and all the other ones that followed, it left it on the individual organizations to protect their turf and their expertise for doing this. Whereas HSPD-5 had, uh, had Homeland Security as the head at the table. And when Homeland Security is the head of the table, who is the head at the table for HHS? And I know that a lot of times I've been in meetings where people beat up the CDC for doing things, not doing things, that are not under the CDC's purview. But as public health, they step up to the bat every single time to do it. So where is that alignment coordination that aligns across the agencies first and then within the agencies themselves? By doing that, then there can be a, an, a pathway or an avenue for these open challenges. The 20 form of challenge has been very, very successful with some very, very innovative approaches. And it opened up to industry. Imagine if you did that across all of them. Then you get you know the, the scale, and you start getting the diagnostic companies and the innovators willing to uh, put up, and the investors willing to put up the money. That's my personal opinion of a concept. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alexander. I think you have a question. Um, Ms. Rosenblum. Yeah. A question to you. Um, Please. You described the cooperation. Yeah. Particularly on the bio and the nuclear issue. Um, my, first of all, my question is, did you have the opportunity also to check on the border security in terms of the cooperation of Egypt, particularly from Sinai to smuggling? And secondly, if you look up north, Syria, uh, particularly the challenge 
of the chemical weapons. And the proliferation, as we know, and particularly how the so-called Islamic Caliphate mm -hmm. is not on, only thinking about this, but from what we know, the open sources, they are trying to test in this biological weapons area. So, status report. Yes, so thank you um, on that. Let me start first with your question about Egypt. When the Middle East Consortium for Infectious Disease, which is the formal name of the one in the Middle East, was started, it was absolutely an aspiration to bring in other Arab states. And um, we have found, though, over time, just bluntly speaking, um, having Israel as part of that consortium has um, been a formal inhibitor. So what has occurred is there have been efforts on an informal basis to have participation from Egypt as well as Lebanon, and that has occurred, but they are not as of now formally part of the, um, the consortium. Uh, with respect to Syria, um, absolutely. And what we have found in that particular case is this Middle East consortium has worked closely together on the refugee issue. Um, about um, six to eight months ago, there was some concern in the water, which is tested regularly in Israel, that there were signs of polio. And there was some concern there, and that's a very good example of the nimbleness of this informal organization, because what they did is they picked it up very quickly in the waters. Israel notified Jordan and the Palestinian Authority and continued to watch it. And as it turned out, it was not related to the refugees, but there was a very real possibility that it would have been. And so that's an example of case in point beyond its original writ and mandate of where that cooperation is coming. Um, again, with respect to ISIS, you know, there is a great deal of concern. Um, not only, as you mentioned, in terms of the chemical, but radiologic, and in our area, you know, you worry very much about nuclear material and, and biologic, and particularly with the labs and the overrunning of that. And so what I would say on that is it is very much of a, a threat and a concern. It's palpable in the region that they feel that, but um, I would say if there is any hope, just based on these kinds of um, multilateral work together that there would be some element that things be picked up sooner than later and I know throughout the day in other panels you've talked about the epi curve moving and flattening to the left and it's through those kinds of things where an early warning in the event God forbid that there should be something of a you know malevolent nature that it's willfully introduced as opposed to pandemic or, or naturally occurring so with that. Uh, uh, Dr. It is Dr. Didier, uh, doctor. Um, d does th uh, Thermo Fisher make uh, detection devices that are unique to detect uh, biological attacks? Uh, in other words, I, I guess I've been wondered whether in a, a shopping mall where it would be a, a potential target, there are devices that can be purchased to constantly test the air. That'd be great if there were. Yeah. Um, I mean, just so you know, we're not the only company right. in this space, right? Um, I'm just trying to create a new market for you. Yeah, I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sign you up. You know. um, the, the issue always is the sampling and how you do you get the sampling yeah. and how do you do that? And you know, we heard about systems that are pulling the air out there right. and the amount of things there and how does that really relate to disease. So that is the difficult challenge. So yeah. some of those systems would have to be done. It's easy when you can sample an individual, um, but when you have to sample of space of individuals, either boarding an airplane or going to an amusement park or what right. that is, those are always difficult situations and areas where investment would be great. And I think we need that kind of investment. We're getting more and more sensitive and then how does that sensitivity actually relate to a disease or a bioterrorist threat is going to be important as well. Okay. Uh, any other questions? We, we, we would almost be on time if we concluded this panel now. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, I think uh, Governor Rich uh, set a good standard earlier on, which is to the extent that you have some takeaways. And uh, some of you have already given us paper that you'd like to put on paper. And each of you actually had some recommendations. That would be uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Uh, panel four is law enforcement, attribution, and the lone wolf, uh, which is about uh, 
law enforcement activities, attribution of deliberate acts, etc. Dr. Uh, Randall Murch, Dr. Yona Alexander, and the uh, uh, much described and much praised Special Agent Edward Yu. <laughs> Star of Station Scream. <laughs> Who uh, made a cameo appearance here earlier today. Dr. Murch, uh, welcome, Professor in Practice, School of uh, Public and International Affairs, and Research Leader, Office of the Vice President in Vir at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yep. And I will just add one more ingredient to my background. I was a special agent of the FBI for 23 years, uh -huh. and I actually created the National Forensic Program that we'll be talking about in Perth really? today. Good for you. Yes, sir. All right, well, thanks for having me. Dr. I appreciate it. Alexander, you're the only non FBI agent at the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in good company. But what? I'm in very good company. You're in good company, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me here today. I, I really do look forward to the opportunity and available to help out uh, in the future if necessary. I'd like to take a few minutes uh, assigned to me to retune you to the world of attribution and, and, and try to pull it out and, and provide uh, sort of the complexity and also what the U.S. government has done and also where some of the challenges are and gaps are and some recommendations. Good. Also, uh, unfortunately, much of what goes on in detail in the attribution program in, in the government is primarily a government function is actually sensitive or classified. So I'll do the best I can to describe it and then lead you to talk to others that can uh, help you out in the future. So let's, uh, just as our, our public health and, and biomedical colleagues have talked about, the attribution and discussion has to begin with thinking about how, how attacks would present to us and what would be, have to be contended with in an investigation. Whether the investigation is a high impact attack with warning, no warning, surgical strike against military civilian targets, or even all the way down to a hoax. I mean, those all have to be run to ground with the full uh, weight and capabilities of, of government attribution systems. We also have to be concerned about the range of weaponry that could be used. Um, we've often heard, you've heard, I'm sure, about the CDC list, A, B, C, many pathogens and toxins on there. Most of the forensic analysis, for example, that's applied or should be applied has not been developed and validated for those agents. We know a lot about anthrax. We know something about some of the aspects of some of the disease agents, but not all of them in sufficient depth and also robustness to survive legal or even policy challenge. But it goes beyond that because it's not just the 20 or so or 20 or 30 agents either on the CDC list or the chairman's list in case of the Department of Defense. There are thousands of agents that could be used as weapons. And the vast majority of those are, have not been characterized or validated for forensic um, attribution uh, kinds of purposes. And this is true of toxins as well. Also, I've been around long enough to, to have some exposure to um, nuclear forensic, technical nuclear forensic and attribution. I was involved in that early on, too, 20 years ago. And, and we have sort of a context and attitude in the U.S. government that's very much uh, Cold War nuke focused. And bio is very different and very much more challenging, very much more difficult. And we'll go into more detail, you'll see it in materials I provided to you why this is so. In addition, the attribution system that we have has to be agile enough and available enough and, and maneuverable enough to deal with the targeting an adversary might uh, look at. What kind of larger select populations, consumable commodities, like the famous Tylenol cases that happened 25 years or so ago. I was in the FBI lab at this time when that, when that happened. Um, needle in the haystack problem. Systems such as Metro and so forth. Facilities, high value targets, courthouses, Capitol Hill and so forth. Um, events, special events like the Olympic Games where actually our, our activity started in 1996 and working in partnership with CDC and actually Jerry Parker, who is, who's left here, working in the military medical community. Okay. There he is. <laughs> oh, there you are. He'll be back. Cool. And also um, symbols, okay, um, national symbols and also mass psychology. Also, we have to worry about the range of perpetrators, lone wolf, you'll hear about later, all the way to the professional opportunistic bioweaponeer, the do-it-yourselfer, do and so forth and so on. Again, layers and layers and layers of complexity that the attribution enterprise has to worry about. 
So for truthfully nearly 20 years, I and many of my colleagues have, have believed that the attribution capability uh, deserves an equal place in our biodefense por portfolio, and it's important, and why so? Because after the anthrax attacks and the dust settled, what was the most important question? Who did it? How do we hold them accountable? If we can find them, if we can figure it out, and also defend it in court. So um, there's lots of reasons why I believe this to be so. I also believe that we needed a, 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 a well-designed, uh, very robust and agile and maneuverable kit of tools, which include some of the capabilities in public health, in the intelligence community, and also science and investigation. I also believe that uh, attribution also an important, or excuse me, an effective attribution capability raises the bar for adversaries. It may not get us all the way to deterrence, I'll comment on that later, but it certainly makes it potentially a lot harder and maybe changes their decision calculus about what they choose to do against us, how they choose to invest. So what should an attribution kit, if you will, include? Agile, adaptive, coordinated, integrated, multidisciplinary investigation and intelligence. Scientific and forensic support that can maximize informing correct and defensible decisions. Laws and policies that enable U.S. plans, programs, and actions. We have some of those in place. Cooperative and leverageable partnerships with key international partners. It's a global problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. And also robust mechanisms and processes to respond to not only the predictable but also surprise. So we do, in fact, have some laws on the books that uh, provide the basis uh, for attribution, one of which is Title 18, uh, U.S. Code Section uh, 2332A. It's the WMD statute. Also, the Public Health Security uh, and Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Act has some element in there to support attribution and the partnership that has to exist between those agencies that are focused on health and the Department of Justice. We have two national strategies that call out attribution specifically, um, NSP, uh, HSPD 10, and it's signed in 2004, and talks about attribution and its importance and the importance of technical forensics. I will tell you that uh, with, I believe, some authority, happy to debate this, that probably went over the top in relating technical forensics and deterrence, but we can talk about that later. I need some study. And also in 2009, the National Strategy for Countering Biological Threats, very specifically in Objective 5, talks in depth about forensics and attribution. We do have treaties that we engage on, the Biological Weapons and Toxin Convention, and, um, and UN Security Council Resolution 1540, but neither one of those uh, really address the attribution. There's no teeth, no uh, enforcement mechanism in the BWTC, and this is also true in the, in the UN SCR 1540. So if we're relying on that, we're not going to get there for attribution. So what is attribution? Fundamentally, from a legal and policy perspective, who did it? It's not as easy as you might think to always get there. Uh, those of you that have practiced criminal law, know this for a fact. <laughs> There's a smile there from <laughs> Mr. Weinstein. Scientific attribution is a component and, and it and informs legal and policy decisions, but it's actually very different. It's the sci assignment of a sample from a question source, like a crime scene, to a sample from known origin, like a lab, okay, in a particular culture, to a high degree of scientific certainty. Law enforcement is not the only one that relies on that, so does public health. The source of an outbreak is a crucial piece of information in managing public health response. So when you go through the, the, the process toward attribution, it really is a series of investigative legal or policy questions that have to be answered. You know, sort of the who, what, when, where, why, how questions, I mean, fundamental. But in addition, it's more than that. It also is what is the, you know what evidence exists. You, sometimes you have to play with the hand that's dealt dealt to you. Okay? Um, what does it really tell us, and how strong is the information value and weight of the evidence? The information, how reliable and credible is it? And this goes into attribution decision making later, legal or policy. What are alternative explanations for the evidence? I was a, an investigator in the field in the FBI, also a forensic scientist. I can tell you with almost every batch of forensic evidence, there are alternative explanations for that evidence. And lastly, can we defend our, our conclusions and actions? And this, these, this is true also at the global leaders question, whether it's the president or, or um, a head of state elsewhere. And so in the legal system, we do have a framework. 
from no suspicion, uh, reasonable suspicion, probable cause, beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me underline this statement. It does not exist in the policy community as yet. And it does not exist yet. It should, but it, it, it doesn't. So what does it mean? But, uh, a framework for decision making. Okay. How much and what kind of evidence do you need to, need to make a decision? I will confide in you also here. I've actually, since I've been in Virginia Tech, I've been inside the government working on this you know, for quite some time as on loan you know, to the government, various agencies, and so forth. So I'm pretty confident what I said was true and correct. Now, there is an attribution assessment system in the government. It's been created and annealed reasonably well, multi agency across the government up to the White House level. No time to, to talk to talk about it at length here, but it really the, the feeds are coming from law enforcement investigation, science and public health, uh, operations and intelligence, and they're merged, racked and stacked, prioritized, and then pushed up and out as ne needed. Now, I want to go very quickly to um, with the original basis for our, um, for our attribution system. FBI and public health were the partners. It was CDC and the military medical community. The, the comment that was made earlier about law enforcement has to be at the table, actually law enforcement was the first one at the table. And they were the ones that engaged CDC, me and colleagues from the FBI lab, working with Jerry Parker and his predecessor at USAMRID uh, to help build that system. And then even the laboratory response network came out of that, uh, FBI, and is still used today on a daily day, day to day basis. We could go at great length to talk about forensic science and its relationship to the scientific basis. <coughs> of uh, what it forms in, uh, feeds into uh, attribution. Uh, the materials I gave you to read actually does that at great length. I'm happy to answer any questions later on it. But really what we did back beginning in 1996 is build a new scientific discipline called microbial forensics or bioforensics to actually help fill the gap in the science to feed the attribution process. It is also governed and driven by legal demands, legal requirements, not just good science. Okay? It's really to end. And that, that, there's a long story that goes with that, which actually pervades the entire forensic science community in the US, not just the microbial forensics. So a couple of just quick points on microbial forensics is it actually relies on a different set of disciplines than what you're used to seeing in the movies on TV, in books on how forensic science works. And by the way, that's mostly entertainment. It doesn't really work that way in the real world, by the way, what you see on television. Sorry, to, sorry sir. <laughs> Um, better lucky than good. <laughs> and really, um, we a answer a lot of very deep questions. Sometimes the science exists, sometimes it does not exist. There's lots of unknowns about microbes, their environments, and how they can be used, um, not only to cause disease, but also as weapons that we just don't have the science for yet. But we do can leverage some classical forensic science. For example, if there's a fingerprint on the dissemination device, of a biological attack, that's attribution if the fingerprint can be matched to an individual. Okay, so we do work and use classical forensics in that way. So uh, real quickly, um, there are, uh, we can make some uh, definitive statements about the state of microbial forensics, the science that we can use. We do have a robust um, uh, laboratory uh, capability that's centered around the National Bioanalysis and Countermeasure Center, National Bioforensics Center at uh, Analysis Center at Fort Detrick, DHS, major customer, FBI, strong partnership in a constellation in the government supported by academic and national laboratories. But there's still big gaps in the science that need to be addressed. And, and a couple of my colleagues and I have identified specific what we'll call grand challenges that we, can, that we should pursue. I can detail those in, at, um, probably ad nauseum, put you right to sleep after lunch if I had the time. But really what we need is an optical attribution capability. So we need to raise up um, its priority, in my view, um, in our investments. Um, there's lots of reasons why. I also believe strongly that we should think about attribution not only from after something bad happens and responding, but rather push it left of boom, i.e. before something happens, anticipate, predict, interdict, disrupt. And science can apply there too, and so can intelligence and investigation. Also, one last comment that, um, and then I'm going to give you quick five recommendations, and I'll get out of the get out of the way. The question of attribution and deterrence. I believe this is only true if a nation possesses an effective capability and can demonstrate or will use it, and the adversary has to believe that you can and will. 
Otherwise, you're not deterring anybody. Okay? Five quick recommendation. Ensure that the policy attribution capability is, is robust, and, and this is true also for that that supports legal, it could survive scrutiny, and we've not had that yet, including the anthrax cases. Okay? Now, we need to invest in science. There are many big science gaps that also would help public health as well in basic science. We need to develop a global capability. We really don't have that right now. It's, it's, it's not complete, it's not coherent. We need, to, we need to understand whether or not uh, an effective capability can actually help with deterrence and, and this idea of going left of boom. Thank you. Thanks uh, uh, very much, Doctor. I've got Dr. Alexander next, and then we'll wind up with uh, Mr. Dr. Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, as an academic co-sponsor of the panel, Obviously, I, I think it's uh, very critical to uh, put it on priority uh, agenda. And um, I um, would like to share some, some of my uh, views as a participant observer for, I guess, some 50 years as an academic uh, in this area. Um, I have one major concern, and the major concern is that there is no international, global, universal consensus as to who are the terrorists and what are the root causes and what can we do about it. Um, in other words, we're still struggling with that particular issue if we cannot identify the opposition or enemy um, or adversary. How can we identify the uh, medicine that we need. So, in other words, we have to look at this uh, from both at the theoretical as well uh, as the practical uh, aspect. In my own case, uh, related to the lone wolf, and uh, we had the discussion the first uh, panel, uh, Dr. Kahn spoke about uh, that at least he mentioned uh, some of the important aspects. I would try to follow up with that. As an academic uh, looking uh, at the lone wolf uh, challenge, uh, obviously one can go all the way back uh, to history, uh, actually to, to the Bible itself, uh, if you will. Um, in my own case, I, I like to mention specifically three uh, tragedies that happened uh, one, the assassination of the foreign minister of Sri Lanka, Kadir Gimar, who participated in our uh, activities, academic uh, work. Uh, he, he was uh, killed by the Tamil guards uh, and so on. And then the second uh, incident I like to mention is the assassination of the Prime Minister of Israel, Itzhak Rabin, by um, Egal and an extremist again, who um, decided to um, destroy actually the peace uh, process. And finally, the attack, uh, this is the 20th anniversary of uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, and we academics, uh, we try to contribute to the memory of the victims to establish a museum and to be engaged in the educational uh, process. Uh, finally, to relate this to the weapon of mis uh, mass destruction that you will cover, I would like to mention that uh, going all the way back uh, to, to the late uh, 70s and uh, 80s and so on, we were blessed uh, to, to have the guidance of Professor Edward Teller uh, on the prevention of weapons of mass destruction. Um, we held seminars, conferences, and uh, publications. What I would like to do, I prepared a general outline of some of the concerns. Obviously, I'm not going to go into great details because I do not have the academic are, but just standing on one leg, I, I would like to mention uh, several uh, aspects. One uh, general uh, Ridgeway 
he observed that there is still one absolute weapon, and that weapon is man himself. I think it does relate to the lone wolf. And the Russian uh, famous uh, proverb that even if the bear is gone, he left the place for the wolf. But the big uh, problem, of course, is the bankruptcy of terminology and terms and concepts. And there is a very long list, I think, which is very confusing, both to the public as well as the policy makers related to terrorism all the way from uh, crime to global war on, on terrorism to countering violent extremism. We just had a uh, global conference in Washington last month to the lone wolf. How do we deal with that particular uh, aspect uh, in terms of the role of the loner, or the lone wolf, or the lone wolf uh, pack, and so forth? Now, I think we have to see it in a broader perspective in terms of motivations and contributing uh, factors, all the way from political discontent to uh, nationalistic uh, aspects, political and so forth, and the cultural uh, aspects. But uh, again, I think we have to see the forest as well as the trees to understand what makes the lone wolf tick. And there are many characteristics, many of those that we are familiar with. I won't go into it, but I think we have to look specifically at the process of radicalization all the way from the family to the prison. So specifically, I think we have to be concerned about three types of modus operandi, if you will, or attacks. One, the individual attacks are trying to target a specific individual. The selective attacks, the attacks target a selective group of people. And then the indiscriminate attacks designed to inflict the loss of life and indiscriminate damage. Uh, obviously, we have a long list of lone wolves operating uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, from the religious-based and secular-based. I recall uh, the first um, case going all the way back uh, until 68 when uh, Shokhan Tihan um, assassinated Bob Kennedy and we spoke about the lone wolf in terms of other aspects and Timothy McVeigh and so on. There is a controversy obviously in regard to many of these uh, people. But the point is that the lone wolf is a permanent fixture of the terrorist scene. Now, as far as weapons of mass destruction, uh, obviously we are going to have some details, but following what the terrorists tried to do all the way from Al-Qaeda when Ben Laden announced the nuclear bomb of Islam, all the way to other groups such as the Taliban, such as the Um Shinrikyo, such as the Chechens, and so forth. And now we are concerned about the Islamic Caliphate and the weapons of mass of destruction. So really the question, or the critical question, I think, or the key questions of the 21st century are two, is the worst yet to come? And at least my short answer is definitely yes. It's not if, but when, and with what impact, and the lone wolf tragically can play a role, and we can go into some details. So again, if the worst is yet to come, Will civilization survive? In other words, can we survive the challenges on that level as well? Again, my short answer is definitely yes, if we want to, if we're going to do whatever is necessary to develop some counterterrorism strategies. And specifically, I have a few recommendations. I won't go into specifics 
in terms of the civil responses, in terms of the government responses uh, to radicalization. And I think if we cooperate on these levels, not only on the local level, the national level, uh, but also regionally and interregionally, I think we can reduce the risk. And the key again is we have to strike a balance between the security concerns and civil liberties, particularly in terms of surveillance and detection. I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Alexander. That's a, with a helpful analytic uh, description, and uh, I must say I'm comforted that uh, you believe that civilization will survive. <laughs> so sometimes here, it, and as we listen to the testimony, the question might not be that easy to answer. Um, <clears throat> Edward Yu is uh, the supervisory special agent with the FBI Weapons of Mass Destruction uh, Director. Thanks a lot uh, for being here. Thanks very much for the work that you do. Um, maybe at the outset, you just tell us a little bit about the directorate. Yes. Uh, um so just to provide uh, the panel, first off, thank you very much. Uh, I consider it a real privilege to be able to present to, to you all. Um, so background regarding the WMD Directorate. Uh, it is the youngest division within the FBI. Uh, it was born out of the events of 9-11 and, and the subsequent uh, Amerithrax um, case uh, and was built upon the recommendations that came out of the 9-11 Commission and the WMD Commission. So having said that, uh, it was already mentioned that we enforce uh, criminal statutes that are, have been placed on the books, specifically Title 18, Section 175, and it's uh, preventing the, the use of any biological agent, toxin, or delivery system for use as a weapon. And the, that particular, those statutes being promulgated and then thereby uh, the FBI being charged to enforce that fulfills the U.S.'s obligations to the Biological Weapons Convention and U.N. Security Council Resolution 1540. And I want to cite that because that's going to be um, important uh, towards the end of my presentation. Um, one of the key components of the WD Directorate are WD coordinators. Uh, WD coordinators are special agents that are trained in chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear matters. We have at least one station in each of our 56 field offices across the U.S. We have some uh, stationed internationally too, uh, one in Singapore and another one in Tbilisi, Georgia. And their primary role is to act as a local ambassador, um, to establish liaison and uh, lines of communication with state and local law enforcement and public health, and to proactively uh, reach out to research institutions, companies, universities that conduct biological research, of, and sometimes pr priority to high consequence agents. So, for example, as was mentioned throughout the course of the day, if there was a biological, I mean, a BioWatch biological actionable result, the WME coordinator will be, uh, be notified and would. Um, initiate the notification procedures with their uh, local public health counterparts as well as the CDC. We also provide training at the local level through something called the Joint Criminal Epidemiological Investigation Program, where um, in partnership with the CDC, the FBI, along with the local WD coordinators, bring in at the state level those relevant entities that if there was an unusual outbreak of some kind, we help facilitate the partnership between public health and law enforcement to rapidly determine is this an intentional event or is this a naturally occurring event. And that program has been, has been uh, widely popular both domestically and, and has now uh, garnered international attention. Um, and so I just want to provide that as backdrop as far as what the WMD director is um, providing. Uh, I was invited today also to sort of broaden the discussion when it comes to biodefense. Uh, throughout, again, the course of the day, when we talk about biodefense and the, the bio threat, the, the conversation trended almost exclusively to the pathogens and the select agent list in particular. But when I cited uh, the biological weapons anti-terrorism statutes, the, the letter of the law says any biological agent. So it's the select agents, and it could also be something like HIV or, or chicken pox. It really does boil down to intent, the true issue when it comes to dual use. And when it comes to select agents, th there is an existing uh, security regime within the life sciences, and um, I had the privilege to serve under Dr. Parker as chairman, under, um, one, and there were actually two working groups um, established by executive order to look at optimizing the select agent program. Um, so having said that, I would recommend that uh, those 
recommendations that came out of those two working groups may be something that uh, the, the, the panel look at. Um, but again, to expand on the biosecurity component, I want to go beyond just the pathogens. So you, uh, you were privy to a presentation on synthetic biology where one of the risks was the, the, the copying or recapitulation of a pathogen. From a law enforcement perspective, there's another dimension. Um, so one example when it comes to a pathogen, there was actually an incident in 2006 where a reporter for The Guardian in the United Kingdom used a personal email account, his personal credit card, and his residential address, and he emailed an order to a DNA synthesis company. And within a month or so, he received his order in the mail, a little plastic vial, and in it was a DNA sequence for smallpox. And the resulting story was that the lax laws uh, leave the public vulnerable for terrorists to order uh, Ebola or smallpox and get it through the mail. So granted, he did get DNA, but it was only a very small portion of the entire uh, pathogen, so it was completely harmless, but the damage was done. And as a result, this caused the entire private sector, the DNA synthesis uh, uh, sector specifically, to change their business practices. So now, they screen incoming orders and screen customers to determine what they're making and who they're selling it to. One of the important aspects of that, though, is that, again, it's just focusing on pathogens. One other aspect of synthetic biology is the reprogramming of microbes with novel functions. A good example is that back in September, there was a publication that came out where a research group reprogrammed baker's yeast, basically, to synthesize heroin. So now you can potentially have a microbe that will happily grow on a sugar source, and you can have ostensibly a, a beer maker's fermenter and make potent narcotics. Um, so that becomes a huge challenge for a law enforcement entity like the FBI or the Drug Enforcement Administration if that becomes disseminable. Uh, the research was done because there is a huge need for pharmaceuticals, but this, this also looks at the security risk whether it's not just terrorism, but now we have the possible for criminal enterprise. And in this area, there's incredible incentive uh, to try to subvert that legitimate research for something nefarious. Um, and we're actually really on the verge of going from the, the breaking bad scenario to a brewing bad scenario in, in biology. Um, the technology has gone that far. Uh, and to compound that, uh, it was mentioned by Dr. Khan this morning about the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, IGEM. It is probably the world's largest synthetic biology conference and is populated by undergraduate students. Uh, this last competition had over almost 3,000 students descend upon Boston for their jamboree. They came from 254 universities in 34 countries. Uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, one good example, again, is uh, a team from University of Washington in 2011. They spent uh, the summer reprogramming bacteria to uh, break down gluten to help with uh, food allergies. What they did in three months when they tested it turned out to be 700 times more active than what's a drug that's currently undergoing clinical trials. So they did that in three months, and that's just how powerful some of these applications are becoming. One of the interesting aspects of that is that the FBI have been sponsors of iGEM uh, since 2009. And as a result, we actually provide a biosecurity uh, workshop under the theme of safeguarding science in the future. And in this last uh, iteration, we had over 2,500 students, largely international, attend our workshop um, at the Jamboree. And at that meeting, they, heard, they learned about the Biological Weapons Convention and UN Security Council Resolution 1540. Despite the fact that they do not work with pathogens at all in this context, what the key fundamental point was, and this goes back again to what Dr. Khan mentioned uh, this morning, is that is raising the level of citizenship in the scientific community to go beyond just do no harm, but to a more active, not on my watch. It's not about ethics, it's about security awareness and having a fundamental understanding that there's a reason why the Biological Weapons Convention exists in that historically biology was indeed exploited and used for offensive purposes. So in these settings, whether it be from garage biologists, which we do engage as well, all the way up to the university or private sector companies, we basically invoke Spider-Man. It's with great power comes great responsibility. And it's really leveraging them to become true guardians of science. It really isn't just about the fidelity of science, but 
again, expanding what their roles are in the scientific realm is taking that one step further to understand what is their responsibility in not only protecting the, the fidelity of science, but making sure and preventing its exploitation and its abuse. And by coming at it with this message, it's been wildly uh, well received um, and has also actually garnered, again, international attention where when we come in with this type of messaging, we're helping our foreign partners better protect their own sectors, whether it be commercial or academic or research. And also, when it comes to looking at the public health response, how do we link up law enforcement with the scientific community? Because one of the key challenges is that you may have a fully informed, fully educated scientific community, but if something happens, if there's an incident, how confident are we that there is a a uh, FBI WD coordinator or program similar to the one in the U.S. internationally that could have to provide the proper response and proper threat assessment. So the two aspects, not so much recommendations, but really is about uh, the life sciences. There's a huge convergence now too with the data processing and uh, and uh, uh, the the cyber realm. And now one highlight is we we finished a project looking at big data and cybersecurity with a bio angle. And we found out that we might be in a really bad way. In, for example, uh, the Anthem hack, um, where 80 million patient records were uh, um, taken. In September of last year, uh, community health systems was also hacked and four and a half million patient records were taken. The hypothetical that I'd like to propose for you all is that we're now living in the genomic revol revolution where we can easily sequence all of our DNA for a few hundred dollars very rapidly and in the, in rapid, very soon in the future. And that's being used to have targeted, personalized precision medicine, um, which is ultimately very beneficial. But what if, along with the patient information, there was information that may be tied to, say, insurance code, where now you know what the individual's disease state was, what their treatment was, what their drug, um, what the drugs are, that were being administered were, now you've now fundamentally provided somebody, whether it be individual or at the nation, nation state level, an entire treasure trove of clinical trial information, drug study information, and we've just heard how long it takes and how, how expensive it is to apply that R&D. We're now looking at that angle, and we and it's not just the, the biosecurity from a traditional biodefense realm, but now we're looking at undercutting our own global competitiveness from an uh, economic side. Another angle we found out too is that, um, and I'm glad that someone showed uh, a portable device for diagnostics. Well, we're also living in an age, with, digital age of wearable technology, where you're you're tracking your caloric intake, your sleep patterns. Those are all being put out into the cloud. And we're leveraging all those different disparate pieces of information, bringing them together, and again, to make health decisions. But that also provides another opportunity for security issues, ranging from if you, you could potentially be a stalker, and it would be a huge paradise if you hacked into that information and knew what an individual's activities were. Another example is you've just drank from uh, that bottle of water. If I took your water, bottle, swabbed it, I could send it in for sequencing, get that information, and now I've known, I now know the most intimate aspects of who you are. And as it stands right now... I the, assume we're going to keep it private. <laughs> <laughs> but the criminal statutes don't apply, or they do not exist, that look at the possible extortion or coercion of, of that individual if you have that type of information. So it is an interesting balancing act and how do we leverage the beneficial applications of the technologies while identifying <coughs> and addressing uh, the security issues. One quick anecdote, I don't want to leave us on a complete downer, but as a result of our messaging, uh, one really nice example is that they were in iGEM, there was a team from Beijing. Again, these were just teenagers. They, they had a science project, but they decided to do a side project on security. And what they did was they identified 17 Chinese-based biotech companies that potentially had very dangerous hazardous materials. And again, they used personal credit cards and, their, and apartment addresses to order them. And to their dismay, found 16 out of the 17 companies would fill the order. They canceled the orders at the last minute and they drafted a white paper policy paper, a scathing critical paper, and sent it to the relevant Chinese regulatory government offices, saying that they needed to do a better job protecting the public. Um, 
And to me, that is really truly a, a, a show, shining example of what scientific citizenship looks like. And it's being applied at the very young, early level. And we need to have that type of engagement now as things become more and more rapidly advanced. Otherwise, we might be in the same position we are in, in traditional cybersecurity. We, uh, we might be in the very same place in the life sciences if we're not careful. And then finally, it's really when it comes to the WD director and our activities, it becomes to scalability and sustainability. So with that, I'll close. What, how, say a little more about the, what you mean. Meaning that um, it's, it's a good start, uh, and, we, and our priority is um, the U.S. and our homeland security, but it goes back to uh, we're just talking about a, a, a cadre of special agents that are their, their primary goal is to establish those important linkages, but we are talking about the life sciences, which is wholly global, wholly open, and it's how do we implement these same type of approaches and understandings of what biosecurity is in our counterparts in law enforcement internationally. So, thanks. As you describe the directorate, it sounds um, um, more oriented toward prevention yes. than law enforcement. True. So, uh, I, p I am part of the countermeasures and operations section, which our primary focus is on prevention. Okay. We do have an investigative operations section as well that does look at criminal enforcement and actually conducting investigations. That's separate from, or is it's, it it's part of It's part of the WD director. Part, part of the WMD director. So, I mentioned those two colorful characters uh, with the attempt to mail ricin laced letters to the president. Yeah. Um, it was our WD coordinators that were the lead case investigators, and it was our operations section in, and um, in collaboration with our laboratory division and with the CDC that actually um, executed the investigation. So just to get to the end, because we're, we're um, um, well, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, what would you hope that a report that this panel might, uh, will put out, would say constructively and proactively about the uh, WMD directorate at, at the FBI or, or about the FBI in general? So I'm not sure if I'm in a position to be able to <laughs> <laughs> speak on that. <laughs> However, I can say one thing. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, <laughs> no, rest, you know. no, the fact that uh, whether you're uh, a, a member of the scientific community in a, in, um, a, an amateur garage biologist all the way up to somebody working in a type fl top flight laboratory research facility, say at Fort Detrick at USAMRID. Now is the time to educate this community, this growing community, about things like the Biological Weapons Convention, like the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Statutes, that this impacts them. I don't understand why we don't educate folks who are entering into this field that these frameworks exist and it directly impacts them. Um, that's a missed opportunity. And we need to do that now more so because now we're having engineers, um, uh, data uh, analysis folks going into the life sciences um, and again, trying to leverage these new capabilities. We're gonna end up getting blindsided, um, most likely in a good way because uh, all the applications are completely beneficial, but we need to have them be on the lookout on how these new capabilities, new applications could be subverted and exploited. They are in the best positions to help entities like the FBI identify where ma uh, uh, intentional criminal or terrorist use might occur. Uh, but they have to be the sentinels, and uh, we need to engage them now. Is, is, uh, I know you're doing some of that now, but is the FBI the right agency to be doing that kind of education? Um, so we're trying to do it, but ideally, I mean, this is just a personal perspective, but um, it was mentioned earlier today that it would be, I would think, entirely appropriate for if you are an incoming student, whether at the high school or college level, and you're taking your first introduction to biology, microbiology, or even biotechnology, that there should be at least one part of the curriculum that talks about the history of biosecurity, um, things of, like the, the Biological Weapons Convention and how there are um, many international parties that are signed on to it, but really instilling that civic sense of being, what does it mean to be a citizen scientist in this field? Also that there's law here. Yes. Right? And, and that there, there are certain things that, uh, if, if they're not careful, they might do that would be illegal. Yes. And Keys to attribution is then holding the party responsible account. Yes. That and the, your testimony and Dr. Alexander's testimony. And, and I, I 
see the difference between criminal activity and terrorist activity that's just Congress is doing. A criminal might use a, a bioweapon to achieve a, a particular outcome. He, he or she doesn't care to be caught, et cetera, et cetera. A terrorist might use it, and he or she may himself be the weapon. True. And so the, the, the notion of attribution, I think, is probably very helpful, perhaps, in terms of uh, dealing with the criminal who may misuse or abuse uh, the access to or the research around biological weapons. But do you think it makes a bit of difference to, uh, to an, an ISIL recruit? Probably not an ISIL recruit, okay, but it might be to an enabler of an ISIL, ISIL, you know, ISIL enterprise, for example, right, right. supplier of materials, let's say, for example, or if they're getting nation-state assistance, it might. Um, but it's a different calculus, and this is why I go back to this framework we use you know, to understand how we develop and apply right. your decisions to that construct. And so criminal justice, yes, we sort of understand it. it's kind of a squishy you know, framework we use, you know, qualitative. But I, but I think we ought to spend some effort, um, government with help from friends, to understand what that means to the range of adversaries you know, that we would encounter, you know, North Korea versus ISIL versus pick some as representative uh, examples, and then look at that and determine whether or not it's effective or not. And if not, what do we need to, 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 uh, to make it work? Clearly, I do think there may be a role for the ability to attribute that may lead you to the actor mm -hmm. who doesn't care about right. the issues. That's right. So I appreciate that value. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor? Well, it's uh, really a question of um, who is the perpetrator? Uh, for example, um, those, uh, I remember those we. Uh, um, for example, interviewed uh, uh, suicide bombers who were captured and so forth. Um, some some uh, were involved uh, because of some indoctrination um, by a clergyman uh, in the morning and then in the afternoon they were mobilized to um, take on that particular uh, act. So uh, some of them have done it because they thought that this would provide a martyrdom to them themselves, and God knows what they are doing. Now there are some uh, others that uh, cases that we uh, investigated and studied for a long time. There are other um, individuals for uh, personal uh, reasons, some call them psychopaths or, or crazies or whatever, uh, decided to um, become active against, for example, the government. And we do have, by the way, uh, cases in the United States uh, in terms of categories. Those are against government and those, as we, we know, are involved in hate crime and so forth. So it depends on the specific case uh, itself. But uh, again, you find that sometimes uh, groups would not um, um, claim responsibility for an attack for, um, I think, intelligence uh, reasons to keep the law enforcement uh, guessing. Uh, and so on, and sometimes they would claim a responsibility depending on the particular case. Sir. If I may, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish through our outreach and engagement is, if I can borrow a term from the cybersecurity realm, we're trying to establish a population of white hats in the community to be on vigil for potential black hats developing. And, and we see this working in the fact that there have been instances now where those local WD coordinators have been notified by those entities, whether it be a university program or a commercial program. A good example is there actually was a DNA synthesis company. They came out with this publicly that they received a, a DNA sequence order that originated from Iran. And that being the case, they couldn't, that's not something that you could, you could call your local police department and report that to. But the WD coordinator was notified and then we looped in our threat credibility assessment process and also the Department of Commerce. And, the, and rapidly provide information back to the industry about what, how best to proceed. 
they, there was a whole bunch of export control issues that they had to address, all the way ranging to actually getting suspicious reporting being provided to those local WD coordinators, um, and then also having those coordinators being invited ahead of time to participate in training and exercises at companies and universities to, um, if there ever was an event, how would they best respond? So uh, it's it's not the direct answer to your question, but it's it's another aspect where mm -hmm. where you can you you're setting up different sentinels to look right. for changes in patterns of activity, and again, it's going up from uh, just not, not the, the the somewhat passive innate do no harm, but to the more active not on my watch and see something say something. Yeah, and it really is like like the concerned citizen, you know, developing a network just like that sentinels. And actually, I should mention really quickly is that uh, Ed's program has been very successful at my own university. Um, <laughs> Virginia Tech actually had he I don't know if it was Ed himself yeah. went down to Virginia Tech, the main campus, and actually had a summer program that not only did students participate, all the way up to the vice president of research was involved in this. So there's high visibility, the, um, just my university alone was very successful. Yes, Jim. A question probably for the agent. Um, you, you made references to what you can potentially buy over the internet and that sort of thing. Are, do you have any are there suggestions that the Congress should review the laws on what individuals can acquire and, and, and uh, is that is that genie just way out? Of yes, the uh, that 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 horse has left that particular bar barn a long time ago. And but again, at the same time, though, it, there's everything that's being that's happening in life sciences as we speak is incredibly beneficial. Um, and it, it that was our whole strategy and how do we approach this particular issue without without having a negative impact on the beneficial development and innovation. Uh, we need to strike the right balance to not only protect public health, but we're also talking about how to protect our, our ability to innovate and to b our ability to stay globally competitive. But um, the, yeah, you should see some of the applications that are coming out of the amateur community. Um, they're incredibly resourceful. Um, you're, gonna they, you're gonna see the next iteration of uh, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs coming from that, that, um, that sector. But that's only because the life sciences has become that open, and, and, it, and it's been that way since its inception. It's a strength, um, but you have to approach it that way. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, this question. Um, it's a form of what I asked earlier in the day. So we were, we were attacked, as we know, on 9-11-01. In fact, uh, Congress uh, passed an uh, authorization for the use of military force against those who claim credit for the attack, Al-Qaeda, and we broadened it to associated Islamist terrorist groups. Uh, and then, of course, came the anthrax attacks, which, as I mentioned earlier, we, we suspected was a violent Islamist terrorist, but, but never turned out to be any evidence to suggest that. So why, and, and fortunately, as I said earlier, as far as I know, we've not, the, the, the Islamist terrorists, including the lone wolves, have been the most uh, uh, successful against us here in the U.S. since then. Uh, uh, Hassan at um, uh, Fort Hood, uh, Bledsoe, the Chernev brothers, etc. Um, why do you think that we, we have, that, that none of them have used biological weapons? Because at the time of 9-11 and the immediate aftermath, I, I, I'm repeating myself, I think there was a lot of feeling, we were hearing it on Capitol Hill, that the a biological attack was one of the most likely forms because it was relatively easy. Um, so why, uh, why do you, why do you think? Well, maybe I'll start with you, Steve, and yeah. then ask the others to comment. Have to weigh why, in on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why, why do you think we have not been uh, victims of such a biological attack? Well, not the, the for lack of trying. Um, there have been instances, and I mentioned uh, a couple. There was actually a, uh, a Georgia-based militia that tried to make at large scale um, ricin. Um, so there have been incidents where, where we have been able to interdict. Um, and again, to kind of broaden the aperture on what we're looking at security, from, from my standpoint, I'm it, the more near term is going to be looking at the, the illicit narcotics angle, because it's going to be that easy. The incentive is there. Um, but then I'll also go back to one, one other near miss, I guess I would classify it, is um, uh, Afia Siddiqui. Um, this is in public record. She was an individual who had Western-based education, got a bachelor's degree from MIT and a PhD in neuro neurobiology, I mean, from Brandeis University. Somewhere along the line, she became 
radicalized, volunteered to become a medic for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and even married the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the, the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. We arrested her in 2008 in Afghanistan. She had been on the FBI's most wanted list. She popped back up in the news just a few months ago in that uh, before ISIS uh, executed those poor uh, re uh, reporters, they attempted a, a prisoner swap and Afia Siddiqui was one of the named individuals that they wanted to get back. So again, the, the, the interest is there, uh, but, it, but uh, from my perspective, I, you almost have to approach it almost a, from um, agnostic of the threat. We're looking at what is our capability and how could that be potentially exploited, whether it be a criminal, terrorist, or a nation state? You need to approach it that way. Now, if you flip, flip, flip it around, and I'll go back to my FBI role for a moment. Bombs and guns work really well. Okay, it's terror, and, and they're cheap, available. You have lots of options, and all those different components I mentioned, uh, targeting, whatever it is, you've got lots of options with bombs and guns, and it's a shock effect. It's yeah. about communicating on the media. Yeah, but actually, uh, years ago, when I was still in the FBI and starting this program up, um, I was, uh, Attorney General Reno was over at FBI headquarters getting a briefing on sort of where we were on, on bioterrorism response, and the FBI was just getting itself organized, and the, the pre predecessor division to the one Ed's in now, the FBI lab is just starting its program, and she got the anthrax and the subways brief again, and uh, so I said, and she looked around the room and said, what, what else you got? What else would she worry about? And I said, well, okay, if, since you asked, ma'am, uh, how about if I bring down the beef industry by myself and you never catch me? Because I've been in law enforcement and intelligence for 15 years at that point. You'll never find me. You'll never catch me. You'll never attribute it. And I, that's a $100 billion industry at the time. Okay, it's economic. I won't kill anybody. Okay. But again, if I really wanted to have the shock effect, bombs and guns. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we have to consider, first of all, the intentions of the perpetrators. Um, if uh, this is a, a suicide uh, mission, for example, or to d destroy, or to inflict uh, damage on a wide uh, area and so on, they would consider using uh, some uh, uh, biological, if they can get uh, their hands on it, or uh, some chemical. But uh, in general, I think we see the evidence indicates that it's a question of accessibility to explosives, uh, for example. The Unabomber was very sophisticated, decided to use explosives and to use the mail and so on. And again, I think in terms of defense, I think the Postal Service uh, improved its uh, capability to, to detect, I think, uh, unwanted uh, mail or whatever you want to call it, but at any rate, the point I'm really uh, making is that um, I think we have to consider uh, really the role of um, um, movements uh, such as uh, the Al-Qaeda or ISIS that had both intentions and they tried to become involved in this uh, area, uh, as well as uh, state uh, sponsors. Uh, for example, if a state would determine that the cause is lost and it's a question of survival, uh, they, they would uh, actually join the devil in order to get what they want. And we have to keep in mind two elements, that the perpetrators, there is no end to their um, innovation and imagination, uh, as, as well as to the criminal uh, activity that they can engaged in. So it's really the question of individual cases. I don't think we can uh, reach any conclusions across the board uh, in terms of the uh, situation. We know that there are some cases uh, all the time of uh, individuals who are engaged, engaged in this, uh, this activity, but the capability to, to detect and intercept, I think, is really growing. Thank you. Yeah, one more question, uh, Rachel Evans. Thank you. So you've had uh, a number of people make very, very pragmatic suggestions today, and I, and I want to pull together a few of them because I think this panel does that very nicely, but may maybe not in a totally cohesive way. Um, Ed mentioned that there's a, often a, too much of a focus on the pathogens, on the agents themselves, and, and I maybe would take, uh, I, I was involved 
involved in some of that, so I, I think I feel uh, responsible for going back and saying that I think that in some ways that's misdirected. And that the it, it's, it's entirely too easy to focus on pathogens or on equipment and say, we're going to lock those up and then we don't have a problem. And I think, in fact, that that's dangerous because it makes it more expensive and less attractive to researchers to engage in the countermeasure development that we really still need no matter what. But Ed mentioned sentinels, white hats. Uh, this morning we heard about bystanders. And Norm mentioned the bystander process. And I think that that is still something that we need to talk about. Ed's education efforts uh, are absolutely critical. And you see why people call him a hero. Um, but it is not necessarily the FBI's responsibility to go and educate the biological community, the biosciences community. And we've been talking about the need to do that since the Amerithrax attacks. And still, there is nothing that is totally organized except around the select agent program. And a recommendation might be to strengthen that and also the entire bystander process, which again is, is uh, FBI has had a very good role in turning around the attitude in the biological community that made a lot of people reluctant to go to law enforcement, to local law, and to FBI to report people where they had concerns. And because they don't want to unnecessarily and inappropriately ruin someone's career, and that's entirely appropriate. But there should be some way that where people have concerns that it can be investigated, at least initially. Um, and FBI has been doing that and has, has done a great job in talking to universities, including mine, um, to make sure that that process is one that is considered to be acceptable at the local level. So I think that that's something that should be included in a recommendation, and, and they may want to comment on uh, how best to do that. Yeah. But uh, not, you know, it would be really dangerous and detrimental to say we're just going to clamp down on access to materials. Ed, do you want to respond? You don't have to. <laughs> uh, it, so it just I wanted to well thank you for the, the acknowledgement but it, again it, it this situation is going to become more acute in the light of the fact that we're seeing a convergence of, of different disciplines in the life sciences whether it, it be data processing um, uh, engineering principles I mean there it's happening as we speak um, it could really work to our advantage uh, but it really is again now is a time to engage and educate so that we can identify and mitigate those risks So um, in our engagements in education, uh, I can provide some uh, one really good uh, anecdote that addressed that. Uh, the Select Asia program, there were, we, when we engaged that community, um, they have been really responsible and, um, and do abide by a lot of compliance up to a point where they're actually um, t uh, complaining about the burden of some of the, uh, meeting those requirements. But you will not believe, I would say maybe 90% of the time, when we go out and do our education and we throw out the name Larry Wayne Harris, folks don't know who that individual is. And for those of you who don't know, he it was a neo-Nazi white supremacist who attempted to get Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of the plague, and almost got it, um, and through the mail. And at the time, those biological weapons anti-terrorism statutes did not exist, but that's why um, that statute was passed. But so it, there's a disconnect now because here you have a community that is operating under a, a, a large amount of requirements and compliance issues, yet they don't recognize what the genesis of this program was in the first place. So we've, we've now established potentially a culture of compliance rather than, and as was quoted in the World at Risk Report, we really need a culture of security awareness. Yeah. Uh, I was a member of the National Science Advisory Board on Biosecurity for a while three years and, and actually my colleagues on NSABB in the discussions on responsible um, science actually resisted you know the, the law enforcement engagement side of this and uh, much to my chagrin they were fine about you know ethics and, and proper science and so forth but when it came to well, what do you do if you detect something what happened if you witness something um, and so forth and so on there were certain kinds of things they just absolutely resisted would not include in their reports to HHS Okay, yeah, you've been, again, extremely helpful. I must say, listening to you, uh, Ed, um, this is not your grandparents' FBI. 
It's certainly not. <laughs> it's certainly not J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. It, it, it actually reminds me just briefly that once a, we did a hearing of, in our committee on uh, we had a panel of uh, representatives of Muslim American organizations and community groups, and at one point we were talking about interaction with the federal government, uh, uh, constructively, preventively. So we said, what what is the what, what do you have any constructive relations with any, any federal agency now and Senator Collins and I were both <laughs> knocked back when the answer was the FBI. In other words, there was a really active community outreach program uh, there and I hear what, what you're doing in, in this area uh, is really important preventively. Uh, so I thank you for it. I thank the three of you. Uh, I, yes, I know you're trying to wind up. Could I just follow that on just, you haven't talked about the investigative side and obviously that's, you know, in all these disciplines, whether it's cyber or terrorism generally, so the thing that the FBI really brings to the table that nobody else can replicate is your investigative capabilities. Um, you know, in the cyber area, there's an endless amount of cyber crime out there and not enough investigative resources. Do you feel like in the WD area that with the WD coordinators and the agents you have in the other cadre in the WD directorate that you have enough resources to run down the leads of you know, possible bioterrorism incidents. <laughs> You're gonna throw your retirement papers out. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I haven't heard that. I've heard that obviously in the cyber context. I haven't heard it in the, in the um, terror context. Let me. It's not like there's a bioterrorism attack every day. Right, but uh, I, let me couch it this way: that um, one of the, the 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 things that galvanize my program to uh, do this proactive outreach and engagement right now is that we need to start to the best that we're able to start integrating security into some of these applications, especially when we're seeing the, the intersection between the digital age with the life sciences, so that we can identify the red flags as they come up, or if there ever was something that happened, that we would have the breadcrumbs to help with the attribution, because again, in the big, big data context, the issue is becomes, we're not even really sure about the, the, the quality of the data that's being generated or the provenance, and so that lends to gaming the system. Um, so having said all that, along with, I guess, the traditional biosecurity and the things that are happening uh, to, on, the, on the front edge, on the cutting edge development, um, yeah, I have job security. Um, and, uh, and again, it's not just the WD director and the FBI, but how do we provide this type of perspective and these type of activities uh, to our our international law enforcement partners. Well, if I can make one, one quickie, um, you attributed the statement, um, with great power comes great responsibility to Spider-Man. And while it is true that he did say that in 1962, he plagiarized Voltaire. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected, sir. <laughs> I, I was a, but it resonates with the, it res resonates with the generation right now. I, I want to, I can't cite this for the great university president here, which political scientists said, uh, he took the phrase, power tends to corrupt, and said that power also can ennoble, uh, because you, you are forced to be responsible with the power. It's a little different. But in any case, we all agree it was not Birdman or Michael Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a five minute break, which could extend to 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, this is uh, panel five. Uh, and these, uh, th this is, I'm looking forward to this. These are readouts from the um, satellite meetings held in support of our uh, overall panel. And, and the folks on the panel were there and are going to present findings and recommendations, which will provide a preview into the response and recovery issues that we will address in our next and final public meeting on uh, April 4th. So beginning. First, excuse me. <laughs> it would be very bad if I was here on April 4th. <laughs> uh, it, it being the first day of Passover, I had a lot of explaining to do to my family. Uh, okay, first we have Dr. Elizabeth Basilico, co-chair of the Alliance for Biosecurity. So just set the scene, which meeting you were at, and uh, um, tell us what We happened. were at the, uh, the industry meeting with uh, Jim Greenwood and looking at what, are, so what I want to provide today are industry's recommendations as being a key partner with the government Good. on how we um, provide some improvements to the CBRN and PAN flu preparedness initiative that we work on, which is developing drugs and, and uh, you know, solutions to some of these uh, medical countermeasures. 
So on behalf of the companies working in the biodefense sector, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today. And as I mentioned, I will provide our recommendations. A group of us got together, members of the um, Alliance for Biosecurity, as well as member companies from bio organization. And we want to provide recommendations on developing how we would recommend uh, improvements to developing effective medical countermeasures to respond to CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear attacks or pandemic flu outbreaks. And these recommendations, as I said, were, were generated at a, a meeting that was held on February 19th, and uh, Jim Greenwood nicely attended and helped facilitate the discussions. So I think as we can all appreciate, CBRN and pan flu threats remain important due to their potential for catastrophic sequences, uh, consequences for hundreds of thousands of people. The recent Ebola outbreak highlights the needs for medical countermeasures to be on hand to prevent and mitigate disease impact and human suffering. The availability of medical countermeasures for Ebola would have reduced deaths in the United States and Africa and the economic impact of this outbreak significantly. DHS, had, Department of Homeland Security, has identified 13 CBRN material threats and in the last decade there have been seven pandemic flu or other serious disease outbreaks. However, in the last 10 years, with the 10-year, 5.6 billion Project BioShield funding, industry responded, and in partnership with BARDA, we've developed and delivered 12 new medical countermeasures to the strategic national stockpile. Over 12 additional new medical countermeasures are anticipated to be ready by 2018, and there are also more than about 160 products in the pipeline. So industry's participation in this mission has been and is essential. Industry has the talent, we have the resources, the expertise, and the commitment needed to work in this unique partnership. However, industry's continued development of vaccines, therapeutics, and other products to, prevent, to protect the American public from these threats requires sustained U.S. government commitment and funding. Today I'm just going to speak briefly on six areas where we have recommendations for improvement. The first is how do we sustain our progress and invest for the future? There is, no there is no market or customer other than the United States government for medical countermeasures for CBRN and pan flu. Therefore, industry's continued involvement in this area is predicated on adequate government funding to support not only the long, risky development programs, but also, more importantly, the purchase of our products. Our shareholders, our boards, must see a financially attractive market to gain stakeholder support for our involvement. We need to be certain in industry that if we develop new medical countermeasures successfully, there will be a robust market through government purchase. Our recommendation here is Congress must adequately fund the medical countermeasure enterprise in 2016 and beyond. This funding should include we believe upwards of $763 million for BioShield Special Reserve Fund to purchase medical countermeasures. This is consistent with the $2.8 billion that was authorized for over five years. We would recommend an increase to $400 million for pan flu preparedness as this funding needs to cover not only development but also procurement of new countermeasures. We support the $571 million for SNS replenishment at CDC as requested by the President and we also support the $522 million for advanced development at BARDA. However, it must be recognized that as we continue to be successful, additional funding will be needed in future years to procure the new medical countermeasures that are developed and, and replenish the expanding stockpile. The second area I want to talk about is increasing transparency in the public-private partnership. To be an effective partner, industry must understand the priority threats, what countermeasures are needed, and how the government plans to respond. Our recommendation here is that HHS and DOD should provide greater clarity on MCM requirements and priorities, and this would include such as projected quantities, target product characteristics that are requ required, and also we really need to get the animal rule finalized as this shifting guidance creates a great deal of risk and uncertainty for industry. Our second recommendation here is that HHS should submit to Congress and the public a transparent, updated, five-year plan for medical countermeasures and budget for the development and procurement on an annual basis. The third area that we would like to provide a recommendation is streamlining the contracting process. The progress of U.S. funded programs is slowed unnecessarily by an unpredictable funding, lengthy contracting process, and a lack of clear communication to industry partners. 
Drug development entails constant change, and the contract process needs to be nimble and flexible to handle changes quickly and effectively. Our first recommendation here is that HHS should get input from industry to make contracting process more transparent. Many of us have some experience over the last few years, and we think that we could help chat through better ways to meet the changing needs and priorities of our drug development programs. Secondly, HHS should return contracting authority from ASPR to BARDA. Our third recommendation is OMB review of BioShield procurement contracts should not be required as this creates an, an additional uh, time. Recommendation four is that in cost plus R&D contracts uh, are, um, should include a management reserve component and this would help cover un unforeseen costs and programmatic changes. Our fourth area for recommendation is improving coordination between government partners. The existing U.S. Uh, government infrastructure re responsible for this enterprise is spread across many agencies, and that includes ASPR, BARDA, NIH, CDC, FDA, DOD, DHS, and NSC. This communication is not well coordinated all the time, and responsibilities are often not well defined, and this leads to delays and confusion in advancing our programs. Our first recommendation is here was we think the White House should establish, as they've had in the past, a senior position responsible for maintaining consistency, coordinating budgeting, and accountability for the MCM enterprise. And our second recommendation here is ASPR and CDC should work closely to establish utilization guidelines for, pro for program, uh, products that are entering the strategic national stock. Our fifth area for recommendations is strengthening the partnership, the risk sharing and incentives that could be <coughs> shared amongst in industry and government. Industry needs greater certainty around the procurement of the products we develop. We make investment decisions based on cost, on risk, and return. And, lack of, and a lack of a commercial market and unclear government commitments to purchasing makes investment in biodefense extremely difficult and unattractive. So our number one recommendation here is reestablish the multi-year BioShield funding for procurement. Our second recommendation is to identi identify additional incentives for industry, and we believe this could be conducted in a workshop setting. Hopefully we could convene by the end of 2015. And some of these incentives might include development contracts with success-based milestone payments, guaranteed pricing, advanced purchase commitments, such as I believe occurs in some of the DOD contracts, and use of the other transactional authority, as well as patent extensions. Just to name a few. Um, our final area for recommendation is improving global threat awareness. There is little MCM preparedness or stockpiling going on outside the United States government and an emergency use authorization process such as we have in the states to enable the purchase of unlicensed drugs prior to an event are limited to non-existent. So we have two recommendations here. We feel that the U.S. government could build international threat awareness and consensus on priorities that would be helpful via international collaboration. For example, the Global Health Security Agenda and the ASPR International Health Office. Secondly, we think the U.S. should encourage international stockpiling by helping facilitate regulatory pathways and joint purchasing for international procurement of medical countermeasures. And that concludes our recommendations, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. We in industry are very committed to our country's biodefense and are working with our governor part government partners to improve our ability to develop these very much needed medical countermeasures to protect Americans and people worldwide. Thank you very much. Thanks <coughs> very much, Doctor. That was excellent. You gave us uh, a lot to work with. Dr. Parker. Yes, Senator, thank you um, for letting me uh, give you a, a short kind of executive summary of, of uh, the deliberations uh, we, uh, we held at Texas A&M. And Texas A&M, we uh, hosted a workshop uh, on the 24th of February. And the focus of our workshop um, was to try to explore the human-animal nexus of biodefense, a, a new way to try to look at the problem. We had two sessions. The first session was on bridging the valley of death for medical countermeasures, and the second one was on detection and biosurveillance. So we approached this whole workshop in a different manner. Generally, the human and animal aspects 
are either dealt with human public health or agricultural bioterrorism. I think you've already kind of seen plenty of examples today of how we ought to think about are there opportunities anyway to think about the problem in a different way and think about the problem from that one health perspective. And guess what? We discovered that many of the challenges we've already identified, and I will echo some of these <laughs> challenges we just, we just heard and, and others today, they're common to both the human and the animal worlds. And as you know, uh, I'm not here today to really talk about the Ebola experience in Texas, but I think the Ebola experience in the United States does offer some observations that we might be able to turn into lessons learned. And as you know, we had one traveler who came from West Africa that was diagnosed, became sick, and was diagnosed once he arrived in Dallas with Ebola, and we had two nosocomial infections in uh, the nursing staff that cared for Mr. Duncan. But what's maybe not quite well known is we also had to develop in real time and operationalize in real time the ability to safely care and monitor a beloved family companion, Bentley the dog, in real time again. <laughs> and again, the human-animal interface. Bentley could have been potentially exposed to Ebola. There's really little science to guide us on what that potential risk is. Soon after, I mean, really immediately after the diagnosis of Ebola, uh, the governor established the Texas Task Force on Infectious Disease, and I was a deputy director for this, this task force, so that we could actually help guide and be kind of a sounding board of, of, of expertise to guide authorities in government, but also at the hospital and, and public health. We were able to provide in real time lessons observed and make recommendations in real time, and we provided a report to the governor and his staff on 1 December of those lessons observed and recommendations, and I'd be glad to make that report uh, available to, to the panel. Please do. We appreciate that. Well, I mentioned that this experience and actually the ongoing, ongoing Ebola outbreak um, is actually not only specific for, for Ebola, but also broadly applicable to biodefense. And in this case for Ebola, it's the lack of vaccines and therapeutics for Ebola. And again, there are lessons learned for broadly for biodefense. Well, this is, in some respects, there is good news in the Ebola story in, in regards to medical countermeasures. At least we had a few medical countermeasure candidates, be it vaccines or therapeutics, that were available in the exploratory development phase to pull out of the laboratory, rush it into manufacturing and clinical trials. The bad news is we only had a few medical countermeasures to pull out of exploratory development, rush into manufacturing and clinical trials. This despite the fact that we've known about Ebola for 40 years. It's been on various threat lists, beginning in the Department of Defense. It's been on the CDC list. It was deemed a material threat to the United States from the Department of Homeland Security in 2006. Yet, we only had a few medical countermeasures available to rush out of exploratory development and into the field. So where is the priority? Where has the focus been? I think we have questions about how we can do a better job on priority and focus with the available resources we have. And that leads to perhaps the first recommendation, and it's a recommendation you've already heard many times, but I think I'm just providing an, an example of, of, of why the recommendation is, is important. And it comes that we need to reestablish a special assistance to the president for biodefense and emerging infectious diseases to provide such priority and to provide such driving force to, to marshal our resources on those, those threats that have been deemed material threats. But unlike others who have made this same recommendation, we also debated and discussed the animal side of this equation and, and the challenges on the animal side of this equation are just as challenging and just as daunting 
and the funding available for the animal side of this equation is at least an order of magnitude lower, if not more, than what's been, been made available for, for the human and public health side of the equation. And again, this, if, if a special assistant to the president is reestablished, that office, that person, and his or her staff will have to take on both the human and the animal components of this. And in fact, um, it used to be done, and it was done in the era when HSPD-9 was um, promulgated and, and put into force. I forgot the exact year, but it, that must have been 2005, 2006, 2007 time frame. Well, <laughs> the president. Yeah. I've been down that path. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, one of the ways, I mean, you could be a special assistant to the president, or at least coordinating their activities with OMB, because you know what? Nothing in this town gets changed unless you can shift dollars. Around. Correct. And so if we could perhaps expand the recommendation and include some kind of interaction with OMB to see that the presidential priorities. Correct. Mm -hmm. Articulated mm -hmm. through the special mm -hmm. assistant are reflected in an OMB in the OMB mm -hmm. budget protocol. I, I, I'm not, I think it's great. I mean, if most people believe it's a good idea, and I want to say I'd like to add a little more muscularity to uh, it, that individual's capability. It will have to be something like that added, so there can be accountability and. And because otherwise, and money, because otherwise it's the power. It, it becomes the how influential is this individual amongst all the other competing demands. And at the end of the day, it is, and particularly it's a challenge because so many departments, biodefense is hard and it requires multidisciplinary approach. There's no doubt about it. You cannot put this in one, one agency and get the job done. But it is so diffuse that it's got to have strong budgetary authority at the top. To make all these, all these pieces work together in harmony. For a couple years, they had a lot of trouble. They wouldn't give me more money. They probably needed that. That's not well, the situation. Well, <laughs> but you know, if, if you can throw all the money at the world at this problem, it's that's right. Sense. Otherwise, it will not. It'll be money that may not be well spent, and it must be coordinated no, and integrated. And, and it, it is, I agree. Right. And you recommend a special assistant to the president because that's. Well, one, it has stature, but two, it's at the center of the government, so it can coordinate the disparate uh, and it's And it's similar to, I think, I think, a comment I made earlier today that um, we made, I believe we made a lot of progress in infectious disease, infection control, bioterrorist preparedness. We, we began to, to build a foundation because of the focus, say, in the 2001 to Hurricane Katrina time frame. And for the, all the right reasons, I'm, I jumped on the all-hazard bandwagon as well. Uh, but in retrospect, I think we lost focus and priority on something that is the new norm. Um, and therefore, we have to do something unique to deal with something as potentially devastating as bioterror and the high consequence, low probability emerging infectious diseases. So that we remain, we, we keep that sustainment. Um, and again, the rest of what I will, will will hit on would be more higher level recommendations. And you and you just heard about one of the recommendations in regard to to BARDA, and BARDA is is has, is doing a wonderful job. But there, and there's been a recommendation, and you've heard it from others as well before today, about moving contracting back under BARDA to improve efficiencies. However, and, and we, we support that <laughs> wholeheartedly. However, our, our discussions at the workshop revealed that there's, in fact, I think a higher, more systemic problem in the U.S. government regarding contracting that goes well beyond just biodefense. It, it affects many programs. Um, and in a negative way, of course to include humanitarian aid, which we've heard today is also an important solution to emerging infectious diseases and, and biodefense. In recent years, there has been a shift that may emanate from OMB, and I have to do some more research on, on this, um, guidance 
that, that cause an unintended consequences. And that unintended, unintended consequence has had a, it created a, a, a risk averse culture in bureaucracy and contracting in particular. And where contracting officers are not, are not necessarily listening to the technical recommendations as well as they should from the program. And again, this is a more systemic widespread problem that's really just begun to occur in the last few years. But it is where, and the, and the result is process has become greatly more important than programmatic outcome. But this is particularly challenging in this space because uh, we all know to enable vaccine and drug development, this risk of all Verse culture that we heard today, programmatic funding in a constrained environment, coupled with risk averse nature of, of government contracting, again, more widespread, is a clear disincentive for industry participation in the space. So, effective incentives are going to be necessary to attract industry into this space. And this is a lesson we learned in the early BioShield days and began to make changes to try to attract industry into this space. If this, this risk-averse culture continues, I think we're going to have to relearn the lessons we already previously learned a decade ago in the early BioShield days yet again. So recommendation two, so we must take actions to curb and mitigate this risk-averse dis disincentive culture that is beginning to creep in. And we have to look at, at a new at appropriate incentives for our private sector partners, either in industry or other non-government organizations, to include academia uh, to, to play in this space. One such example, and it's just an example of a novel approach, should government bonds be considered in, instead of FAR-based contracting? Better use of OTA, that, that those authorities already exist, and again, just examples of we need to think afresh about what are the incentives for non-government participation in the space. Recommendation number three. We've heard several comments today about BARDA, and BARDA, we believe, is the right model. It has proven uh, successful. It's got a lot of candidates in the pipeline. It has corrected some of our vulnerability gaps. And it is poised to take on new efforts, new missions, such as antimicrobial resistance. It could take on other, other areas that are public health threats and national security threats where, there, again, there's no market. West Nile, chikungunya come to mind. As long as those efforts also don't dilute what BARDA was originally intended to do, and that was to deal with these high consequence, low probability events. And so it's also been mentioned today that perhaps the BARDA concept needs to be refreshed. And I definitely support that. How can we make BARDA even better than what it is today? But I would submit also in that refresh analysis that BARDA is perhaps ready to graduate and become a, an operat operating agency like it was originally intended to be in the first pandemic in the drafting and staffing and uh, before final approval of the, of the original PAPA legislation. And perhaps there's ways that there could be tighter linkages between BARDA and DARPA and DOD. And perhaps there's ways to lever leverage some of the underlying contracting pro processes that, that DARPA has been so effective in, in utilizing. Recommendation number four, diagnostics and surveillance. We've heard a lot about that today. And I'll just summarize that far too little attention has been given to diagnostics and surveillance. And much more needs to be done here. And in addition to promoting point of need diagnostics that we heard and even saw an example today, we must not forget the importance of confirmatory laboratory-based diagnostics at home and abroad. And there's in a very acute need to address vulnerabilities in our veterinary diagnostic laboratory network. 
and a need to integrate our veterinary diagnostic laboratories with the public health diagnostic laboratories. We also need trusted space for information sharing and information integration. And we have to look to new models for that trusted space for that integration. And I would submit the DHS University Centers of Excellence is a model that has worked. And we heard at our lunchtime talk that the NGO community is probably a, com a community that's underutilized in providing that trusted space for inter information integration. And recommendation four, this is my final recommendation summary, and I'll, I'll simply call it for now to try to simplify it, and it's a visual, but I'll call it, and I haven't, I haven't come up with a good name for it yet, <laughs> but I'll call it the rabies control strategy analogy. As you know, we have effectively controlled rabies as a public health problem essentially through immunizing our domestic animals, in some case wildlife. It's very analogous to some of the things we are hearing at, at lunchtime. Our process as our government is really not set up to kind of deal with this human-animal nexus and to look at those opportunities where we might be able to look at dealing with MERS by immunizing camels. Who's going to fund it? Everybody will do this. How are we going to deal with Rift Valley fever? We might be able to attenuate that by immunizing the animal vectors. Who's going to do that? It'll be like this. And so there, there are, I think, unique opportunities when we look at biodefense and emerging infectious diseases and explore that human-animal nexus for new opportunities to deal with some of these, these threats in the longer term through that human-animal nexus. There were a lot of other topics that were talked about um, in, our, in our workshop to include select agent programs. I mentioned a little bit the veterinary diagnostic lab, and there'll be more information in, in a report that we'll provide to the, to the panel. And I just want to end that we also discussed, maybe I, I was the, the cheerleader on this, but complacency is our biggest threat. And that's why the leadership is so critical. And are we, will we be prepared for the next threat? Thank you. That's great. <clears throat> That's excellent. And it's a, uh, it's a challenge to us, too. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Beth Molden Morgenthau from the uh, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Yes. Thank you. It's a mouthful, I know. <laughs> But you're uh, not the only one with a mouthful <laughs> title here today. Well, it's an honor to be here uh, to present recommendations on behalf of New York City, as well as LA County, Chicago, and uh, Washington, Washington DC uh, Health Department colleagues. Um, before reviewing our recommendations, I wanted to provide a brief background on the importance of public health and healthcare system preparedness, as well as the role of our four jurisdictions. So as you well know, and you've heard today and probably through other sessions, our nation's public health and health care infrastructure is critical to protecting the lives of our citizens by quickly detecting, containing, and mitigating the public health impacts of disease outbreaks and bioterrorism. These capabilities noticeably improved and expanded after 9-11 with significant federal funding. So the two main funding streams are the public health emergency preparedness cooperative agreement through the Centers for Disease Control, and I'll refer to that affectionately as the FEP grant, and the Hospital Preparedness Program, or the HPP, uh, HPP program, which is through the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. So with these, with these funds, state and local health departments, as well as healthcare systems, have invested in staff, in plan development, training, exercises, and supplies to make sure staff are equipped to respond to a broad range of emergencies. These funds traditionally go from state health departments to local health departments, but um, New York City, Chicago, LA County, and Washington, D.C. receive these funds directly from the federal government. Um, each directly funded city is a, and that's why we're called the directly funded cities. Each of us is a high population, high density urban area. Collectively, we're home to almost 22 million people, and we have dramatic increases in daytime populations. Additionally, we host countless high-profile events, have high-value targets, and serve as international travel hubs. So a biological attack in any of our four cities would have national and global impact. So with that, I'm going to turn to our recommendations. 
and I think you've also been given a one-page handout which summarizes. Um, so first and foremost, and I think uh, thankfully we've heard this a few times today, relentless cuts to federal funding have hampered the preparedness and response capabilities across the country, including directly funded cities, which are an incredibly high risk. State and local health departments and healthcare systems throughout the nation rely on federal funding to prepare for emergencies, and this is typically the only source of funding. Unfortunately, significant and repeated budget cuts jeopardize existing response capabilities. In New York City alone, FEP funding has decreased 35% since fiscal year, since its peak in fiscal year 2005, and the most dramatic impact has been a 43% reduction in our public health preparedness and response workforce. And this is similar, a similar impact on the other directly funded cities, and I would guess in, uh, across the nation. Dur across the nation, we know that health departments have eliminated positions uh, for epidemiologists, laboratorians, um, public health informatics specialists, which we've heard is critical, and uh, preparedness planners due to funding cuts. The erosion of a skilled workforce is going to jeopardize our ability to detect and respond to future outbreaks. Similarly, relentless HPP cuts have impeded the preparedness and response of the healthcare system. The cuts to HPP are particularly consequential because initial funding was never adequate from the start. In New York City, HPP funding, which goes to hospitals and the healthcare systems, has decreased 39% from its peak in fiscal year 2004. These cuts, and I think we've heard this today, jeopardize hospital readiness at a time when the Ebola response and the measles outbreak highlight how important it is and what happens when, when there are gaps. So our first recommendation is that federal budgets designed to support public health and healthcare system preparedness be increased and sustained. It's really important not, that, not to go up and down, as we heard from Dr. Gerberding. At the same time, funding allocations should be risk-based to reflect the scale and threat of impact to high-density urban areas. Our second area of concern is the estimated delivery time of medication from the strategic national stockpile, which will delay dispensing of life-saving medication. So CDC FEP, FEP funds support the mission of local health departments to develop and execute plans for mass prophylaxis after a biological attack. For example, in the case of a widespread aerosolized anthrax attack, I think many in the room are familiar, uh, everyone, must begin, everyone who is exposed must begin taking antibiotics within 48 hours to prevent illness and death. The primary method to rapidly dispense medication in most jurisdictions is through points of dispensing, or pods. These are temporary emergency, emergency sites that are set up to provide medication quickly, free, to the public. And all jurisdictions are relying on the strategic national stockpile, which is managed by CDC, for this medication. Traditionally, receipt of the SNS has been promised within 12 hours of the federal decision to deploy. However, as jurisdictions such as New York City become increasingly adept at our ability to set up and open pods, this becomes the most significant rate limiting step. New York City recently demonstrated our ability in a full scale, no notice exercise in this past August when we rapidly opened 30 pods in less than eight hours. Most were open in less than six hours. This is up to four hours before medication from the SNS would even arrive at our New York City warehouses. So in reality, we would have the pod staffed, we'd have them set up, and we would have no medication to distribute. And it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Let me add another recommendation. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm getting there. It's so I have, I have a solution. Fault, but it's not her. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> the point is, it's not her fault. She doesn't know. But I have a solution. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> so in an effort to close this gap, um, we've asked CDC in recent years to forward deploy an appropriate quantity of medication in a New York City contracted warehouse. So this would mean rather than storing medication at a remote, undisclosed federal warehouse, the medication would be stored at a New York City contracted warehouse, which we also are very careful about who has that information, um, but remain, it would remain under the custody and control of CDC, but it would be available for us to immediately access if you know, CDC and New York City are in agreement. While CDC has met with us numerous times regarding this request, they have cited various concerns, including um, uh, budget cuts that prevent the purchase of additional medication. So this leads me to our second recommendation. In order to facilitate earlier access to life-saving medication, we would ask Congress to mandate and provide funding to support the forward deployment of SNS assets in reasonable quantities to high-threat jurisdictions that have proven their ability to set up pods faster than the SNS can arrive. 
So our third area of concern is that federal agencies are not authorized to permit non-mission essential employees to supplement local response efforts. So there are many areas in where local federal staff could really participate and help in a, in a large scale response. One example is our pods. And so in New York City alone, this is going to blow your mind, but to operate our entire citywide pod network for 48 hours, it's going to require 33,000 staff. So to supplement uh, our pod staffing pool, we would look, we would hope to leverage local New York City based non-mission essential federal employees. Um, this proposal is consistent with the 2009 Presidential Executive Order 13527, which directs the federal government to anticipate and immediately supplement the capabilities of affected jurisdictions to rapidly distribute medication following a biological attack. We have learned during recent disasters in New York City, federal agencies have placed non-mission essential employees on administrative leave for up to five days while agency operations were assessed. If this is a standing policy after a biological attack, non-mission essential federal staff would remain idle at home while nearby pods struggle to distribute medication due to uh, lack of staff. So in an effort to leverage this resource, New York City Health Department has worked uh, with uh, New York City-based federal agencies as well as the New York City Federal Executive Board, and there is a lot of enthusiasm for this. Unfortunately, um, the proposal is sitting with the Office of Personnel Management. Um, Um, and <laughs> so our third recommendation is that Congress you don't allow nonverbal <laughs> communication. <laughs> Body language. <laughs> so our third recommendation is that Congress should um, consider appropriate interventions to authorize, encourage, facilitate the inclusion of non-mission essential federal employ employees in support of state and local responses to a broad range of emergencies. Our fourth area of concern is the need for ongoing collaboration between local, state, and federal agencies in BioWatch planning. Uh, and I think we've heard a little bit about this today as well. Um, BioWatch is a vital public health surveillance tool designed to provide early warning of a catastrophic release of a biological threat agent. In the event of a bioterrorist event, whether it's detected by BioWatch or some other means, the nation will seek to rapidly coordinate a response at the local, state, federal level involving many disciplines, including public health, environmental, law enforcement, and it goes on. It's critical that the roles and the responsibilities of various agencies involved be um, clear in advance of a response. However, this cannot happen without robust interagency planning. There remain critical gaps in preparedness, response, and recovery planning that could be addressed by a, a more robust and coordinated planning effort. Um, for example, many uh, unanswered questions such as how clean is clean and who has the authority to say a building is safe to reoccupy. And to date, each federal agency seemingly defaults to its own responsibilities, siloed responsibilities, um, rather than working together to solve these multidisciplinary problems. These can't be solved by one agency or discipline alone. So we're asking Congress to consider identifying a lead agency to oversee federal interagency bio watch work group that would focus on response planning, and this would have utility for any biological event. Um, and this effort should include local and state governments, especially the BioWatch jurisdictions and the directly funded cities. Do you think there's a consensus within the broader community as to what that, what that, what, what that agency is? Do you have an opinion? You? Obviously. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't have to worry about attribution anymore. <laughs> 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 um, yes, and you know, I, over the years, I probably maybe have gone back and forth. And bio, uh, public health is, is is certainly a a leading part of the solution in a bioterror event, but it's not just public health because of all the other effects that are in other parts of society and local government. They're going to have to be brought to bear on this. And it, giving, given kind of the role of the Department of Homeland Security, I think actually DHS m makes a lot of sense from a, because they, it, it's essentially it follows from emergency management and public health is a, is a player on the emergency management team, much more so than in the past. And you can make a, I think a very strong argument. You follow that construct and NIMS and everything else 
Uh, now CDC probably will will um, argue against that, um, and I might have argued against it, you know, eight years ago as well. Um, but I think as as time has evolved, and um, the department has matured, DHS, and and the interagency, I think, has matured as well in understanding DHS's role uh, from that very kind of specific um, protection of the homeland and society. You can make a very strong case that that might be the agency that should do it. Uh, I probably echo that. Might, might uh, want to say that uh, the the same um, part of DHS that's deploying the system might be less engaged than those that are using it to manage the response. I think it, it's a reasonable suggestion. So our fifth and final concern is that state and local health departments, and likely the SNS, um, are currently unable to replenish and maintain existing local caches of doxycycline due to its extremely high cost. New York City maintains a local cache, as do many other jurisdictions, of medications and supplies for first responders in the event of a public health emergency. Doxy makes up a significant portion of that cache because of its status as a first line prophylactic medication. Unfortunately, the cost of doxy has increased dramatically over the past few years, and since 2011, prices have ranged 11 to 45 times what they were, and the sh M was shorter expiration dates. So for example, the cost to replace the New York City first responder cash uh, in 2011 would have been approximately $175,000. If we were to purchase that equivalent today, it'd be $1.9 million. As a result, New York City Health Department and other local and state and federal agencies have not been able to purchase critical medications. So our fifth and final recommendation is that the federal government should work to reduce the cost of doxy, including calling upon the FDA to investigate and determine ways to mitigate the cost increase. Additionally, thinking about other life-saving uh, medications that we would use in a public, mer public health emergency and how do we avoid wild fluctuations in the future. And on behalf of New York City and the directly funded cities, I just want to thank you for having me here today. Thank you, excellent. Tim Stevens is uh, the wind-up CEO of the Mesh Coalition, and the first question is, what is the Mesh Coalition? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, managed emergency surge for healthcare. We were, um, Indiana was one of the first um, communities to receive the um, uh, funds from the Healthcare Emergency Facilities uh, Partnership Program. Um, which was to develop uh, healthcare coalitions to <coughs> coordinate, provide intelligence, and coordinate uh, between healthcare institutions during times of emergencies. So that funding was a, a competitive program in 2008. Um, we deem it quite successful as we um, now have an entirely private sector um, funded uh, business continuity and healthcare coalition um, having. Um, all of the hospital systems and the healthcare systems in the uh, Marion County, Indianapolis, uh, subscribers to our uh, system. So, uh, so are from you based there or are you we're, we're based in Indianapolis. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. That's a yeah. Hoosier accent. It is. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, via uh, Texas. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Earlier this week, in the same spirit as as, as this um, um, uh, gathering, we held a. Um, uh, a, f a f round table uh, attended by uh, Representative Susan Brooks from the 5th uh, District of Indiana um, and had a wide-ranging discussion, some of which I'm here to uh, report on, but I think uh, having followed three such excellent presentations, I think we can uh, focus down on the recommendations and provide you some written uh, commentary on, on, on that uh, and then get to some other questions perhaps. A recurring theme of the workshop was the misdirection of funds, as we've already perhaps alluded to, um, misdirecting to events, not infrastructure, misdirecting to problems, not prevention. Um, echoing Thomas Pynchon, if we get to ask, if we get them to ask the wrong question, the answers don't really matter. Uh, so in that vein, I think I would uh, um, echo uh, uh, Jerry's comment that a special assistant um, and um, share um, some, some thoughts as we go along, sort of describing some of the uh, issues for, from us as a, as a private sector provider of infrastructure protection, uh, perhaps um, um, location in OMB makes sense because where the money is, we believe, is where some of the solutions going forward are going to come from. And maybe if I can 
spend a little bit more time just going through that and we can bring that out but I think it's 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 essential we have a single um, person asking the right questions so the US uh, healthcare sector is the largest part of our economy um, approaching three trillion dollars almost 17 percent of the employment um, hospitals are shining beacons on the hill points of pride in our community and attracting the community to them 24 hours a day seven days a week the continuity of that sector is is what's essential um, and essential to not just uh, those jobs but the economic well-being of the nation so ensuring that we ask the right question means what's the separate what's the separate role of the public and private sector I've heard a lot of discussion already about the uh, federal responsibility for funding is that the same as all of the other funding that's going in which be which is magnitudes larger coming from um, the underwriting of insurance in hospitals the number of uh, reimbursement um, changes that come and go through as we go through healthcare reform so in in reflecting on some of the discussion of the FEP program and the HPP program, it's worth remembering that at the time of 9-11, um, some of you may have seen this report, uh, the Congress appropriated $646 million to the hospital pro um, preparedness program. The American Hospital Association at that time had a report saying $16 billion, so some 30 times more money would be just needed to do the physical security um, on our hospital systems. And I think we're still in that situation where the, the size of the problem in terms of protecting the healthcare system from uh, biodefense attack or from naturally occurring infections within it uh, remains far past the scope of any particular federal program. $250 million is currently the size of that um, um, program and that amounts to the same as one ice hockey arena per state or the size of a one Hobbit movie in production. It's not exactly uh, the same as um, a $3 trillion uh, industry. Last year, uh, one of our level one trauma centers received $17,000 from that uh, program. It issued bonds uh, of the order of $700 million. So we're not getting the attention of the healthcare leadership when you, you think about the numbers in terms of the, the, the scope of the program. Um, that was a component of our discussion and it led us to, to thinking that the, we have to look at other means and other, other places in the government. The parts uh, of the government I think that um, make sense for us to focus on uh, aren't necessarily gonna be the, f the first ones we think in terms of biodefense. Um, in, in the past year, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the past five years has issued somewhere around $30 billion of incentives to physicians to use emergency, um, to, to use electronic health records. Um, that same $30 million, billion dollars um, has, um, has the effect, as we look forward now, to tra tra change the vulnerability perhaps in some ways, but certainly trying to increase the capacity of the healthcare system to, to treat the people coming into it. But one of the vulnerabilities I would suggest is we now have very little ability to step back from uh, electronically provided uh, healthcare system. Again, working in, in the context that uh, many people have invoked uh, already, uh, that suggests uh, the other existential threat uh, of cybersecurity combined with a biodefense uh, uh, attack on the nation may have, um, may have some deleterious effects way beyond uh, what we've as assumed in the past when we've, we've looked at um, the ability for um, federal um, responses to come in, reconstitute paper-based records and, uh, and, and other uh, activities like that. Um, I would before finishing, uh, suggest the um, th there are a couple of, of, of things that um, also um, came out of our discussion that grant programs, and I think uh, um, Beth alluded to this, grant programs by themselves are not going to um, identify those parts of the system most at risk. Um, over time, they become expectations, and as expectations, they don't uh, necessarily um, lead us to where the, um, um, the most vulnerable parts of our system are. 
So we certainly um, um, would recommend that um, there be risk and competitive components uh, um, of biodefense funding. If we're seeking public dollars um, to, to be the um, uh, basis for providing more of that preparedness. I, th I think at this point, um, to not belabor some of the early discussion about Ebola, I'd just like to say that um, the Ebola outbreak allowed us to see um, two things. One, that we had not funded infrastructure. Um, by one estimate, um, more than a billion dollars of planning, training, and PPE has been spent in the nation. Um, that um, did not come about um, as a result of anything that we had funded. It was, as Jerry said, something we knew we were going to have to do at some point. Um, the resources did not come out of our emergency preparedness um, uh, capacity. They came out of the regular operating budgets. So that's why I think um, we need to look for mechanisms uh, as, as CMS looks um, um, ready to be putting into um, the regulatory mix um, rules around emergency preparedness. I think that's maybe where we will leverage more money. Thirty billion dollars um, in meaningful use, seven billion dollars in hospital acquired infection um, uh, uh, pullbacks and fines over the last um, uh, year. So as we move forward, perhaps we should expand our horizons and think of uh, where, where the real dollars are in healthcare. And as we look at those, perhaps find some ways to uh, use them to leverage uh, some bias defense capacity. Thank you very much. That's excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Uh, the four of you have really been very helpful. I mean, we wanted to have these uh, so-called satellite meetings occur because you, obviously you all, each of you represents a, a sector that lives within this, um, this system. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, I'll speak for myself, you know more than I do about how it affects you and uh, are in a position to make uh, informed recommendations about what we should do. So it's been a great benefit to me to hear you. And uh, obviously, I hope that you'll all well, see papers that you'll submit papers to us. I, I don't have any questions. One, I mean, that's the one to do with the reality of the fiscal situation in this town. And I think it's well as we, as it is, as we be. Um, we have to start, I mean, we want to make some meaningful recommendations, and obviously, money's going to be part. So, we have no question about that. As you submit the recommendations in writing, I'd like to give, I'd like you to give pause to upset some priorities within those funding spaces. Okay. okay. Dr. Basilico, uh, thank you for the recommendations. I think you did a great job of gathering what occurred on that day. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll take each and every one of them and make it a part of, this, of our recommendations. And, and assuming that we do, the six of us in this panel will find ourselves in the future in congressional offices, I assume, advocating for them. Um, and so I just want to get a little bit to prepare us, a little bit of ex expectation of what the pushback may be from a couple of your of our recommendations, I'll say. Uh, and the first of those is the five-year plan and the transparency, because I think what we've heard in the past is that the federal government hesitates to be perfectly transparent about what it worries about the most in this regard, uh, which would be helpful to the industry to understand what it is the government wants, but I think the government argues that it would increase, in some ways, vulnerability. I, the comment I made that day at the roundtable was that I think our vulnerability is more increased by not having the transparency so that the industry knows what, what it needs to produce than, than the vulnerability that comes from the transparency. So I'd like you to comment on that. And then the other thing is the certainty of, of procurement, um, which is probably a, 
as much a fiscal minor as anything else, but just anticipate for us the, the pushback we'll get on those, and then if you will, what our counter to those pushbacks might be. Um, I think the, the first one, you know, we're talking about the problem with the, the funding and the, the prioritization and, and, and enabling industry. One, I think there, there has to be an avenue for people, whether it's through confidentiality or for or passing some sort of level of being able to get certain uh, information um, that maybe certain people in the company should be able to be top secret or something like that. We've had to get that level of security within our company. So I think there must be a way that that information could be shared on a very limited basis and also the we don't necessarily and that's not unprecedented, obviously. Right. In the and government. we don't need a lot of granular detail necessarily, but we need a few clues. <laughs> you know, it's like we're pretty good at figuring things out, but like DHS is working on, you know, I think a new priority list. That would be great if we could really get some understanding of what the priorities are, and that, that shouldn't be that difficult to point out that we really do want to work on X, Y, and Z, and we've prioritized this one a little bit higher than the other ones, and giving us some information on what kind of products. That shouldn't necessarily be that confidential. So I think, you know, there's a way to work through that, and we certainly, again, we would welcome a dialogue, you know, with with BARDA, with HHS. Tell us, you know what I'm saying, we don't really get that dialogue. We just hear, oh, we can't do that. Well, what, you know, what bars or hurdles could we, you know, put in place for ourselves? How could we manage that information transfer? There just, there just must be a, a way to handle that. Um, I appreciate the <coughs> cost of buying doxycycline. I understand why we don't privatize it. We really let people go out and buy a month's worth of supply and be able to them in the event of a mass casualty incident. They would know they have it. I don't know the cost today, but I know the cost of I just picked that measure for the panel's sake. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, in, in the, in the now I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> in the spirit of that and in some uh, recent work, and I think you heard from the National Sheriff's Association, uh, I, I think that really makes sense uh, as a strategy, starting perhaps with the first responders. At the, at the moment, they have um, no uh, protection in that group, and I, I don't know, Beth, if the 33,000 people you're talking about would be unprotected during the time that uh, uh, they're distributing, but uh, um, unless, unless we have those people protected up front, uh, it, would be, um, it, it wouldn't make sense to bring them into that uh, world. So in, in echoing what you, you're saying, so I think we absolutely need to start there and distribute that to the entire uh, set of first responders. I'd go just one step further. There is a real threat out there, such a great threat that we're going to tax you and use the money to pay for it. But we're not going to let you buy protection for yourself. So you let then any citizen vote? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's really an interesting idea because it obviously creates a market, too. Right. But what do you think? Well, I think that, yeah, certain things like even protection against, like, how people went out and bought table flu when the right. flu came out. Right. And, and I have a stockpile at my house, you know, so I, mean, I think that's a very rational way of certain types of, of uh, yeah. protection, medical countermeasures, doesn't cover everything. I mean, this is the med kit concept right, that, right, was, right. that was um, proposed and started getting traction several years ago. Uh, no, it, well, that's another program, yeah. but it's, it's, it's so a family, individual can have the antibiotics at home um, and they're available if there's if your local public health authority says we've been attacked by anthrax take your doxy yeah. um, now there was a very strong pushback from a lot in the public health community for some right reasons and the concern of antimicrobial resistance that individuals people would misuse their cache of antibiotics and et cetera, et cetera. so those things you know they've got to be thought through but the CDC actually it, had did a clinical study essentially where med kits were distributed and lo and behold the data suggests that people could responsibly have a med kit at home very few people actually lost them and they could deal with this responsibly there was a few that didn't but you know it's <laughs> but it, it's still it's there's a tension between 
those who believe something like this could lead to increased antibiotic resistance and and what we might need for preparedness and so you, you might call it a failure of imagination sometimes to think about these novel and relatively inexpensive type programs to put individual responsibility back into the equation it, it's a good discussion but but the, that's the other side of the debate that that you'll hear but it's but it's it should be debated and, can, I, can I just add one thing? I think it is the med kits. That's what you're talking about. And I think, I think there were concerns about. Um, I don't know all the history of this. There were concerns about antibiotic resistance, and but use. and appropriate use. But there were also a lot of concerns about the management. The the um, management of the systems to monitor it mm -hmm. was incredibly labor intensive. Like you would need to set up a whole program just to manage the kids at home. Is my and I think one of the issues is sure people may think, oh, if I got doxycycline, no matter what happens with anthrax, I'm going to be protected. And we don't necessarily know if that's the case. There could be right. different strains of anthrax, right. and they, people might get fooled into thinking they're protected when they're not. Right. I think it requires, a, obviously, a public relations campaign. Correct. And, and at the risk of the giving Saturday Night Live uh, <laughs> an opportunity to talk about the ready kit, you could position it right next yeah. to the duct tape. By the way, color code it, duct tape. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I'm glad you raised that. Yeah, I just think sometimes we underestimate, and, and, and we just underestimate the intellect and the ability of moms and dads yes. Yes. to prepare mm -hmm. for these eventualities for their own families and their communities. I, I think that's a wonderful suggestion. It, in the spirit of. Um, Jerry being here, the animal um, um, human nexus, there's also studies out there from the White House showing that the amount of use of antibiotics in the, f in the um, feeding of animals is so disproportionately larger than anything yes, that we correct. could do by taking a few yeah. doxycycline tablets, it's, it's right. irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's so um, going forth, I, I would uh, I'd suggest one of the things if it, in the record for this discussion is that that antibiotic uh, resistance argument ought to be um, had a stake put through it. Yeah. I, no, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, just two points. Um, thank you, Dr. Rich. Um, one is that uh, you could uh, make the med kit sell with a doctor's prescription. Absolutely. So you only get one every two years yep. or right. whatever the life of the medicine right. is. Secondly, if you are so concerned about the distribution of antibiotics, which I might say are quite free for teenagers with acne, let alone for saving your family's life, mm -hmm. you could have that stored by a commercial company off-site, brought into the city and distributed upon the declaration of a, uh, of a national emergency, and you could put into the cost of the medicine, the cost of the storage, if you wish, and do it either under private or under mm -hmm. a state authority. So it seems to me to give people the assurance that people who want to defend their families. Um, it's very strange to be Okay. First, Jerry, a um, couple questions. First, uh, I got to admit, Tim and Beth, I didn't hear a word you said because. Um, Jerry told us how Bentley was being monitored for Ebola, but he never told us what happened to Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> Let me edge my seat. It's a, it's a happy ending. Is Bentley was a, Bentley was fine, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it was you know it, it um, put in context though. We we learned during Hurricane Katrina and, and Rita, we had to take care of the loved family pet. Mm -hmm. People would not evacuate. They would and and because. At that time, FEMA didn't want to evacuate pets. And so a lot of people were put in harm's way because of that. We learned just before the Ebola event here in the United States and in Dallas, Texas, in Spain, where a pet was euthanized. And the public outroar that ensued, the county judge, who was the person in charge uh, in Dallas County, I mean, immediately said euthanasia is not an option. Actually, Tammy Beckin and I had already been uh, communicating on, on, on this quite a bit. She's at Texas A&M, and, you know, we, we kind of, uh, uh, you know, this does happen. Like, if something like uh, happens here, if, if it determines there's a pet involved, we're not going to let that happen either. Uh, but there was absolutely no guidance on how to deal with that. Nobody wanted to take the potential Ebola dog. So just finding a place to house Bentley was a challenge. Finding people to care for Bentley in 
protective gear was a challenge. We find that Tammy Beckham self-deploy, we had her self-deploy. Uh, again, Texas A&M has worked in BSL-4 uh, laboratory environments before uh, and um, deployed some veterinarians from our College of Veterinary Medicine along with state veterinarians to, to, to safely care for Bentley, monitor, test, do the lab testing, and um, Ebola, uh, he, uh, Bentley was Ebola-free and, and is and reunited the, with Nurse Fam. And it's um, a happy so ending. Let me just ask, this is a serious question, and I don't know that we need an answer right now, but um, many of the panels have raised the idea of a special assistant, that maybe that's going to be, you know, people aren't overstating it as the silver bullet, but that's yes, really going to be a step forward. Mm -hmm. But it would be important for us to, to identify what it is that is deficient about the current interagency process and the current staffing in the NSC staff and what is needed. And part of that will also be, you know, what were the glory days? What was, what was in place when it was right, or as right as, it's, as it ever was? Um, you don't need to answer it right now, but I think that's really important <coughs> because I think that a, a good response to that is, well, that's great. Every time there's an issue, you talk about a czar or a special assist or something in the White House, but that's not a silver bullet. But we have to be able to identify what was in place when it worked as well as it ever did, what's deficient now, and then but I'm definitely sympathetic to the idea because I can tell you, you know, firsthand, it's important having one person who's got that mm -hmm. mission and is focused on 24-7 in the White House and not have that mission diluted by other things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think it's, you know, there are a lot of agendas out there and right. the White House is hearing from other right. constituencies that think right. issue problem X time. is more important mm -hmm. than this mm -hmm. issue. So, um, so if, you, could, if yeah. you all could that, help by providing yeah. the yeah. ammunition yeah. for yeah, that we, argument. We, we will, it, and, it, and, and by no means having a special assistant is going to fix everything right. you know, it, it's it's one one component but I think what keeps coming back again and again and again is leadership to drive priorities um, and focus yep. Thank you, Karish. yeah I, I hate for us to get so bogged down in who's in charge um, and I kind of think of this as it's a complex problem, but I'm very excited because I think we end up coming up with some really good recommendations that can actually make a difference. And, you know, the fire, I think of the fire department analogy on this. And of course, they've had a couple of hundred years to work this out. But even the fire commissioner isn't really in charge of everything to do with fire. Um, I like the FBI analogy. You know, we have school programs for fire prevention, private industry builds little smoke detectors and then they sell fire extinguishers so it's just kind of pulling together the insurance industry plays a role we have some regulations you know so there's this kind of mix and we've dealt with fire at all levels and that includes arson which is intentional fires and then accidental fires and we kind of integrate that in and have a kind of a robust system um, it's not at federal level um, but I think it kind of gives us some thoughts about how do we bring in private sector the public the education you know, this kind of NSF to reach out to the biology community instead of the FBI having to do it. But, you know, really cool across departments. I don't, yeah, I'm concerned about the czar, if that means like everybody else just kind of bails out on responsibility. But there's some smart people in this group, and I think we can come up with some really great approaches. Anything else from the panelists? Uh, the only comment I want to make is certainly this assistant has to be very engaged. They, they can't be just someone up on high. They have to understand the process. They have to be willing to get their hands dirty. They have to be willing to make hard decisions in the middle of, you know, difficult, you know, issues. So I think it has to be somebody with a lot of responsibility, but somebody who's willing to get engaged. And, you know, maybe yeah, but I, think, you know, I think Ken's recommendation that, uh, that uh, perhaps in part of our recommendation, the even if it was uh, an informal, but the infrastructure historic infrastructure that seemed to have the greatest exactly. uh, traction, the greatest ability to get things done, we might want to include that because you're right, just throwing somebody out there to kind of reinvent the wheel. If, if there's a, a system that pre-existed at work before, we'd like to be able to uh, that's a good include point. that in the report. Yeah, All right. Okay. Jim, did good. you have a question? Well, for this panelist, I want to thank you very much. And for all of you who stayed with us since this morning, I want to thank you. This is, concludes the third of four uh, public meetings. The next one will be on uh, April 1st and the subjects will be response and recovery. So we're uh, evolving our way through the, to the very end. Subsequent to that, obviously, we've got a lot of work to do. We invite you back to the April 1st meeting and session. For those of you who participated earlier, thank you. For those of us, for those of you who stayed the entire day, 
Thank you very, very much, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Oh, really? Yeah. If Ellen I has a. Is it just quickly, One moment, please. Uh, it's on the, it's <laughs> coming up. The 17th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. So we're, we're very grateful for that. Uh, the April 1st meeting, we don't have a start time yet. We don't have a finalized agenda, but it'll be at about 9.30, um, 9.30 or 10. And the last, it is on response and recovery. The last panel of the day is a, a panel dedicated to leadership. It will address these questions of leadership that, that have been a theme throughout. And we will have not one, but two special assistants to the president for biodefense, former special assistants, okay. um, to help answer some of these very um, precise questions that you've been asking about OME and budgetary authority. Um, and lastly, follow us on Twitter. Stephanie, what is our Twitter handle? At Biodefense. At Biodefense Study. So, thank you all Excellent. very much. Thank you all. Thank Thanks you very much. Meeting adjourned.